confront its own challenges. And history tells us, successfully tackling society's most pressing problems requires working together and strong leaders who are dedicated to moving our country forward. The La Follette School of Public Affairs is educating those leaders. Enrollment in our new undergraduate programs is exploding, and we've already trained hundreds of students to create and implement evidence-based policy with a focus on civility and collaboration. In fact, we're planning to create the university's first undergraduate major in public policy and to serve these students a new facility that can house the school and act as a convening space for our growing community. All of this momentum was made possible by a $10 million gift from former U.S. Senator Herb Cole, and we are so thankful for this investment. One word I would use to describe the La Follette School would be empowering. Eye-opening. Motivating. The La Follette School has taught me critical thinking more than anything else. Once I took the first class in the certificate program, I knew this is what I wanted to do. The La Follette School has provided me a quality education, access to professors who are experts in their craft, numerous networking events, so there's lots of opportunities here. Learning about policy and how decisions are made can really impact the communities I hope to serve. I see my experience at the La Follette School as a part of something bigger, being part of a community, bringing people from a variety of backgrounds together to create solutions. The La Follette School has empowered us with the skills to truly make change. I have hope for our democracy because of schools like the La Follette School. At the La Follette School, each year we are training more of tomorrow's leaders to discover solutions to important issues by finding common ground. We are bringing people together. Bringing people together. Bringing people together. And we are ready to do so much more. Welcome everybody. Can I get a welcome out there? All right, all right. We're so glad you're here. Welcome everyone, both in person and online. I'm Susan Yaki, the director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs. And welcome to our fourth annual policy forum titled All Policy is Implementation. I wanted to kick off today's forum by telling you a little bit about the La Follette School. The La Follette School of Public Affairs is the home for public policy research and teaching on UW-Madison's campus, and it's one of the top policy schools in the world. We educate graduate students in our master's programs, as well as UW-Madison undergraduate students in our certificate in public policy programs. Right now, the school is experiencing tremendous growth, doubling the size of our faculty, and quintupling the number of students that we serve all within the last few years. Part of this growth has been fueled by a $10 million investment in the school by former Senator Herb Cole, and we are so thankful and grateful for that gift. That generous investment has changed the trajectory of the La Follette School, and it enables us to convene events like this one, where we can contribute to a thoughtful and civil dialogue around public policy issues and solutions. As the public policy school in the state of Wisconsin, one of the most important roles we can play at La Follette is as a convener, bringing people together who have different perspectives, but also have solutions to the issues of our times. We're so fortunate to have expert panelists and attendees from across the state of Wisconsin participating in today's events. Thank you all for being here today. And now it's my honor to introduce the faculty chair for this event, my colleague, Manny Teodoro, an associate professor at the La Follette School of public affairs. Thank you, Susan. And, and let me welcome you, everyone, uh, to the 2023 La Follette Forum. I am inspired and gratified to see so many people turn out on a chilly March morning in uh, Wisconsin to talk about public policy and how to make it work. Uh, as Susan said, I'm Manny Teodoro. I am a professor at the Lovat Follett School where I work on environmental policy, public management, and state and local government in the United States. 
It has been an honor to uh, be the faculty chair of this year's forum. We have a very exciting lineup for you today, and I want to say a few words about the theme of today's forum and introduce our, our keynote speaker for the morning. But first, I want to uh, thank a few people, recognize a few people. First, I want to echo Susan's thanks to Cole Philanthropies for their remarkable and, and transformative investments in the La Follette School uh, that make events like this possible. I want to thank also the Forum's Advisory Committee of Business, Government, and Academic Leaders who helped plan and promote, develop the vision for this forum. Their names are on the back of your program, and you'll see many of them, uh, most of them, around Monona Terrace today. So, so thank you to our Advisory Committee. And then finally, I want to thank the La Follette School's outreach team. You know, the, the remarkable outreach team we have at La Follette uh, School is part of what makes our school special. It, it really is an uncommon investment in outreach and uh, very much resonant with the Wisconsin idea. It's a special thing. Uh, the entire team of, contributed to this event, and it's, it's one of our all-hands-on-deck kind of events for our outreach team. But there are three individuals in particular who, who uh, deserve uh, 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 recognition. Our outreach director, Lisa Ellinger, our events coordinator, Brittany Mitchell, and our outreach coordinator, Mindy Walker. Uh, Lisa, Brittany, and Mindy did the hard work of making the vision of this forum a reality. Everything from the big stuff, like securing our keynote speakers and, and planning our plenary panels, to the small stuff, like, like program printing and name tags and swag and, and lunch. Uh, you know, the, those, uh, those were the folks who did the implementation. Uh, and we know all forums are implementation. So I, please join me in, in giving our outreach staff a round of applause for, for their hard work. So the theme of this year's forum is all policies implementation. And so we're going to talk today, all day long, about the critical systems and the processes that make public policies succeed or fail, about the people who do the real work of government the government that we experience in our everyday lives, far away from the cameras and the clickbait and the news cycle, there are public servants doing work uh, to, to help us each day. You know, legislatures pass laws and executives issue orders. Judges make decisions and diplomats negotiate, but in some sense, all of their actions are hypotheses. They're guesses about what we think a public policy will do. We make a law, we make a rule, and then we see what happens. Well, where it happens or doesn't happen is not in any of those venues, but rather in administration. Education policy is not what the legislature passes. It's what happens when a teacher grades a paper. Immigration policy happens when a foreign service officer issues a visa or a border agent detains a migrant. Health policy happens when a nurse administers a vaccine. A regulatory policy happens when an inspector certifies at a restaurant or an aircraft or, or a building or a railroad. These routine but critical moments in public administration typically go unnoticed. But we think about them all the time at the La Follette School. When roads are well maintained, when, when postal services are smooth and efficient and, and emergency services work effectively, when drinking water is safe and reliable, we tend not to think about public management. We take for granted the marvel that is policy implementation, and it really is a marvel. You all know that. The very fact that you're here is a signal that you know that. It also is a signal maybe you're a little weird, but you are kind of weird. You're the kind of weird that we love at the La Follette School. You get it. So in a sense, I am preaching to the choir this morning. But as any churchgoer knows, sometimes the choir needs preaching too. And the choir needs preaching not because they need to, to learn something new to believe in, but rather to get a sense of direction, a deeper understanding, and a means of articulating truths that we know deep down. Truths like truth, public administration matters, that our economy, our democracy, and our very lives rely on the public infrastructure and the regulatory systems and the government services that we, that we experience each day, whether we know it or not. That administration in a country with 20 million public employees and 90,000 units of local government is really hard. It's honestly something of a miracle that anything happens at all. But those miracles don't happen by accident, and, and of course, sometimes they don't happen. Uh, last year, I published a book just a few months ago called The Prophets of Distrust, and copies are available in the back. I hope if you had a chance to pick one up. 
Uh, it, it, uh, it was co-authored with Samantha Zolke from the University of Iowa and David Switzer from the University of Missouri. The book links the meteoric rise of the bottled water industry to declining trust in American government. We, we show why so many Americans uh, distrust their tap water and why an increasing number of Americans distrust their tap water and instead choose a wildly expensive and lightly, remarkably lightly regulated product that, that comes in a plastic bottle. We show how drinking water system failures sh shake people's confidence not just in their tap water but in the entire edifice of the state and that the commercial bottled water industry stokes that distrust in tap water which undermines public support for, for investments in infrastructure and then a vicious cycle sets in. Failure leading to distrust, leading to less investment, leading to more failure. Flint, Michigan. Jackson, Mississippi. Now East Palestine, Ohio. These, the details of these cases are different, but in each case, those names have become shorthand for governance failure. In each case, institutions failed to implement regulations effectively and ignored infrastructure problems until disaster ensued. And in each case, leaders seemed too often more interested in avoiding blame than in protecting their people. And in each case, the people who suffer the most from those failures are not the powerful and the privileged, but rather the poor and the politically marginalized. Bottled water has become something of a political symbol in the wake of these events, a kind of talisman for uh, the scorn of government failure. Why should anyone trust the government if it can't get something as simple as tap water right? So the core idea that motivates this book is that effective implementation of basic services is a bedrock, a, a foundation of trust in government. A core principle, arguably the core principle of liberal democracy is that governments gain and they lose their legitimacy by their, uh, on, their, on the basis of their ability to provide for their people's basic needs. That is not a new idea right there in the opening words of the Declaration of Independence. So sound implementation builds public trust, and in so doing, it strengthens the legitimacy of democracy itself. To that end, today's forum takes up real-world implementation, Impl effective strategies and collaboration across sectors at every level of government and in every corner of Wisconsin. So we are excited to bring those ideas from the background to the foreground, because at all times, at all places, and for all people, all policy is implementation. So with that theme in mind, it's now my honor and pleasure to introduce our opening keynote speaker, Mr. Andrew Card. Andrew H. Card Jr. is a public servant and administrator with a long and storied career. His public service career began in the Navy ROTC. Uh, he attended the US Merchant Marine Academy before graduating with a degree in engineering from the University of South Carolina. He got his start in politics as an elected official in his uh, native Holbrook, Massachusetts, where he served in the state legislature. But Mr. Card's most important public service has not been in elected office, but rather in administration. He served in the Reagan White House as Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. He continued to serve under President George Herbert Walker Bush, first as Deputy Chief of Staff, then as Secretary of Transportation. In 1992, President Bush appointed Mr. Card to lead the federal government's response to Hurricane Andrew. I'm thinking that the name was a coincidence, right? Um, and he led the uh, transition team that managed the, the handoff of administrative power to the Clinton administration. Mr. Card returned to federal service in 2001 in his most noted role, as Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush. In that capacity, CARD coordinated the priorities of the administration's agenda, the development of policy, and the personnel appointments that the President makes across the federal bureaucracy. The White House Chief of Staff is a unique position in the entire American administrative state. There is no job in our country that more perfectly sits at the nexus of politics, policy, and administration. On September 11, 2001, Andrew Card is the man who whispered in President Bush's ear in that Florida classroom to tell him that terrorists had attacked the United States. Card then led a government-wide reorganization to address the aftermath of that attack and the new security challenges that came with the war on terror. Since leaving government service, Andrew Card has served as a dean and academic administrator at Texas A&M University 
and is president of Franklin Pierce University in New Hampshire. In short, Andrew Card has served and has led at every level of government from the very front lines to the highest levels of national and international politics. At each step along the way, he's observed, contributed to, and shaped the institutions that implement public policy. I can think of no one who understands more deeply how critical implementation is for securing public trust in troubled times. Please join me in welcoming Andrew Card. Thank you, Manny. <laughs> Manny, thank you for that introduction. You were very kind. I caution you in advance to pay attention to the words that I say, because I talk to Khan Harvard Yard every once in a while, and you won't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, I'm from Massachusetts, and yes, I have parked my car in Harvard Yard. <laughs> but I am an engineer by training. I'm a politician by disease, <laughs> and it's incurable. And I was an academic entirely by accident. I'm here because I respect the work that is being done at this institution. I'm here because I respect Herb Cole, who recognized the need to have La Follette doing what it's doing. I'm here because I like to follow the badges every once in a while, especially in the basketball court. And I'm here because I have respect for Manny, and for Susan, and for Lisa, and for the people that make this happen. It's interesting, the topic today is policy and its implementation. Policy is probably the easiest thing to make up in politics. I suspect most of you wake up in the morning and you've got some solution to some problem that you just don't understand why somebody else doesn't recognize it. When you're asked to work at the White House, and by the way, I have to tell you right up front, if you ever want to be Chief of Staff to the President of the United States, do not apply for it. <laughs> I don't know anyone who became a Chief of Staff because they applied for the job. And Presidents do not go to monster.com or Indeed <laughs> looking for a Chief of Staff. <clears throat> and when I became the Chief of Staff, I was shocked with the invitation. I actually presumed it was an invitation to run a transition into government. I had run transitions out of government for George W. Bush's dad. And I thought he was asking me to run the transition into government when he said, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the big one. That was the term he used. He was talking about being his chief of staff. So I have to tell you a little bit about what the job of the chief of staff is. And it's not something that you would recognize in corporate America. You might recognize it at the State House, but it's a pretty unique position. And there's a professor at Harvard named Roger B. Porter who described the responsibilities as number one, the care and feeding of the president. And that's something that a lot of you don't think about. That is probably the biggest responsibility. So chief of staff, has to pay attention to the President of the United States, whether it's a man or a woman, tall or short, Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal, short, fat, doesn't make any difference. You care about it. And you pay attention to the President every minute of every day. So the job is all-consuming when caring about the care and feeding of the President. Why? Because you don't want the President to be in a mood where he can't make a tough decision or she can't make a tough decision at any time, on any day, in any venue. So you pay attention to every aspect of the president's life. And that is very consuming. There's a whole infrastructure, however, that does it. All of you should want to be president. You're very well cared for. <laughs> Your luggage never gets lost. The limousine is always there, ready to take you. You don't have to worry about the parking spot. 
Air Force One will take you where you need to go, and you'll get back in time. The care and feeding, however, requires a huge bureaucracy. And it's a bureaucracy that doesn't make policy. But how it performs impacts how a policy decision will be made by a president. So you don't want the president worrying about the wrong thing, the phone not working, no pens. Where's the hand wash? How come there's no gas in the car? How come there's a line on Air Force One before I can get on? So the care and feeding is a big part of the job. And Roger Porter from Harvard writes about that in his book. And I will admit, it's a huge responsibility. Because I wanted the president to be in a position to make good decisions no matter when they had to be made. So I paid attention to his daily life, his relationship with his wife, his relationship with his kids, his relationship with his siblings, his parents, the staff, me. And it's very consuming. The next responsibility that Roger Porter mentioned was policy formulation. That's the president's job. The chief of staff has to make sure that the policy process lives up to the president's expectations so that the policies that are made are well understood, can be executed in such a way to live up to the president's expectation, and that they make a difference. And so yes, that's a big part of the chief of staff's job. It's not the chief of staff's job to make policy. It's the chief of staff's job to make sure the process for making policy is all inclusive. And I used to use something called the discipline of the P's in making the policy process work. And <clears throat> I already said policy is really easy to make up. Imagine how easy it is for someone who is hired to work at the White House because they're a rock star in, of policy. And they're hired with a, a good-sized ego in a venue that is really hard to get into, the White House, and they're very important and they were hired because they're an expert. So they come in saying, I am going to be making the policy. And the chief of staff's job is to say, you will be helping the president make the policy. It's not your policy. It's the president's policy. So that process, the P word, includes the policy itself, and the personalities that will be making the policy recommendations. And you know if you are the best in the business, and I always want the president to be able to hire the very best. If you're the best, your ego probably tells you you are the best. So managing those egos is the job of the chief of staff. And yes, it's tough to manage the ego of a Dick Cheney. Don Rumsfeld, <laughs> Condoleezza Rice, really hard. So the chief of staff's job is to manage those personalities that are knowingly confident of their policy recommendation. The job of the chief of staff is to make sure that confidence doesn't turn into bullying of other people who are also working at the White House because they have great expertise, <clears throat> and that the decisions that are made in the Oval Office are the president's decisions. They may echo, reflect, or involve the others, but it's the president's decision, and the president carries the burden of that decision. But as this program highlights, the policy 
isn't defined by the rhetoric around it. It ends up being defined by how the policy is implemented. There are so many stories of good policy that are defined by bad implementation, where expectations are high and not met. And that ends up infecting the policy process for future policy. And this is also a fact <coughs> of life that a chief of staff comes to recognize. The White House doesn't implement any policy. It makes policy. The rest of government is organized around the responsibility of implementing it. And so you can't have a chief of staff who wears blinders to the rest of government and focuses only on the White House and not the reality that the implementation of policy comes from a cabinet agency, a directorate, an administrator, boots on the ground, someone at the border, a nurse at a hospital, someone in a drinking water facility. That's the implementation. And so the chief of staff has to make sure the policy makers understand who will be implementing the policy and how will they be implementing it. Do they understand? So in the P, policy, I'm going to say, I would say, you've got the policy, Mr. Smith. Tell me about the people will be, that will be impacted by it. I want to know who they are, not necessarily by name, but who are they? What is their story? Why are we doing this policy? Who are the people? Then I want to know the people who will be partners in recognizing the policy is good because it's really hard to get done if you only are doing it for the people that will be impacted. They have to be people that are not impacted by it but see it as a good thing and they want to be the partner. Tell me who are these partners? What was the planning that went into this policy? Is it just a good idea? Or is it a plan that requires someone else to develop a plan, to bring it to reality. Who are those people that will be developing the plan? How are we communicating with them? Do we know what that process is? Have we considered all of the ramifications to the extent that we can, as much as possible, preclude unintended consequences? If you don't wrestle through that, your policy will be defined by an unintended consequence. How are you processing the results of the policy as it's implemented? Do, did you take time to pause and think about it? The implementation is so important did we leave something out in our planning to understand the process? Do we know who will actually be implementing it? How are we training them or inviting them to be enthused about the solution? Pause and take a look at it. Is it something that could be understood? Then I would say, what's the politics of the process? Whose turf are you challenging? Is the responsibility federal? Is it state? Is it local? Is it the United Nations? Is it the popes? Is it a parliament in another country? 
Will people be doing it that we can talk about it? Or will there be people doing it that we can't talk about it? Do they serve at an agency that is transparent? Or do they serve as an agency that is not? What works? And okay, all of you smart policymakers that are advising the president, is this a presidential decision or is it just a government decision? Because the president should not waste his or her time on a government decision. That's for a cabinet member to make or an administrator. Now, you want it to be made by the president, and the president will own the outcome. But is it right that I take the most valuable thing the president has, which is time, and give it to this issue? Or does it go to the secretary of HUD or HHS? Well, everyone wants every decision to be made about government to be made by the president because they want face time with the president to talk about it. And the truth is the president couldn't do his job if he had to make every government decision. So is this a presidential decision? And some of the people that would come breathlessly into my office would say, we're done, the policy is ready. And I would go through the P's and I would get to this one issue, is this a presidential decision? Oh, I hope so. I want to be there when he makes it. Well, in order to be there when he makes it, there have to be four or five meetings to get ready for him to make it. And I'm in charge of the clock. So really, does this need to be made by the president? And the next thing is really the performance. What happens if we announce it? It's put out there in the public domain and it doesn't work because people weren't ready to implement it. I'm gonna reflect on what happened on day one of President Trump's first term. Policy was, is so easy to make. I, I love it when people think up, wake up in the morning and have an idea in a solution. And it must be particularly easy in an academic environment to come up with an idea that is a great idea and why won't someone recognize it? Let's make it happen. But it's really hard if your idea is a good idea and only the idea becomes the policy without a process. So President Trump among the very first decisions he made was that you can't come into the country unless you've got the right documentation to come in the country. And it's a pretty simple policy to make up and it's actually pretty attractive to a lot of people. And it was easy to have the policy, the president as president-elect signaled that he was gonna do it. The policy was made literally on day one and there was no process in place to say, how will it work? But the policy was announced and implemented. And so at JFK Airport in New York City, a plane landed just hours after the policy was put in place. And a number of people were told they couldn't enter the country because of the new policy. And the people who had to tell them that were confused, but they were told, this is the policy, now we have to do it, and you can't come in. And some of those people were translators in Afghanistan. Help us in Iraq. And they were told they couldn't enter the country, but they'd been on the plane and they had to go back. And guess what? That ended up defining the policy. And we got stuck on stupid really fast. 
So there is a danger when you have policy, good, and the good should always be debated. That's part of our democracy. My definition of good may not be your definition of good. My definition of needed policy may not be the same as yours. But we're both making policy, and you don't want it defined by failure. So implementation is critical to the success. I've witnessed where the process really wasn't well disciplined and had to be changed. And I'm going to signal with this. People make a difference. Good people. At the White House, the chief of staff's job, you know, it's such a heady job and what a great opportunity. When the president suggested he wanted me to be his chief of staff, I said, well, I've got some issues that I need to talk to you about. If I'm your chief of staff, I cannot be your friend. And I like you as my friend. And I want to be your friend. But if I'm your chief of staff, I cannot be your friend. You're my friend and I don't want to let you down. But if I'm going to be chief of staff, I'll just be a staffer in charge of the staff. And you're going to have to let me speak candidly to you. And you won't like some of the things that I say to you. And you've got to speak very candidly with me. And I might not like some of the things you say to me. But it's important that we have that relationship. And by the way, I serve at your pleasure but my job is not to please you. And when I don't please you, your job is to tell me that I'm not pleasing you. And if you need to make a change, I'll leave. And I hope I'll be your friend. But I can't be your friend while I'm chief of staff. I have to make you feel uncomfortable. I have to call you out when things maybe you're skewed, and I'm going to be paying attention. So with that, I look forward to answering your questions. Don't be bashful about your questions. I happen to believe the most important document in our government, and actually it's the most important government document in the world, happens to be the U.S. Constitution. And the very first word, the very first word of that Constitution is we. It's our government. So I love being here with you because you are we. And right now, our democracy really needs the we to take out the polishing cloth and polish the government. We really need to do it. And we've got to recognize that the rug of American politics, at least when I got involved, had more rug than fringe. Mm. And we want people to recognize that standing on the rug is where you can have common ground and find solutions. That's the policy process that I want respected. It starts with we. Yes, it flows to every elected official state, local, and federal. It flows to our governors, it flows to our presidents. But we are the people that give permission, attitude, confidence, and support. So with that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I see. Andy, thanks so much for those. Those remarks. We're, we have folks in the room with microphones who, to, who can uh, come to you. If you raise your hand, they'll, they'll come to you. I, but I am going to take the chair's prerogative to ask the first one because this is, <laughs> I'm a student of bureaucracy. I've been dying to ask you this question. Uh, in, the, in the immediate. Professors always scare me. <laughs> in the immediate post 9 11 period, the United States government, really at every level, went through one of the most important organizational changes in its entire history. And it happened in a very short period of time. That itself was a political process. And what I'd like to know is, with the benefit of 20 years of hindsight, what did we get right 
and what did we maybe not get so right? Are, and are those changes working the way that you all envisioned them 20 years ago? Well, obviously, September 11, 2001 is a day that we promise never to forget. But many of us have moved on. And I guarantee if you go speak to a, a junior high school right now, they think it's a video game. Mm -hmm. And it's not. It was a, it, the real thing. But certainly, it was a day that changed America, changed the world. It changed the president. Um, George W. Bush doesn't like it when I say that. But when I whispered in his ear in that classroom and I said, a second plane hit the second tower, America is under attack. I believe that's when he became president. He thought that he became president and focused on it in his inaugural address, but his address didn't address that. His the oath of office is what he had to address when I whispered into his ear. Preserve, protect, and defend. And that was a burden that he carried. So that was the day. And it did cause the government to say, what do we need to do differently? What happened? And pro one of the most salient meetings I had with the president, and it was right after the attacks, it happened to be on the Friday after the attacks. And the president had wanted a briefing on the attack. And so he had his morning briefing. The FBI director, Bob Mueller, had only been the FBI director for a few days. And he came in with a briefer. And the CIA director was there. The vice president was at a secure location, but participated. And then we had national security advisor, and we're in the Oval Office. And I remember the president looking for the FBI director to give a report on where we were. And the fellow from the FBI that was giving the report was giving in a report of an investigation. This is what we're doing. This is where, how the investigation's going. This is this and this. It was very detailed, very interesting. But the president interrupted him and said, I'm really interested in the investigation. That's very important. But of greater concern to me right now is what are you doing to protect America to prevent the next attack? That's the question. And the poor briefer kind of looked down the couch to the FBI director who was sitting in front of the president's desk. And the FBI director looked at the attorney general, his boss. The attorney general then looked back at the FBI director. The FBI director looked at the briefer. The briefer looked back at the FBI director. And the FBI director said, Mr. President, we'll have to get back to you on that one. It sounds bad. It was not. It was a reality. The mindset of government was not about protecting or preventing the next attack. It was about investigating what had happened. The president said, I don't want it to happen again. What are we doing? So that became the motivation for the president to do something that very few presidents have done, reorganize government. What are we doing now? What should we be doing? And how do we make that happen? So he hired a governor, Tom Ridge, to be the first Homeland Security Advisor in the White House. And he tasked him with taking a look at all of the infrastructure in the government. And everyone who was involved in protecting the homeland would have to raise their hand. We're doing it. We're doing it. And it was all over government. And there was a famous chart that Tom Ridge had produced and was presented in the Roosevelt Room of the West Wing of the White House. And it was called a spaghetti chart because it looked like a bowl of spaghetti. And every strand of spaghetti was some agency saying, I'm in charge. And we, how do we have to reorganize to make it happen? So that was the task. And it was a task that had to be met by the executive branch first, but ratified embellished, complemented, or refined by Congress. And that became a bureaucratic challenge that related to how policy would be set, where it would be set, and more significantly, how it would be implemented. And that was a dramatic change. And it took an amazingly short period of time to do it, but it was a very 
very heavy lift. And the reason it was a heavy lift is that the parochial attitude of most bureaucracies is to protect themselves from attack by another bureaucracy. <laughs> so most, most bureauc bureaucrats that attended this meeting were there defensively, not offensively, defensively saying, don't touch me, we're doing a good job. Or think of the job we could do if we had you and your money. So everyone was saying, I'm the solution, they're the problem. Give me them and their money and we'll be the solution. It didn't work. So it required us to be very creative of how we took these policy opportunities and wrestled with them outside of the glare of a Klieg light or a press conference, outside of the vitriol of partisan politics, but instead worker bees that knew policy, knew how to implement it, knew how to execute it, and knew what the results had to be. And it was a challenge. It was probably the biggest reorganization of government since the end of World War II, when the Defense Department was changed and but it was a, a dramatic meeting, and Tom Ridge deserved a lot of credit. But it was, candidly, uh, I went to the president and talked about this spaghetti chart meeting that we had and said it was a disaster. I said, Mr. President, I'm gonna pick a group of people, Tom Ridge will definitely be part of it, but we're gonna go to some place where nobody can bother us. And then nobody can run outside and call their bureaucracy and say, get ready, watch out, it's coming. Or, I did it, I saved you. Instead, we're gonna to get together in the bunker under the White House, where, Mr. President, you go to be safe. And no one can get through that three-foot-thick door without someone giving permission to open it. And we're gonna get out there, and we're gonna first predict what predict perfection would look like. What would perfect be if we didn't have to worry about any, any lingering bureaucracy or momentum? What would perfection look like? Let's compare perfection to what reality is. How do we make the reality look more like the perfection, knowing that perfection will not happen? And who has to ratify what we've done because if we're the only ones doing it, Congress will undo it or not do it at all. So that was the process that we implemented. It was a, a wonderful group of only eight people who were very smart, and guess what? They had different disciplines different mindsets, and they were biologically different. They were also younger and older. So the perspectives were remarkable, the collegiality was significant, and the mission was really important, and it ended up working. So that's the process, and the chief of staff is responsible for that, and there are consequences to the chief of staff about the process because sometimes the pleasure doesn't reach the latitude that you wanted it to be. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we have questions. questions from the audience. Please do not be bashful. Uh, we've got some folks down front here. Can we get, a, get the mics up in this direction? Are you pointing at me? Yes. And I'll try to be disciplined yeah. with my commentary. Maybe I'll be undisciplined, but I'll be more efficient. Maybe that's it. Hi, I'm Abby Sweats. I'm a La Follette grad, and I'm the Director of Communications in our State Education Agency. And I was wondering if you could talk to, if people matter and implementation matters, agreed. What does the implementation of people look like to you? The hiring through the managing, obviously you manage the staff, right? So could you talk a little bit about lessons you learned in that world? Okay, well, <clears throat> You know, hiring good people is a challenge no matter what profession you're in. <laughs> and I am not an HR expert, but I have been abused by HR and complimented by HR. <laughs> First of all, I do think presidents deserve to have the best and the brightest, and they should not be monolithic in their thought. So they should not always reflect the president's biases. They should bring their own biases and have the courage to defend them. And that's sometimes 
awkward to do in a political environment. You, unfortunately today, uh, you're guilty by association before there's a trial. So if, if you have a friend who someone else doesn't like, and you like that friend, you're presumed to be unliked. And we've got to get over that. We've got to look for competence, commitment, I'm going to say ethics, really important, and a conscience. Some people who have the courage to speak up, but the greater courage to listen. Uh, I met with some students yesterday and I said my grandmother had two things that were very significant. I was, if I was in trouble, I was sent to my grandmother's house when I was in high school. It was not over the river and through the woods, it was across the street. And so if I wasn't doing my homework, go to grandma's house. And she was a militant suffragette, a school teacher. She kept me disciplined. But she had two things that she repeatedly would say to me as I was an arrogant teenager. And the first one was, taste your words before you spit them out. <laughs> Today, it should be lick your thumbs before you tweet them out. <laughs> the second thing she said was, do not leave the room until you go out the door. You walk into a room and you tell everybody what you think, but then you doodle, you daydream, you gossip, and then you leave the room and you leave with less than what you came in with because you gave something away and you didn't take anything in, do not leave the room until you go out the door and listen. That's what I would look for in, a, in people that I hired, people that have the courage to recognize words matter, especially at the White House. An utterance from the White House can do tremendous damage if it's inappropriate, tremendous damage. But it's also a responsibility that we have to Taste our words, respect other words, listen and grow. So that's what I would be looking for in, in terms of hiring. I, I'm not sure that I would hire by quota. I'm, I don't believe in that. I do think you should hire by expertise. You don't want to have someone who is a national security policy expert to be told, would you run the economic policy department at the White House? No. And by the same token, you don't want someone from the Treasury Department to say, this is what the State Department should be doing. Over here. Good morning. I'm Reuben Anthony, the President and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Madison. Um, and I'm a public administrator. And uh, I look at uh, the decline of um, public administration, particularly uh, during the uh, Trump administration, January 6th, and COVID. Will we have what we need uh, to get off of life support or, or, or will we stay on life support? And is the bureaucracy resilient enough uh, to keep public administration alive? January 6th was a horrible day. It tarnished America. It, it impacted uh, the shining city on the hill that Ronald Reagan talked about. And it empowered autocracy. So I am very troubled with what happened on January 6th, and I wept as it was happening. And yes, uh, it challenged all of bureaucracy. It tarnished all of bureaucracy, no matter what bureaucracy you're in. Government did not have a good name. And, and I think that's where I'm saying we have the responsibility to polish our democracy. We have, we have a responsibility to respect the institutions of democracy. And so I'm, yes, I, I am, I, I don't want to say I'm militant about it, but I am passionate about it. And I don't look for one leader to fix the problem. We the people have to fix the problem. And we have to give permission for people to have views, but be respectful. And we should not walk in you carry your bias, but don't carry your bias to exclude other biases. And it's just, it takes discipline. So I don't have a good answer for you, but boy, if we don't do it, I had a stint as the chairman of the National Endowment of Democracy, a great privilege. 
Ronald Reagan gave a speech at Westminster in, in London, and he called for the democracies of the world to plant seeds of democracy in places where there were dictatorships and autocracies and chaos. And the National Endowment for Democracy does that to the tune of about $300 million every year. And some of it we talk about, some of it we don't. It's done in China and Russia and all over the place. But January 6 compromised our ability to claim we're on the high ground. And that means that we are inadvertently or unknowingly empowering autocracies or bad government. And that's why we the people have got to wake up and say enough is enough. So I don't know if I answered your question, but please be inclusive in our democracy, not exclusive. Be respectful. Recognize those who serve in government are actually helping us. And the institutions of government are there not to undermine. They're, to my knowledge, and I looked, I could not find the deep state when I was chief of staff. <laughs> there were some people I wanted to put in a deep state, <laughs> but I couldn't find it implementing policy in the United States. That seems like the perfect place to end uh, before any of us get sent to the deep state. So thank, <laughs> please join me in thanking Andrew Carr for all those remarkable remarks. Thank you. The break, is that right? 15 minute break before we come back with our first plenary panel.
we can uh, make our way back to the seats, I think we'd like to get moving with the next, uh, next uh, discussion here. I'll give you all a second. Welcome back. I hope you all had a chance to stretch your legs and uh, uh, after that uh, great, uh, great opening keynote. Uh, let me begin by introducing myself. My name is Benoit Jacob. I am the director of the Community Development Institute, which is uh, one of six institutes that shape the Division of Extension here at uh, UW-Madison. I'm going to start off uh, just uh, before introducing the panel, just to tell you a quick, uh, quick a little bit more about me and a little story. So, so I've been here at Madison for three years. Uh, prior to this, I was a professor in various uh, institutions for the, over the past 15 years. I'm actually Canadian originally, moved to the US about 20, 20 odd some years ago. Uh, so uh, between my move and starting Academe, I was uh, a land use planner in Rockland County, New York. So this was, yeah, I said 23 years or so ago. So when I moved to Rockland County, New York, I was there with my uh, uh, girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, and so I was a land use planner in county government, new to the country, new to New York, dating a girl, which means at that time we would do things like go to parties and introduce ourselves to people and talk to people. My wife, who was a cardiac ICU nurse at the time, said, listen, Benoit, Whatever you do, when we go to a party and they ask you what you do, you cannot say you are a land use planner in a county government. Her horror was, of course, that we would never be invited back, right? So what this meant is that we would go to parties and inevitably I would say something like, I'm an astronaut, I'm a spy. <laughs> I'd have, always have kind of a backstory associated with who I was. Every now and again, though, I would say, I'm a land use planner in Rockland County. And inevitably, people would start to go immediately into, oh, you are the person who's causing delays in the development and causing inefficiency in the government. And this, of course, you know, is a young professional personally offensive, um, in addition to the fact that I have to sort of side eye over to my girlfriend at the time who's rolling her eyes and saying, why couldn't you just be an astronaut today? But it was actually so, and I'll just give you a little backstory. So, as a land use planner and county government in New York State, what we had to do was something called general municipal law reviews. And those general municipal law reviews were any time an application came in, we as the land use planners would review it for consistency with the comprehensive plan and make sure it met all the environmental regulations of the state. And then we would move it along the uh, chain in the planning office. And the way the office was organized was that we had five or six junior planners such as myself at the time that would get these applications in and they'd be coming in fast and because we were young and excited we were fast clanking up just pounding through them right hyper efficient so efficient that these applications would pile up at the next level where there was only one person who had to then sort of review our reviews to make sure they were consistent so what drove me crazy was when i introduced myself as a land use planner and had to hear about the inefficiency of government and the inefficient process I was a part of, it was frustrating because I would say we're not inefficient. We're super efficient. It's this person over here, right? It's this process. It's not inherent as a bureaucrat that we're inefficient. And that was though the first time and, and clearly sort of an influential moment where I started to realize that, because when you think about government, you think about policy. You don't think necessarily about those in administrative processes and structures. But it was there where I started to realize how important the administrative structures were for the, impl for the way policy and regulations actually took hold, and also the way the results of those impacted the way people felt about government. That was a real observation from 20 years ago. So over the past 20 years, first 15 as a scholar and now uh, with the Division of Extension, I've spent the last 15 years looking at implementation because those early experiences mattered to me so much. 
And so I currently have a chance, like I currently work uh, still studying implementation. I, I focus on local governments and the diversity and equity inclusion efforts and how those are implemented in government. But all this to say that I am super interested in the way governments, local governments in particular, implement policy and what that means. And that is why I'm super excited to be here with this group of fine panelists who are going to spend some time talking to you all about how their various policies are implemented and the challenges they see in, in sort of the day-to-day -day operations. So let me introduce each of our panelists. Um, let's see, I'll start at this end. Tara Yang is the first Asian American city commissioner in the city of Green Bay. She serves as the chairwoman of the Green Bay Equal Rights Commission. Tara was born and raised in Green Bay and received her Bachelor of Science here at the UW-Madison. Her work is deeply rooted in racial, socioeconomic, and health equity. She is a two-time Young Professional of the Year Award winner and was recognized by Madison 365 as part of Wisconsin's Top 34 Most Influential Asian Americans in 2021. Dr. Reuben Anthony has been President and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Madison since March 2015. He is leading the fight to build generational wealth for the BIPOC community through home ownership programs and is also co-founder of the Black Business Hub, which is currently under construction. Over the past 30 years, Ruben has been senior manager in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. He is a subject matter expert in developing job placement strategies and in minority business development. The majority of his career has been as a manager with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, where he started as a first-line supervisor and eventually became the Deputy Secretary and Chief Operations Officer from 2003 to 2010. Eric Schamberger is the Director of Environmental Sustainability for the City of Milwaukee, where he leads the Environmental Collaboration Office. He established Wisconsin's first commercial PACE financing program led the development of the city's green climate and equity plan, or city's green infrastructure plan, and is currently the project manager for the forthcoming climate and equity plan. He negotiated the city's largest solar energy project to date, a 2.25 megawatt solar system on the city-owned landfill, and he is co-founder of the Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition. He holds a master's of public affairs degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison LaFault School of Public Affairs, and certificates in water technology, energy analysis, and policy and business communications. So super excited to have these panelists here. Uh, just by way of order of operations, we're gonna give them a super fast uh, five minutes to discuss their, their policy and the implementation thereof. We'll, I'll have a few questions for them if time allows, and then of course we will open it up all to you. So I'll start with uh, Eric. You should be going, I think they're good. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's exciting to be here, uh, back with La Follette. Um, thank you for the, the good introduction. Uh, just a shout out to La Follette. Uh, so I came to La Follette, I graduated in 2002, and uh, the skills you learn about and learning about government prior to impl trying to implement things was invaluable. And we, uh, one of the cool things about La Follette is we were able to take schools in the law, or, take classes in the law school, the business school on finance, the environmental policy school. And so that well-rounded background that you learn at La Folla really informs um, how I've approached policy development and implementation. Uh, and most people who don't even know what implementation is, they think about the policy, they don't even think about the implementation, but both of them are, are critical. Um, so over time we helped uh, develop the environmental collaboration or, or ECO. Uh, and our mission is to make Milwaukee a world-class eco-city. And we've done many things over the years, as, as was discussed, but right now we're putting a climate and equity plan together, and we had a big inclusive process with citizens, and we came up with 10 big ideas on climate change. Now, climate touches everything, right? And so it was a challenge just to get it winnowed down to 10 big ideas and get consensus around those things, everything from decarbonization of buildings to electric vehicles to just rethinking our trans transportation systems in Milwaukee to make them more pedestrian friendly. So it took two or three years just to get to the 10 big ideas, right? But the reality is those 10 big ideas, to implement those, there will be a thousand decisions for each one of those that have to get made by government officials working with partners over time. So yes, it was easy to say we should transition to electric vehicles, but now we need to figure out where those stations gonna be located. How does that work with the utilities? The, how is the pricing going to work? What's fair? What's equitable? So there is a lot that goes into implementation. 
Um, one of the things that we do in ECO, we have to do both run our own programs and then we also try to influence other city departments to be more sustainable. And so when you think about inclusive policy implementation, it's the people that we're trying to help, but it's also thinking about and listening to the other mid-level managers throughout departments that have to implement the policies you're trying to do to hear how they do things now and, and what it's gonna take to change that to move things in a more sustainable direction. And so it takes a lot of listening. So there's usually kind of a policy arc for implementation where on any new issue, you gotta go in and, and yes, we're bringing an agenda that we're trying to move things in a more sustainable way, but you really gotta learn. I mean, uh, just as an example, this week we're trying to switch our policy to require more electric vehicles. So it's been meeting after meeting with fleet managers about how do they select vehicles and all of the different issues that they need to know so that when you implement the policy, that they can still do their core job. Um, and do it in a more sustainable way. So the, the conversation with the community, but also with the other managers is critical. Um, one of the projects that we did going back 10 years um, was our ME2 program that really required a lot of input. So this came out of um, the, the, the stimulus from about 2009. And there was a middle class task force that then president or then vice president Biden had and it said we should create more financing programs for energy efficiency. The idea being that uh, energy efficiency pays for itself but a lot of people don't have the upfront cost to do it so how do you help finance them? So we got a grant uh, working with a, a, a Madison based organization now called Slipstream to think about how we set up financing programs. Uh, we had to then f figure out how that fit in with the existing energy efficiency programs in the state, like the weatherization assistance and focus on energy programs and how we were going to cooperate with them. We had to get, set up an, a, a, a financing mechanism with a local credit union, some credit union, and we had a whole process for that. Then we had contractors that had to be, um, you know, that would be implementing this work in people's houses. So we had to talk to them and get them on. all these different parties uh, and then talk to the marketing people about how do you communicate these things so the it was a tremendous amount of decision making that had to happen at the government level in consultation with the people that were implementing it uh, the partners that you're trying to bring to the table all the things that uh, Andrew Card mentioned where you didn't want to step on people's turf that had been doing this previously but you wanted to bring them into the fold and implement something new and better and build off the existing in, uh, in institutions that were out there. So it was a challenge, it, it was exciting. We were able to help um, hundreds of homeowners, at the, actually about 1,400 homeowners get energy efficiency projects. Now here 10 years later with the Inflation Reduction Act, we're having all of those same conversations again, but it's gonna be at a much greater magnitude with the federal resources that are gonna be coming into communities. So all of those same conversations of how do we scale up contractors? What do they need? Oh, they need a workforce. Now I'm in, in the workforce development world, um, working with banks and finance partners, technology providers, all of that has to come together for effective policy. Um, and it's a, just a tremendously exciting thing to be in government. Um, as an implementer, I love my job because every day is something a little different. It's something exciting. And um, it's so important to not only do the high level goals around climate and sustainability, but to build that trust in government through effective partnerships. Uh, and then constantly, the last point is constantly reevaluating what you're doing to make sure that the people that are trying to use your program don't have frustrations. And providing that good customer service uh, and constantly trying to retool and be better uh, to me is a, a ticket to uh, running successful and implementing successful policies. So thank you. Great. Uh, Tara? Hi, how are you? Oh. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Sorry. Um, so as thank you for the introduction, Benoit, and um, thanks for kicking things off, Eric. Um, as Benoit mentioned, I reside in the city of Green Bay, and I'm the, um, the chairwoman for the Equal Rights Commission. Now, Green Bay, it's the third largest city in Wisconsin, and it, it's, um, it has a increasingly growing diverse population. Therefore, in 2020, therefore in 2020 the mayor, um, the current mayor, Mayor Eric Genrich, enacted an uh, equal rights ordinance. And they created, to govern that, they created the Equal Rights Commission. However, city council 
um, the majority of city council actually voted to take away the authority of what an actual commission should have, um, which is to regulate and enforce the ordinance. For instance, um, Milwaukee and Madison's um, Equal Rights Commissions, they have the authority to um, review and to find resolution and solutions to the, uh, discrimination complaints. However, um, City Council took that authority away from us. So we were posed with the question of, okay, so we our commission was created to govern this ordinance, but we don't have that authority. So how do we regulate the compliance of this ordinance without the authority of enforcing? And the way we thought about it was that hey, if we don't have this authority, we have to work with communities so that they can, they can um, be the regulators of this ordinance. And we um, particularly um, worked with the community members and organizations that were affected by, um, or that were protected under this new ordinance, um, the Equal Rights Ordinance. And when we approached them, um, it actually, you know, it came, um, it wasn't actually a smooth approach um, because they had distrust in the government. Any bodies that, any, any organization that was associated with the governance, these marginalized and underserved community members felt um, that they didn't have the trust there and they felt like the bridges were burned and they, they were burned by govern, government before. So they didn't want to come forth and collaborate with us. Um, but re what really helped was that we allowed them to have agency throughout our whole initiative. Um, and a really good example of an initiative that we worked on is um, the initiative to um, implement programs and services that create fair and equal access to housing, affordable housing. So um, we worked with these community members and we gained their trust and they were there through all the steps from giving us testimonies about their experiences through the housing crisis, um, providing us with um, feedback on the full report and rec policy recommendations. Um, and so we allowed them to be there every step of the way. So we built that trust. Now, when we were, um, presented it to the city council, city council still pushed back and said, no, we're not going to implement any of these policies where you know, we don't, we're not going to create programs or services. So we created what the community members and our Equal Rights Commission did was we created public pressure Right, we invited the media to come. We hosted an event on a really important national holiday, which was the MLK, um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we made this a public urgency so that there was no room for city council to ignore this, this um, issue at hand. Um, and what, they, what that did was it forced them into creating, um, into taking our report and recommendations and referring that to staff to create a task force. So although we as a commission weren't able to, we didn't have the authority to implement a lot of things and didn't have authority to regulate things, we utilized our community members to do so, to create that public pressure so that they can create services and programs. And so, and we were two steps ahead of city council because we knew that city council could only make three, two or three different moves um, after it came out, after we published our report and it came to light in the media. Um, we knew that one, they could shut it down, two, they could just say, um, receive a place and file three they can they can actually take action and they actually chose to take action so they when they referred it back to staff we were um, like I said before we were two steps ahead early on in our initiative we created a bond with the staff that worked in housing and development so we created that trust and understanding of what um, where we'd like to go with um, our policy recommendations um, and so the staff when they were assigned to be the um, the the group to form task force, we were at the table. We were the f people who were invited to the table first. Um, and we were able to share three very important um, recommendations for them while you're implementing um, programs or policies. One, um, the first thing is to, to make sure that it's a short form task force. Because we know long form task force, there's great discussion created, but there's high turnover rate with people because life happens, career changes, and so every few, every few years, you always kind of go back to square one and have to retrain people. So you have to create short form task, a short form task force so that you can um, create quick actions. So implement one or two recommendation, policy recommendations a year until it's completed and then that task force is finished. But what do you do after that, that that's completed, after the task force completes their, their um, objectives? Um, you move forward to creating that, during that time actually, you create the, um, 
you continue to create um, the bond with community organizations. So city staff, it's their responsibility to create that partnership so that they can contract or partner with a local organization that's already trusted with the community, the marginalized and underserved communities. And when, um, when that happens, when you create that type of partnership, it creates sustainability in those programs and services. Um, and so for us, um, although um, it took a while to get there to, to, to implement, um, some of the policies that are within our ordinance, um, we were um, successful in doing so. But it is only a small battle, you know, and um, I'm running out of time, so my last thing that I'd like to say is that it shouldn't really take that much effort and time to ask for the bare minimum from government, really. Um, I think that we need to um, really make sure that we are paying attention to the, the marginalized communities and um, amplifying their voices. Because in this, in this instance, for our, um, our initiative with housing, uh, it's, housing is not a, it's not a privilege. It's, it's a basic human right. So it shouldn't be that difficult to ask for the bare minimum. So thank you. Thank you. Ruben? Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Reuben Anthony. Uh, as you heard, I'm the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Madison. And, uh, but uh, the example uh, that I'm going to talk about today is from when I was the deputy secretary of the Department of Transportation. First, um, I'm a graduate not from the La Follette Institute, but from the Department of Urban Regional Planning, which is a good collaborator with the La Follette Institute. Mm -hmm. Um, the project that I want to talk about is when I was the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Transportation. I worked for um, Governor Jim Dahl, and he had an overarching um, policy um, agenda called uh, Grow Wisconsin. And with him, he says that in order for the state to grow, um, Milwaukee has to be a part of that growth process. And during the same time, we were having a, a big project, the state's first mega project, you know, um, lined up, uh, you know, uh, in 2004. Uh, to start. It was called the Marquette Interchange Project, and many thought that the Mar Marquette Interchange Project would be disruptive in a lot of ways. It would be disruptive because it would disrupt the downtown businesses and people would be pissed off with government. It would be disruptive again because um, there's this historical memory of how bad highways were uh, for black communities. And in Milwaukee, particularly, um, Bronzeville was an area where Highway 43 went through where they took parks and they took a lot of things uh, from uh, the department. Earlier in my career, I was an urban modal manager and uh, I was the guy to get out in front of the uh, Marquette Interchange to let the Milwaukee community know uh, that uh, it was coming. And I went to many community outreach meetings to say, the Marquette's coming and people would say, get out of here. Um, we know what it did uh, before. At the same time, I was the, uh, the person that would have to go and tell um, the um, road building uh, community what the Marquette Interchange project would be and what supplier diversity would be. So that first meeting uh, with the road builders, we go up to Lake Geneva, you know, and we go into this room, and it's all these powerful, you know, old white men, you know, in the room, and I'm the keynote speaker, and I'm going to tell them about, you know, the Marquette Interchange, and I'm like, so we're going to have supplier diversity, and we're going to make sure that some black businesses get on the job, we're going to make sure that uh, black workers and Latino workers and women get on the job. And when I left there, I'm like, I, I didn't feel like everything was all right. When I got into, back to the office, Frank Busalaki, the secretary, said, what did you do? I got like 50 calls to say, fire you. you know, and, I, <laughs> and I said, I just took uh, the governor's message forward, just saying that, you know, we have to, you know, hire people on this job. It's an $800 million project, so, uh, you know, people in the community ought to get paid as well. He said, you better be right about this. And, and, and it turned out to, uh, to be okay, um, because, um, we set up a, a system of making sure uh, that uh, we had uh, minority workers uh, on the project. And one of the biggest approaches that we took from a policy implementation standpoint was that we took this $810 million project and uh, we actually um, uh, split it up into uh, about 84 small different projects. We had the big projects in, in PAC, but we knew that if we had not divided this project up, there's no way that small businesses could get bonded or do the things that they need to do uh, to participate, you know, in, in this project, you know, overall. And so um, at the end of the day, um, you know, 
I mean, it was problematic because um, the excuse that the industry always used was that uh, there's not a sufficient number of minority businesses ready, willing, and able to work. There's not a sufficient number of black workers in the pipeline on the union benches uh, uh, to make this project work. So there were some things uh, uh, that we had to do. Historically, the disadvantaged business enterprise goal in Milwaukee was um, 10 percent. Uh, but Senator Gary George was on the front page, you know, like hammering at us at the DOT saying that we want 50 percent because we know where Milwaukee is and that if we don't get 50 percent, we're going to shut down the highways. We're going we're to uh, protest and picket and shut down the highways. And so, I mean, it was, uh, it was frustrating uh, to go there knowing the history of, of everything uh, that was going on there. At the end of the day, you know, how do we overcome the issue? We overcome the issue because we were able to get $164 million in contracts to DBEs, you know, on that, of that uh, 800 or so um, uh, million dollars. We were also able to put together what we call the Transportation Alliance for New Solutions, where we built a pipeline of workers um, that could work by the time that the construction got ready on the Marquette. As a result of that, of the 4,000 workers that were on the Marquette, a thousand of them were minority workers, so we set a historical 25 percent uh, record on, on that project. And then with the DBEs, disadvantaged businesses, we we hit like a 20 percent uh, record on that. But what made this happen is like the public policy direction that was set from the top. The governor said that it was important for this to happen. Uh, the secretary of the agency, Frank Busalaki, said that it would it, it, it would need to happen. The other thing that we were able to do is tie this to performance. And so all of those political appointees that were division administrators, this was a part of your performance evaluation, just like anything else is. So, you know, you don't have a choice. Failure is not an option. You need to figure out how to make it work. And, and, and we have engineers can figure out anything, right? And so I'm like, don't tell me if you can figure out, you know, you know how to run bridges over rivers and all these things uh, that you can't uh, do this. So as I um, wrap up, because I see my facilitator looking at me over there, but uh, <laughs> I got a few more things to say. Um, so, th so we set up um, uh, two groups. You know, one group we set up uh, uh, as a, a business development group, and another group called uh, labor development group, because we figured that you know we have to stay tied uh, to the community. So uh, Senator um, Spencer Coggs led the business development group. The road builders who actually said, fire me, they participated in the business development group. The National Association for Minority Contractors participated, minority businesses and in Wisconsin DOT staff idolized and came up with different ideas about you know, how we can make it happen. On the labor development side, a local alderman, um, uh, Terrence Herring ran that group, and we worked with the State Bureau of Apprenticeship, we worked with the unions, and everybody to talk about how we can get um, the outcomes uh, that we want to get. Inside of the agency, and this is the point that I want to talk about you know, um, uh, quite a bit, because inside of the agency, we put together an oversight team. And what made this project work is that we use horizontal management. We brought everybody into the room who had critical things to do on this project. The lawyers, the public relations people, the engineers, the urban planners, we brought them in the same room and, and we said every other week, we're not sending things up the vertical chain like they typically do in traditional public administration. We're bringing it into a horizontal format and we're gonna make all the uh, decisions that we need uh, to make there. And so, um, I'll stop there and uh, leave uh, room for questions because you know, we're supposed to tell three stories and this is just one, so no. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you this. Uh, we will get into questions. So first, maybe let's just thank the panelists for our great uh, <laughs> stories. And, thank you. and I, am, I am super appreciative of you all sticking close to the five minute time. I can't even say hello in five minutes and so this is uh, I, uh, quite a task to ask. So I guess the way this will work, I've got a few questions. Um, I'd actually sent them some questions in advance. I'm not gonna ask you any of those because now I've got other questions. Um, uh, but then I guess folks will be wandering around uh, as well. So I'll get a couple of questions in and then as folks uh, wanna chime in with their questions, that would be super. But Eric, Eric, and I think sort of a theme coming through in general across all of this, um, uh, the folks sort of said, uh, Ruben talked about figuring things out. I think Eric talked a little bit about learning about things. So implementation particularly at the local level so I said I've been studying cities and local governments for 20 odd some years right been interested in it. 
So 20 years ago, when, when my wife said, hey, don't introduce yourself as a land use planner because people won't be interested, to some degree I get it, right? I mean, local governments 20 years ago, they were the implementers of higher orders of government, right? Policy at higher orders, funnel down, local governments implemented. And frankly, the, the things they implemented weren't super exciting, right? You fast forward to today, and local governments are at the forefront of all the big issues. Environmental policy, civil unions, gun control, immigration, you can go down the list, and the level of government that is increasingly responsible for this, for policies in those areas, are local governments. Those wicked problems, though, are really hard to implement, right? It's really hard to implement. And so part of what makes um, studying or thinking about local governments and their role in implementation really exciting, I think, uh, today, is the process of figuring out and learning that goes on, right? Big policy comes down, local government is said to be responsible for it, go figure it out, right? These kind of laboratories of democracy. So in your examples or in other examples, help us understand a little bit about what that figuring out looks like at the street level, right? What do street level bureaucrats have to do to figure things out? Sure. So first of all, uh, local governments are a, a, a great place, especially when you're, you're early in your career, because you can get stuff done. And it feels like the, the effort that you're putting in on a day-to-day -day basis, you can see the results um, because it's at a manageable scale. Um, and so I encourage you know, young, young people get thinking about their careers to think about local government. Um, when I got, first got to government in, in the city of Milwaukee, there was no energy policy. That, you know, we paid the bills. There was a fire department, the, the streets department, libraries. There was a basic kind of basket of uh, <coughs> services that local government provided, but it, I don't think most people thought of local government as being particularly innovative. Um, when, when Mayor Barrett came on at the time, he wanted to, to responding to citizen requests to do more on sustainability. Uh, he created a task force, as often happens, um, and that led to the creation of our office. Now, even still, we were. We were a one-person office, and there's this whole thing in sustainability, which touches on everything. It's an enormous field. And so over time, we had to demonstrate results and grow that office and um, think about how, what, what levers of, um, does local government have? What can we do with the authority we have under state law and other things? Um, what can we get done just by better practices versus, you know, a lot of things you don't even need a law. You know, you can just, by educating people to, to do things better, you can get a lot done without even changing policy necessarily. So what can we get done locally? Where do we need law changes? At the, what can we change at the local level? And then where do we need state changes, which I'll come back to real, real quick, because there's a lot of things local government still can't do and we need better policy at the state level. Um, but one of the things for, at least in my field, um, there was an organization that grew up over the last 10 or year, 15 years called Urban Sustainability Directors Network, where we were sharing ideas across uh, cities. And you could, on their website, you could punch in, hey, does anybody got a policy on electric vehicles? Does anybody have a policy on compost? And you could see very quickly the most cutting edge policies that you know, other places were implementing. And so that kind of idea sharing um, is, that is you know, facilitated by technology. It would have been very difficult to do that before the internet, but now it's a lot easier to kind of get those exciting ideas, figure out what works in your local context, and then go uh, try to implement it. But the, the idea sharing is so important across cities. I, I feel like we're in a partnership um, within cities around the world that have sustainability goals, and we're trying to learn from each other and figure out what you can implement. And that not only are you learning what other cities are doing, but there's, you know, there gets to be a little friendly competition uh, between cities, and it's, then I can go into my mayor and say, hey, you know, look what th these other cities are doing. It's, and it gives the, the executives the comfort that it's not, you know, in certain cases you want to push and be the leader, but in other cases, you know, they want to get the comfort that this has been done successfully in other places. And so I think finding that balance of uh, learning from other cities but also finding opportunities to lead is, is kind of a recipe for innovation and success. Um, so same question to Ruben and Tara, but I'm going to push just a little bit farther just to dig a little deeper into the organization. Um, so because learning, is, so part of learning is of course this kind of learning across municipalities and so forth, but some of the learning is just occurring deep within the organization in terms of, you know, we can think about um, 
I think this was a question I did post to you guys in advance, uh, sort of the evaluations that go on, right? The reason we put program evaluation in at the front end is so that we can have sort of data coming out and we can learn from it and adjust the program accordingly. So maybe a reframe on the questions, or even in Terry, you can take this or Eric as well. Um, uh, where does data and performance evaluation and subsequently learning, where has that played out in your, in your cases? And has any of that, have any of those efforts resulted in a shift in direction in the way things were implemented? Tara or Ruben, maybe? I actually like your first question better. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> sorry. Answer so, whatever you listen. Right. I've lost control of this panel anyway. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. Do what you want, Ruben. Let me, let me just. Want. <laughs> yeah. So, with the uh, uh, first question uh, that you asked about, you know, local government uh, engagement, and because uh, while uh, when you asked that question, uh, I went to the mindset of how can we get local government to, to help, and and I'm thinking about my role as the um, Urban League uh, president and CEO. You know, uh, I think they have to listen, um, get out of the way, and be willing to partner. And 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 to provide some context around that, you know, we had an opportunity uh, to uh, uh, get in the front of uh, gentrification that's happening in one part of our town. I'm building a black business hub, and uh, the the mayor and the city council says, "How can uh, um, we be a part of that?" I'm like, "Okay." Um, let's have a conversation about that because what we see happening is that we see all these developers coming down Park Street and they're running up their value, they're making it too expensive for African Americans and others to live there, can't we be a part of this conversation? And they said yes, right? And then they also gave us um, uh, you know, land uh, to uh, help uh, you know, develop this project. But they also um, were able to uh, uh, let us work uh, with city staff uh, to do this horizontal management thing that I talked about on the Marquette. And for maybe three months straight, every week, um, we met with city staff, uh, and, and they brought in the attorneys, they brought in uh, the planners, um, um, they brought in all of the technicians, and they were able to allow us to advance things fast, you know, and, and that really helped us uh, with this whole thing uh, around um, uh, partnering and, 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 and getting, you know, um, out, out of the way. And uh, because there were different policies, uh, for example, right now, uh, one thing that held us up was the bird glass. They have a new policy to say that um, you have to put in bird glass in your buildings that you build today. That would have set our project back um, six months. And we're like, nah, there gotta be another solution because if you hold me up this long, I'm gonna lose my tenants. And so come on in and listen to us, talk to us about what we can do. Then they finally gave us an alternative where they said, you can put regular glass, you don't have to put the etched bird glass in there, but we'll put decals on there that will serve as um, the same function that the etched glass would be. So I just wanted to add that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I kind of forgot the questions, but just to, just to echo off what Ruben was saying. do what you want. <laughs> Why am I even here? Do what you want. It doesn't matter. I'm sorry. <laughs> To echo what Ruben was saying, I think that it's really important not to discredit, um, and this is kind of coming out of one of your questions that you, you um, shared with us, don't discredit street level um, discretion. I think it's really important to make sure that you, are, um, you have members on your committees, commissions, um, any dis decision making table, implementation, implementation tables, um, to, it's important to have those members who are experiencing the daily, um, these, daily or these issues daily. Um, and so, you know, I, one of the things I always say is that I came, I, policy was not my background. I was in marketing, branding, and um, business development. But I came into um, the policy world as a concerned citizen, and I was able to, to support the county and the city both in enacting two different ordinances um, that were um, essentially for um, health equity and equal rights. And so um, I just want to make sure that, you know, you that street level discretion is, um, isn't discredited. Yeah, go ahead. To your question about data and how do you Glad someone's us. trying, they're right. fine. That's good. Um, so with our ME2 program that I alluded to, we were, it was a financing program, but at various points we've offered incentives to help people make energy efficiency improvements in their home. And at one point, you know, the idea of trying to be more equitable in that came up and it was like, so maybe we should try means testing in that if you were low income, you got higher incentives which is a great idea and concept. Well, we, we, so we, we implemented that and there was a, 
we try to make it as easy as possible by piggybacking on other people that do, you know, uh, income verification. Well, you know, six months in, nobody that would have qualified for these higher incentives took it. So we had to ask the question, well, why not? Um, what's going on? And it was just the paperwork. You know, you're asking a customer to get, you know, a couple thousand dollars incentives and they got to send up all this, in, you know, income verification stuff to some agency far away and wait six months. The contractors hate it because they're in there within a customer trying to convince them to get a new furnace. But, oh, if you want the higher incentive, we can't close the deal for six weeks. So, with, so then the thought is, well, how do you preserve the, the intent for equity w while making this easier to implement? And so one of the things we're shifting towards is, well, if you're in a, maybe if you're in a zip code that is a, has a high energy burden, high poverty rates, is a zip code enough to automatically qualify for the, the higher incentive? So you can close the deal immediately and not have to have this big process, which is also kind of intrusive to have to send your income to, to an agency. So that's just one example of trying to look at the data and adapt to how you roll out programs and try to just be more customer friendly to the people that you're trying to serve. Can I add to that? Yeah. yeah. So in terms of the data that we used on the Marquette Interchange, the first example that I gave, it was important that the project be um, on time and on budget, so we use a, a variance analysis uh, to make sure um, that we were proceeding with all the f segments in the way that we needed. And then, um, in terms of the budget, you know, we made sure that um, we stay within a 10% range on the budget. In terms of the uh, minority business uh, enterprise achievement, uh, we monitored that, you know, on a monthly basis as well. And that the purpose of doing that was so that we have the opportunity to course correct and have a conversation if we were not on task. Great. Um, I still have more questions, but maybe I'll just check and see if there are questions out. Do folks, are there questions? Oh, yeah. Darn it! Okay. <laughs> Hi. This question is for Dr. Anthony. I was curious about the horizontal management that you keep mentioning. Um, can you talk about specific strategies that you might use in a meeting to empower those who are not in leadership positions to contribute to the conversation equally as leadership? Yeah, so that's a little bit different than the horizontal management, but I appreciate you, uh, you know, um, shouting that one out. But in a meeting, I think that, um, you know, one way uh, to do that is to have, um, um, you know, breakout, you know, um, sessions uh, when you have like a big community group, you know, and making sure that um, you have um, group facilitators like we typically do um, um, so that um, folks are, are uninhibited and they can kind of move their ideas forward. And then uh, having um, ranking processes, um, nominal group technique types of processes, uh, particularly when you're in communities um, where, um, you know, everybody gets a chance to kind of take a look and evaluate the ideas that have come forward. But you definitely have to have an idea generator um, type of, uh, you know, opportunity. For some of our projects in South Madison, uh, we hosted a, a series of things that we called the Agenda South. And with the Agenda South, um, you know, uh, one of the things that um, we were able to do, uh, particularly uh, when um, SSM was about to take out the grocery store and cause um, a food desert, we called in the, um, the CEO, you know, and then um, we brought the community in and, and uh, had folks direct that, uh, um, address him directly about what their, their needs were and what their challenges were. And, um, you know, they decided not to do it. But bringing the groups together and using different um, planning techniques uh, to really uh, allow um, idea generation and ranking of ideas. Saw some other hands up. Um, thank you all. I'm interested in hearing more about how do you deal when there are things that are just outside of your sphere of control? So like, Benoit, you mentioned being the land use planner and you're super efficient and it's the next guy down the chain that's causing the bottleneck. Or Tara, you were telling the story about um, having your enforcement mechanism taken away. And I'm wondering, like, how do, you, how do you deal with that reality that there are some things that aren't within your control, but you still need to do your job and you still want to make change? And you're also dealing with things that are really deep-rooted, like systemic racism. Good question. And that's, that's a question for anybody. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah, thank you for that question. 
Um, it's difficult. I, you know, to be fully honest, it's very difficult. But I think that you have to one make sure that you have a great group, a support group, um, the people who are working beside you, your friends, your family. Um, you have to have. The, that, that support, but also um, you have to look at top down. So if you're feeling that way about your position or your work, you have to have um, a conversation with the people at the top and make sure that they understand how you're feeling so that they can um, better manage and organize um, the, the departments or um, organization. Um, I think it's really important to have that um, top down buy-in, but if you can't get that, if you're, that's unreachable and you, you've tried that method, then um, I would say you would have to go um, the route that we took, which was to create public urgency and pressure. Um, and uh, of course, you don't want to create commotion, but there are just some things that you have to, um, th there's tough topics and conversations that have to happen um, in order to make positive change. Yeah, I think um, on our project, on the um, hub project in South Madison, um, there, the thing that was out of our control is what we were going to find when we dug up the ground. And because there were um, gas, you know, um, it used to be a gas station there, uh, so we didn't know uh, what to expect. But what could happen is that um, it could impact our schedule and that, um, again, the, the, the folks that we were going to lease to um, we would lose them unless we were um, able to, you know, kind of think around it. And so that leads you as a public administrator or a planner uh, to start thinking about um, mitigation strategies and brainstorm, bring the right experts in the room, you know, who can tell you, you know, what um, strategies um, um, you can deploy. Sometimes you have to um, spend a little more money um, like we did because um, it was an environmental strategy um, that we had to take to, um, uh, to mitigate you know, around um, some of the uh, uh, environmental contamination uh, that we saw. So all of it takes um, planning and the development of strategy uh, to deal with those things that are uncertain. Did you? I mean, I, one thing that I found very valuable in my job is a telephone. So if you are talking to somebody and they're complaining about some other department that kind of affects what you're doing, I mean, I can't promise to a person that I can absolutely fix their issue and may be out of my control, but I can at least try. And then in that process, try to create better communication with the other departments that are essential for delivering effective services. Um, and trying to be a, in my job, I try to be an ambassador for good government generally. It's very easy to throw another department under the bus when you have a, a resident complaining about some, some roadblock, and, and you don't want to do that because there may be, you might only be getting half the story from somebody about what their frustration is, and then you actually pick up the phone, you call the administrator, and you find out that, you know, all the reasons that they weren't complying with the rules of that are the policy. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a balance, and every day is a, and a, it's a journey about when am I going to, stick my nose into an issue that should get fixed versus stay in my own lane. And there's no secret sauce to knowing when, when to try to influence something else. But, um, but I do want to put a plug in for Wisconsin Local Government Climate Coalition because there are cities around the state that have all made climate goals, and th but there are certain things that really the state has to be better about. And so in that situation, we formed a coalition of local governments so that we knew all had the same issues. And to try to be a bigger voice to the state, um, on a whole range of issues uh, related to sustainability and utility policy to try to make things a little easier to install solar panels and to, to do energy efficiency projects in our communities. Right. There was another question. Hi, thanks for asking or taking our questions. So all four of you deal with missions and initiatives that go across normal separations of work and you know, government agencies. Um, I was once on a board where one year they decided diversity, equity, and inclusion was going to be a big new initiative, so they elevated a new position as a chair of diversity, equity, and inclusion on the board. The next year, they took that chair away in favor of making sure all of the other board members were making sure DEI was in all actions that they were doing. And I wonder, in your experience as public administrators, which of those strategies do you think is more effective for missions and initiatives that go across multiple different separations of work. Um, sure. So one of the strategies is, um, you know, bringing uh, one person in and making them responsible for DEI uh, for the whole agency. Uh, the second strategy is making everybody uh, responsible uh, uh, for DEI. Um, I think 
Um, the, I, I do think you have to have somebody at the helm uh, with vision and direction for how to move DEI forward. But I think, again, uh, from a policy um, standpoint, um, the person at the top you know, has to be real about you know, making sure that everybody is um, making DEI happen. And uh, one of the things that it can't be is just um, a policy that's not actionable. You know, where um, what I'm finding out, and, and I'm in the work of DEI now with the Urban League, is that people have uh, now um, found the right things to say, you know, and, and uh, they've got DEI policies and things like that. But if you look under the cupboards, um, you know, they're not really doing anything differently. You know, they're not doing anything differently uh, with their hiring. They don't have diverse panels, and their spaces are still as white, you know, as they were um, before. Um, you know, um, they don't have diverse supply of diversity. And you look at the state of Wisconsin, uh, for example, they, can, they only met um, the 5% when Jim Doyle uh, was here. Uh, and, and, um, and so we can't get 5%, you know, supply of diversity. Companies here that, you know, uh, are using all this lip service talking about they bind the DEI, look under the covers and see if they're really getting it done. And so it don't matter, you know, which one of those strategies you use, uh, use, you use as long as you're able to get it done. And a lot of companies just simply not able to get it done. Well, I, you know, for me, what I'd like to say is that um, I think it's really important to have that separation, to have that chair, because there's such thing as DEI should be in all work, right? It should be implemented in all work. But um, there's such thing as doing things in good faith and saying, hey, in this project, I, as a person, am going to have this DEI framework versus having a person, a DEI specialist, who knows compliance and says, hey, this is the policies of the company or organization. This is the way that we have to work. Um, so you have a person who is enforcing regulating versus good faith, right? There's two different things. If, if I could add on that, because um, I'm on the, the city's, we call it a racial equity inclusion leadership team. There is an office that is um, task with kind of spearheading those efforts, but it's supposed to be in every city department, right? And so you have to have a combination of well-intentioned people in the departments that care about it and aren't, you know, secretly stonewalling things, but are trying to, in their daily decisions, in the thousand decisions you make, have it in their, their head that I'm going to try to view my decisions with an equity lens. There's no substitute for people at all levels who embrace it in their heart and, and want to see it implemented. You have to have that, but you, it also is very helpful uh, to have a leader at the top who cares about it and can articulate it. So there are certain things like hiring policies. Like if we're actually going to change the law related to or change policies, that's the kind of thing that it, it is a little bit better to have some centralized direction to filter that down to departments so you don't have every single department trying to do DEI but kind of creating their own mini policies that aren't consistent. So you have to have this, this mix of high-level vision with well-intentioned people in the departments trying to implement it as best they can. Great question. Any questions? Another one. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is Troy Wilson. I'm a, a Master of Public Affairs candidate. I'm a first-year student. So I was just kind of wondering, more so like Ruben and Eric, um, and also Tara, too. I don't want to leave anyone out. But I was just, I'm really interested in, I'm a, a, a federalism nerd, so specifically like fiscal federalism. So I was uh, more interested, sorry, this is a little bit easier to hear. Um, so I was just wondering about the, you know, the challenges and also like the triumphs of like specifically like all this like federal funding, especially with IIJA, the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, obviously by President for Structural Law as well, but also the state level as well for like you, for Ruben as well, for, you know, all this money and, you know, with the cross-cutting requirements and crossover sanctions and so on and so forth. Like, what are the challenges and the triumphs of all this money being used for, like, these, like, catalytic projects, um, I guess, if that makes sense? Just, like, the, um, yeah. So if you need any clarification, please let me know. Yeah, that was a mouthful. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, um, I can take it first, and I don't want to dominate the conversation. But so, for example, uh, in our um, black business hub uh, that we're building, we ended up getting um, $5 million in ARPA funds uh, from uh, the state. Um, we got um, two million in uh, funding uh, from uh, the county. We got a million in ARPA funding from Senator Tammy Baldwin. And so those come out of the appropriations uh, process. And, and uh, so what's going to happen uh, with that, the, the triumph of that is that we're able to raise so far 20, uh, 25 million of 26 million dollars to build a black business hub. And so what are we going to be able to do with that? We're going to be able to change lives. If we look at data right now in the state as it relates to minority-owned businesses, uh, there is uh, about 10,000 businesses in the state 
that have more than one employee, and only four tenths of percent or 40 of those businesses are black businesses. So we're gonna be able to make a difference with that money that they gave us. We, we started a, an accelerator program with Generator uh, where we're already starting to train cohorts uh, and uh, it's only 40 businesses, with, black businesses with more than one employee here. We've already trained more than 50 people. We've given out five grants uh, for $50,000 each. And so we can make a difference uh, in the lives of um, businesses and people by taking those appropriation dollars and, and putting them to work. If I could on that. So the IIJ the in, in the um, Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, they're going to be, it's an opportunity for a transformative uh, changes to our energy systems and our infrastructure. But the implementation has to be right. So, so Congress passes these laws, right? And then it flows, many of the things flow down to federal agencies and they have to have a whole process for like, how are we going to roll these grants out? And they have public input and that's just at the federal level. In some cases, it then flows to the states who then have to make decisions. And then there's the, the local. So like in my office that we spend a lot of time, how are we going to maximize this opportunity? If local governments aren't ready and haven't prepared plans and worked with contractors and done laid the groundwork, you miss the opportunity. You know, the grants go to other places. Maybe they don't get spent at all. Um, there are tax credits for solar, as an example. If we don't, at the local level, clearly articulate and explain how these incentives work, when they're coming, you know, kind of time, do have a communication strategy to not get people excited too early before the incentives are ready, but like get them excited just when the incentives are. That communication that happens between the local level, the state and the feds is really, really important. And it's not all figured out, but I just, I wanna say that local governments have to start preparing now. You can't wait till the grant you know, notice comes out. You gotta know what's in the bill and start planning well in advance so you have enough time to talk to the community and make sure that the things that you're recommending uh, or the grants that you're gonna go after are consistent with the, with the community's vision. And I think that's why it was really important that the city had a climate and equity task force going on in the lead up to that so that when these opportunities come, we're ready to go. And I wanna piggyback off of that. Um, I serve as the vice chair for the Economic Development Authority Committee for the city of Green Bay. So um, we do um, do kind of um, advice with funding as well. And um, something that I have noticed is that, um, you know, a big thing is that you have to take equity into con consideration when you're allocating these funds, these um, government funds, for instance, ARPA dollars that um, a lot of municipalities um, received. You have to make sure that organizations or people approaching you are um, really in need of it who have been underserved before. So um, that's the way that we would allocate those dollars to make sure that it's equitable, right? Versus a developer who's had like three different projects and he's coming to ask for more money. I'm gonna take some prerogative and just that I'm gonna ask a question here, just to dig us back into the organization a little bit. But I think, let me just preface it by saying, I think it goes without saying that everyone in this room loves Chick-fil-A. It's hard, not a controversial statement. <laughs> great, fair. <laughs> great chicken, great lemonade, lots of sauces. Great mac and cheese, too. Great, lots of things. Listen, <laughs> lots of things. But ultimately, what folks love about Chick fil A is what? Is what? Service. service. Customer service, service right? Yeah. They actually have, and this, is, this, this relates, don't worry, we're going to get this, this relates. <laughs> not merely a digression. Uh, uh, so Chick-fil-A apparently has a training program for customer service. I was at, so I work with uh, uh, city and county managers across the country. I was at a seminar where a county manager was talking about, um, he was a new county manager, and the first thing he did when he got in, uh, into his office was he sent all his staff to Chick-fil-A customer service training. This was driven by his observation that the implementation of policy happens right when the customer, the constituent, walks in the door and has to talk to someone, right? And so my question to you all is, when you think about that customer service in a public organization, what are the two, three, four, five things that your front level person has to know to make sure that policy is implemented in a way that the constituents will value. 
Go ahead. Yeah, so I can take that. Uh, now everyone's ducking the question. No, <laughs> I'm ready for that. Because uh, so I work for a nonprofit, and um, you know the two things that you have to have in that scenario: one is you have to have uh, the right person, and two, that person has to have empathy. And I'll give a couple examples. Um, the the person that I hired uh, to be our front desk person um, uh, to greet customers when they came in uh, when I started at the Urban League, she was 70 years old. And I knew her from church. And, and I knew that you know she had the right stuff for the people that were going to walk through that door. Um, she needed to make them feel like they were somebody special. I don't care if they were homeless or whatever, whatever the, the problem was. You know, she had to have that empathy. Um, we had people, a uh, person walked in um, the other day, came to um, here um, from uh, Mississippi. And um, uh, the husband came here to get medical treatment. And they had a 14-year-old kid. And um, the husband dies. And so he's the primary breadwinner and things like that. So she's coming in for help. you know. And I, I want you to treat her right when she comes to the door. I want her to feel welcome. We have people that sleep in their cars you know, sometimes. Uh, and we know that. And then we see them come in for the program. I want them to, to feel very special and know uh, that um, when they come through that door, if I can't get them some help from us, I'm going to get them some help from somebody else. That is, uh, um, has to happen, not only in nonprofit organizations, but government agencies uh, at the same way. Now, I've had the opportunity to stand in cheese lines, you know, and that's no fun. And I always tell my staff, I said, you don't want, you know, a, a, a customer feeling like um, they're standing in a cheese line for wick cheese or wick, wick milk when they're coming through there. If you're doing that, you're not going to be there long. And so it is important that customer service is like probably one of the highest tenants that you have in uh, public administration and nonprofit administration. Yeah, I think something that you want all your managers, including yourself, to keep in mind is the golden rule. So treat others the way you want to be treated. And I found it helpful to, if I'm running a program, try to use the program yourself. You know, play the secret shopper role. And, you know, if you had to access the service, what's that experience like? Did you get a call back in a reasonable amount of time? Did the person that you talked to, was, were they knowledgeable? Did they know what they were doing? And that has been very helpful to me to try to see where the bottlenecks are in process, see who's returning calls, who's not, why aren't they? Re so that's, that's number one, the golden rule. The second thing is just the respect that we all need to give government workers and that they need to re the respect they need to show back to the communities they serve. I mean, most, I think, most people get into public service because they want to serve, for the most part. And there's exceptions, but I think most people get into government very well intentioned to serve other people. It's, it can be a very stressful job, and over time, if you let the stresses get to you, it, it can impact how well you're, you know, the empathy you're showing to customers and things like that. So we have to, just res again, the respect, the two-way respect that has to happen between government workers, the citizens they serve, and as you said, that's a great point about the empathy that we want to show that all pr programs and policies are our best effort to do good for the world. And so that the goodness that we're trying to do in public service has to shine through uh, when we're delivering programs. Yeah, and I think that um, along with that, um, you have to allow room for the person who is managing that or at the top to, to learn and grow as well because mistakes will happen. Um, not everyone is an expert in, in um, everything, so allow that, that growth or that room for growth. Other questions? Hi, my name is Lane Bottomiller, and I'm an undergrad here studying public policy, but I'm also here today as a reporter from the Daily Cardinal. So when you're trying to create change or advocate for a specific issue, perhaps that affects a marginalized community that's really had bad experiences with this issue, rather that, whether that be promises unmet or just feel burnt out advocating for themselves. Do you have any advice for you know, creating impactful change while navigating past bad experiences or just dealing with sensitive issues like this? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. Um, I think that uh, when you're working with these um, marginalized, underserved community members, it's, it's, you'll find that majority of them are burned out. Um, and one thing that you can do as a person who's already in a position of power if you're working in, in government or policy or implementing anything, you have a little bit more um, advocacy power than, than they already do. So what you can do is um, 
make sure that you um, surround them with the right resources and network. So you utilize your network um, for their advantage um, to support them. Um, I don't have a hard example off the top of my head, but I think that would be the biggest thing is that if you're a person who is in place of power already, um, you need to be an advocate for those communities and organizations. I would add, you have to be careful how much you promise when you're doing public engagement. So as an example with the climate plan, we're expected to get public engagement before the plan is even adopted by the council because or the city council. They want to know that you did public engagement before they even adopted the plan. So I, when you're talking to the public, you've got to be clear like, this is, we're getting input, but this is a long road that we're going to have to go on to get this thing implemented. I mean, first it's got to, we got to get some cohesion and, and consensus about what the community is asking for. Then we got to make a draft plan and get comments on that. Then it's got to go to the common council to get approved. Then it's got to get funded. And then it's going to take another more time to roll out those programs that get funded. So you just, it's just a caution for everybody when it comes to public engagement of these things can take time. Um, and, and then it's also trying to deliver on the, the public engagement that happened three years ago. And a lot of times, you know, if we heard, we've been hearing over and over in these communities, we need jobs, we need better housing. Well, maybe we, there, we got to allocate enough time to make sure we're delivering on the, the programs that we have now and making sure they work well and people know about them and can access them before we promise the next new thing. So it's balancing the existing and making sure that's running good while also managing expectations about the new stuff you're trying to get, get through. Yeah, I found that to be a complex question. Uh, you must be from the La Follette School. No, uh, uh, <laughs> no um, the um, uh, navigating a, a bad experience and then really coming back and, uh, and getting um, an impactful um, uh, change, uh, I think it's, um, it's hard to do um, for the from the client standpoint um, because it's a trust factor. Um, people make themselves vulnerable uh, when they come you know, for help and um, they expect to um, have um, uh, their dignity, you know, uh, you know, intact and their confidentiality intact. And so I don't know what the bad experience, I was trying to wrap my mind about, you know, what the context of that bad experience was, but every agency um, should work extra hard to make sure that um, no client, you know, that is vulnerable coming into their doors has that bad experience no matter what it is. And so, um, you know, we push, um, uh, we have to push um, our staff and, and ourselves uh, to, to give exceptional service, exceptional customer service, back to what we talked about before, and to make, you know, um, it a first class experience um, for anyone um, um, that walks through our doors. I think we have time probably for one more question. Yep. I um, was thinking about taking it a little bit more to macro. I was looking at the New York Times this morning, and there's this big article uh, sort of against wokeness and against the very kinds of things you all are involved in, sustainability, DEI, the things that uh, we all kind of have values related to. And I'm wondering how much those kinds of culture war issues um, affect your work or, or whether they do or whether you want to keep a low profile or, or a higher profile on what you're trying to accomplish um, in relation to those culture war issues. Go ahead. No, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I mean, um, the Urban League of um, Greater Madison and the um, National Urban League uh, will take every one of those issues head on, um, particularly as it relates to, um, uh, you know, how important it is for um, uh, young people to know about uh, their history, uh, whether you're Jewish, whether you're black, or whatever else, you know, um, that's just a part of um, uh, America, you know, and the history of America. Um, that's just a part of um, the educational process. So. Um, I'll fight that one every day, uh, you know, where um, legislators are um, trying to take, um, you know, those components out of the education system. We'll fight that, you know, every day. And all those issues that are unjust that way, um, we stand up and I get up every day 
uh, to uh, challenge those issues. And I, I can say that when we put a climate plan together, it was the climate and equity plan because we wanted to, to talk about both of those things. But to me, it, sh it shouldn't be a culture war. It's, this is common decency that we're talking about. It's treating each other. I mean, come back to the golden rule or whatever, but this is America. We have you know, people coming from all different backgrounds from around the world, um, including people that have, were here long before um, Europeans showed up. And so we're trying to create a country where everybody is included and can fully participate in our democracy and there is no shame in that at all, and we should be proud of that. But that's, we, we have to acknowledge this, the, the problems, our history. It's not good in a lot of ways, and we gotta do better going forward. We have a responsibility and an opportunity and an obligation to do better going forward. And we're all figuring it out, exactly how that works from a policy standpoint and trying to be better, but that's, the, the point is we gotta be better, and this has gotta be talked about and included in, in what we're, we're trying to do going forward so we can, can leave a better legacy. Great, I'll just add on to that really quickly yep, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. Just, you know, the core values of public administration historically were efficiency, effectiveness. Um, we know now though, of course, that it's effic um, efficiency, effectiveness and equity. And so that's important in particular for this panel in this area because when we talk about implementation, that's what those, those fundamental issues are what we're talking about. And administrators, public administrators, play an important role in making sure that policy is efficiently implemented, effectively implemented, and equitably implemented. And so it, it's fundamental to those, those sort of issues you're talking about. So with that said, let's just offer our panelists here a thank you for their wonderful... <laughs> Um, just in terms of instructions, I've been uh, told, to, so let's see, uh, take a look at your program so you can decide which breakout session you'll be attending over lunch. You can grab a lunch, uh, boxed lunch in the back and head to your breakout session, it says here, as quickly as possible. Um, there will be staff in the hallway to direct you where you want to go and then try to be back here for the next main panel presentation at 12.30. I will just add one other thing. If, should I run into any of you at a party and my wife is present and I introduce myself as an astronaut, please play along. Thank you. Super. Thank you all. Thank you,
right back in. Yeah, we'll just let a little bit of wind pass. Build up here and bring the front row on. Let's see. Andy, how are you? Nice to see you. Are you officially the left arm in here? No, not quite yet? Okay. So, we'll find out. I mean, yeah. And if it. <laughs> I don't mind, although at some point, you know, someone's got to pay the money. So, I am actually going to, like, actually drop it. Hi, Susan. Nice to see you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Thanks for having us. Um, you know, I'm on sabbatical. No, I'm not. I've read the book and taken a ton of walks and I'm not 
Good afternoon, everybody. We are going to get this panel started in two minutes. So if you're not seated yet, grab a seat, grab a water, grab a coffee, and we will be ready to roll shortly. Karen, are you also a professor? No. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to the coveted after lunch plenary panel session. We are so glad to see all of you. I hope that you are uh, coming in energized with lots of good ideas and lots of good contacts from those lunch um, breakout sessions. I was in the affordable, which I'm now going to call forever after available housing uh, session, which was excellent. So kudos to the, the team there. My name is Karen Timberlake. I know many of you. I was most recently secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. And I'm super happy to be here today to moderate this really important discussion around collaborating across levels of government to address challenges with substance use, a problem that is affecting absolutely every single community in our state and the nation. And I would venture a guess many of us individually and within our families and personal and professional circles. So every topic that's being talked about today is important. This is, in my view, one of the most important things we need to be doing to make sure we are protecting people's health and well-being, making sure our workforce is available, and making sure our communities are safe. So the good news today is that we have two amazing panelists with us. Um, you'll see in your program that we originally were going to have a third panelist, and he is unfortunately not able to be with us, but we are absolutely delighted to have our two panelists. I'm going to do just a quick introduction of each of them, and then let me kind of talk you through how we wanted to use the time that we have together, and then I'm going to turn it over to them because they are the, the real experts. So first we have with us today Brown County Circuit Court Judge Mark Hammer. Judge Hammer has been on the bench since 2008, and prior to becoming a judge, he was a practicing attorney in the Green Bay and De Pere area for about 20 years. Judge Hammer has been the county drug court treatment judge since 2012, and he will be talking to you more about that. This court has been operational since 2010, and the county also supports a heroin treatment court, an operating while intoxicated court, a mental health court, a veterans treatment court, a family recovery court, and a juvenile offender court. So lots to talk about there in terms of some choices around implementation of each of those strategies. And then next to Judge Hammer is uh, Executive Director of Milwaukee County Department of Health and Human Services, Shakita LeGrant McLean. And Director LeGrant McLean oversees all aspects of Milwaukee County's largest department with a nearly $400 million budget, approximately 900 employees, and serving more than 80,000 residents annually. Among many other things that she will be talking about, she is a champion of the No Wrong Door model of service delivery to improve racial and health equity and serve Milwaukee County residents across their lifespan, regardless of race, gender, age, or socioeconomic status. As she will tell you more about, the county has recently been through a pretty significant behavioral health redesign with some related uh, projects that have followed from that, and she is gonna tell us much more. 
So I'll just mention with thanks to uh, retired City of Menasha Police Chief Tim Steika, who was not able to be with us today. And that what I do want to do, though, is just lift up his work. So what he would have talked to us about today is the uh, Winnebago County um, Opioid Fatality Review Team and their work. Are any of you here members of the team by any chance or from Winnebago County, just out of curiosity? Um, yay, thank you for being here and for raising your hand. So it's amazing work. Um, you should check into it if, if you are interested in, in that uh, whole arena. So here's how we're gonna use our time. Uh, what I've asked uh, Judge Hammer and Director LeGrant McLean to do is to start with a more um, fitting introduction of themselves so that you can hear a little bit more about them and, and who they really are, how they maybe got to the roles that they hold today. And then I want them each to just tell you a day in the life of the particular innovation that they are going to be talking about. So in other words, I want them to sort of paint the picture for you of what does it look like in the drug treatment court, for example, or what does it look like in this aspect of Milwaukee County Behavioral Health Services as it relates to substance use disorders. And from there, we're going to back up and we're going to go through a bit of a kind of life cycle of this policy implementation. So what I want you as an audience to be thinking about is where you are in the particular life cycle of whatever project you're thinking of or sort of whatever's causing you to be sitting in this panel right now as compared to out in the hall or, you know, back at your desk. Um, and I think, my theory, we'll see if I'm right, my theory is by sort of doing this in a chronological step-by-step -step fashion, it'll be easier for you all to kind of hear and see yourselves in the work that our two panelists are talking about. So that's my plan. We will stop about 25 after one for questions. We have a couple of fantastic students with mics who will find you. Uh, if you just want to raise your hand, ask a question, and you're all pros at this, so we'll go from there. So with that, Judge Hammer, can I ask you to tell us who you actually are and, and also tell us a little bit about the day in the life? Well, it's very nice to be here. I uh, had not been to one of these forums in the past, and I'm really honored that you think it's worth your while to hear about uh, Brown County treatment courts. Um, when I was in practice as a lawyer, I really focused exclusively on civil work. I was a civil litigator. I had no experience in, in the criminal area and not significant experience in criminal justice. So that was a new area of responsibility for me. And I tried to learn quickly because you have to. Those cases are coming in and they're not gonna wait for you to learn. They're expecting you to, to judge. One of the things I noticed over and over again was I had a lot of repeat business, um, which I never had in civil practice, but I had a lot of in criminal practice. And I was trying to figure out why are these people coming back into the system? At least why are they coming back in in Brown County? You know, when the judge sentences, you outline a, a program that requires the Department of Corrections to provide certain services and requires a prison to provide certain services. So I know the services are being provided, but I'm not seeing change in behavior, change in uh, criminality in our county. And so I asked my other judges who've been around a little bit longer, why is this not working? And one of the things that we continue to hear over and over again is that we can, we can restrain a person and we can offer them some limited services, but that's not really addressing the critical aspects of recidivism. They need a, a, a comprehensive multi-staged program that addresses not just one need, but a number of needs. And our county simply didn't have that available to us. Individual groups had particular programs or options, but there was no cohesive group to address really the systemic issues that these people face. We knew there were models that, that did that, that had a more comprehensive approach in Florida. That's where treatment courts started uh, in Dade County. And so we began to develop some interest in that, the judges that wanted to focus on decreasing repeat business and that's really got us started in thinking about, well, would, it, would it, a treatment court model work in Brown County? So I'm going to have you pause on telling us how you got there. Can you tell us a little bit about what a treatment court is? How does it even work? Well, treatment courts um, really focus on particular, thank you, focus on particular topics, right? If we are concerned about violent crime that's related to drug use or drug possession or sale, we need to focus a team that has some experience in dealing with that particular um, group of group of people. If we're concerned about people that drink and drive um, and they continue to do so, we develop a team that has some unique or special ability to address that issue. And 
uh, in order to make that start to work, we've got to convince stakeholders in the community it's a significant problem, we can address the problem in the community, and we need your individual help to make that happen. Perfect, wonderful. Great setup, and we'll come back for more. Director LeGrant McLean. Absolutely, so Shakita LeGrant McLean, um, Executive Dir Director of Department of Health and Human Services in Milwaukee County. And under the Department of Health and um, Human Services, there's a number of service areas that are underneath that umbrella. Um, and so we have housing, aging and disability services, children, youth and family services, behavioral health services, and veterans. And as um, we talked about in the introduction, really looking at no wrong door. How do we get there and what does that truly mean? More than a decade ago, we began to look at how do we redesign our behavioral health system? We wanted to move from more of an institutional care, having people institutionalized to more community-based. And how do we do that? And there was a focus not just on behavioral health, mental health, but also substance use disorder. And so that work began, again, more than a decade ago. And as we began to look at no wrong door, how do we make sure we get people connected, that focus always came around like, no matter what door you come through, what we know as we focus on social determinants of health, housing is health. We knew that housing was really important as we address any need that people were coming through our door, making sure that people were stable, making, making sure that people had what they needed and then we can wrap services around them. And so there's been a lot of work that has happened, a task force that we have created um, in collaborations with city, county, and state, and also with people with lived experience. And that's how we took a number of recommendations um, to put together a lot of the initiatives that I'll talk about today around uh, uh, safe and sober housing, um, uh, how do we respond to overdose, and the partnerships that we have with the city um, health department and other partners in the community. But there's a number of things that we do because, again, it's this continu continuum, right? It doesn't just stop at one area. It's how do we provide these services across? How do we get you stable and then make sure that you're connected to treatment? How do we help you get recovered, right? and how do we prevent it from even happening, especially this time while we're seeing the highest number of overdose deaths in Milwaukee County. Great, thank you. Thank you for the setup. Yeah. Okay, so now I wanna ask you both to do, maybe this is maybe gonna be the hardest thing you have to do today, which is to dial all the way back to the beginning. So if you were to go back to the beginning of, before there was a drug treatment court in Brown County, you, you started to talk a little bit about you were seeing a lot of recidivism, a lot of sort of repeat customers in terms of folks coming into your court. So can you just tell us a little bit more about what was it about that pattern that caused you to say, there's something else going on here. I bet we need a different intervention besides, you know, I'm just gonna see case after case after case, day after day. How did you get started? So, you know, when, when we began to realize that these folks that we may send to prison, send away for a bit of time or jail, they're coming back into the community, and they're not changing their behavior. Um, and that causes the, the community in, in Brown County and Green Bay concern. You know, Brown County is a very conservative area. It's very homogeneous. And if you ask people, what's the biggest fear you have in the community or what do you expect from the system, the criminal justice system, they will say, I want you to make me safe, right? I want, I want my place to be a safe area. And their perception is these individuals compromise that level of safety. So we had to identify well, what program are we gonna be able to have the community buy into that's gonna address that critical, that critical concern, whether we like it or not, or whether it's true or not, I don't know if that really matters. That's the perception, right? And I don't think that our focus was to change perception. I think the focus was really to change reality. The reality is these people are coming back, and we have to come up with a different way of addressing that. Um, and in order to address that, we ha as, as you know, and as I learned, you've gotta get a tremendous amount of community buy-in. And so the first step was once we decided this is an effective model, we know that from the studies in Dade, in Dade County, we know that from national treatment court studies that the rates of recidivism are substantially lower with treatment court models as opposed to simple incarceration models. Once we realized that and we wanted to make that, that uh, attempt a reality in Brown County, the first thing we needed to do was what I, what I call get not just stakeholders, I mean that, that's important, we needed to get anchors. <laughs> People that not only say, yeah, we'll support you, but we will actively engage the community with you and try to not convince the community, but have the community understand the models that you're used to, that you're comfortable with, that you think are working, aren't the best models. They'll work for a little bit, but it's not gonna solve your problem. We need to have a long-term problem for, I'm sorry, a long-term solution for a fairly significant problem. So the first step is to create anchors to help us secure stakeholders. And I'm going to come back to you on that. That's perfect. 
Director LeGrant McLean, so when I think about the scope of your work and your department's work, um, you know, zeroing in on any one pressing challenge must be really challenging on, on you know, any given day, especially when we're talking about substance use, which is both cause and effect, right, of the challenges that you're dealing with. So can you unpack for us in any of the initiatives that you want to tell us more about, how did, how did you get zeroed in on a particular problem that you were working on solving? I mean, I think like the judge talked about really getting the stakeholders input. So what we did in 2018, um, the city, county heroin, opioid, and cocaine task force was created. You had an alderman from the city, chair it. You had our administrator from Behavioral Health Services, the co-chair. You had state partners. You had people with lived experience on this task force. And they were charged to meet monthly and to really get a pulse of what was happening in Milwaukee County. Why were those overdose numbers going up? Right? What was the increase? What was happening? And then to come back and to provide recommendations. But they wanted to make sure that people with lived experience, their voice were, they were at the table. And I think that's really important when we talk about how do we meet the needs? How do we meet people where they are? And so at every meeting monthly, you would have community input. But there were two specific um, meetings that we had that was just for community. And those um, community sessions involved business partners, educators, nurses, health systems. I mean, there were people, family members. Everyone came out and they attended. And we had those sessions in the evenings, on the weekends, right? And they were well attended. People showed up and they were passionate about, we want to prevent people from dying in our community. That's important, that's the first thing, like the why behind it, why are we here, and now what do we do? And so once those recommendations, we had these meetings, and this is 2009, right, 19, um, 18, right before pandemic hit, right? January of 2019, the recommendations were released. And so with those recommendations, we began to do provider um, uh, engagement, we began to have com more community sessions, uh, Narcan giveaways, like there was so many things that we took from that, and the number one recommendation was housing, hmm. safe and sober housing, number one recommendation. At the time that we released those recommendations in 2019, we had zero houses around that. Today we have 111 houses, uh, uh, beds with 12 houses in Milwaukee County. So taking those recommendations, listening to the community, and that task force was supposed to sunset. So once the recommendations, we heard the community was like, now we're gonna end it. And advocates came and said, no, you have partners from the county, you have partners from the city, you have people with lived experience telling you what we want. And now we wanna make sure, we wanna hold you accountable to make sure that you just didn't put it on paper, but you are, you are acting upon it. And I think that's the piece that we have to make sure, like we're just not putting these things in writing. We're actually doing the work and coming back and reporting back. So now we're meeting quarterly to report out on those recommendations and what we're doing to move that work forward. Fantastic, all right, so pause there. Sorry. No, you're good, you're good. So. Judge Hammer, you were starting to tell us about some of those anchor stakeholders, the anchor partners, and I think in what we heard in the director's answer, you heard some of those you know, kind of right. key participants who were at the table. So what did that look like in Brown County? Well, you know, because my treatment court is currently is the oldest treatment court, you know, that kind of served as a model for us. And the first group of people we wanted to try to gain support from were people that are already naturally interested in this. Um, we don't have to sell them, right? <laughs> they're, 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 they're interested, they're willing to help. And interestingly, in Brown County, there was a number of churches that were involved in uh, helping individuals who were incarcerated with schooling. Uh, they wanted to try to help them with the transition. And they were very receptive to the concept of entering those individuals' lives at a different point. Instead of entering the life when they're in prison and they're ready, getting ready to get out, to perhaps approach them prior to them going into prison and to start looking at viable alternatives that would work in our community. And these folks were fantastic. They uh, do not sit on any of the, of the treatment court teams now, but they were critical in us getting into a community, critical in saying, you know, I think this is a great thing for our community. We're going to help uh, the system identifying these individuals who are of need, supporting this idea in the community. And so they were a really important source of start for us, quite frankly. Um, the next big anchor we needed to get, quite frankly, was law enforcement, right? Law enforcement is a group that people trust, they're comfortable with, they think they are, and they are, <laughs> they think and they are, <laughs> uh, uh, there to, to protect them, to help them. And so the sheriff at that time, when we were beginning our courts, was extremely supportive, right? And there was a number of reasons why he was supportive. And the sheriff, 
you know, believed, look, if you can decrease recidivism, I can save a lot of money in my budget, right? And if you're gonna take some of my problems for me, if you're going to help these people, observe them, maintain them, punish them for behaviors that I don't have to deal with, that's gonna help me out a lot. So there was a little bit of self-serving goal with the sheriff, and we take anything, quite frankly, whether it's self-serving or not. So, the, so law enforcement was a, 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 a critical anchor, and the county board. Uh, we have a county board member here from uh, Green Bay, which I'm happy to see. The county board, um, in, in Brown County, uh, you know, the, the, the county board's motto is, we're not gonna be the first to do something, but if you can show us that it works, we're gonna support you. And you know, I think it's helpful to know the philosophy of your local uh, government before you approach them, right? I mean, Brown County is not gonna be the first to innovate on many things, but if you can show them, look, this is money well spent, and these are the results that we see nationwide, and these are the anchors that we have in our community, you're gonna get some buy-in. Not everybody, but you're gonna get enough buy-in to start to germinate that seed. Mm -hmm. Since we're in a room of, of both practitioners of policy and also students, I wonder if you could just also unpack for us, how did you find out about the work in Dade County and Miami-Dade? And was that the main model that you focused on or was it one of several options? Great question. Um, uh, a number of our judges uh, went, went to a particular judicial education program. Much like lawyers have to go through continuing legal education, judges do have to go through continual, continuing judicial education. And we're always looking for new and innovative topics, right? Um, I, I think that they like to present judges' topics in which the judge is an integral part of a process. Uh, you know, programs that really need that type of community leadership, uh, recognized um, level of understanding as to the impacts of criminal justice and how it works in the community. Um, and so there was a presentation on nationwide treatment courts. And a number of our judges thought, you know, there's some real value to that in our community. I mean, it's not gonna work perfectly and our, and our population is different than the population of Florida, but our problems, some of them are very, very similar. And so we became very interested in that model uh, we secured some information from the National Treatment Court Center uh, that was created after these programs in Dade County seemed to work. And quite frankly, talking with treatment court judges outside of our state and um, reading those materials and then ultimately attending a seminar uh, that the National Treatment Courts funded for us said, come on down, see what we have. It, it gave us the ability to determine, is this the right program for us? I mean, we were fairly, not cautious, but Always the question we had as we began to research and look, is this the right program for us? Is it gonna work in Brown County? And slowly we came to the conclusion with the right stakeholders, it will work for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So back to your stakeholder process for just a second. So sounds like really a great deal of success in bringing community voices of all kinds to a common table, helping to really explore what the problem was and various ways to address it. I'm curious, from the seat you sit in, was that collaborative table, was it given any boundaries at all? So there was a clear problem to solve, right? People are dying and there are too many overdose deaths and other kinds of deaths related to substance use. A million and one you know, root causes that you could have chosen to focus on, that that group could have chosen to focus on. It sounds like you sort of gave them almost a blank sheet of paper and said, tell us what you're seeing and tell us what you're hearing. Is that right? Or how did you try to Absolutely. hem it in at all? Well, because over 50% of the people that attended the sessions and attended our meetings were people with lived experience, who best to tell us what to do, right? Who best to say, let us hear you. If we're telling you we're gonna listen to you, come, then I, I think that it's really important that we say, what is gonna help you to recover? Mm -hmm. What is gonna help you to, so that we can prevent this from happening, right, in, in the community or to anyone else? What is gonna help us to treat you so that you can become your best self in this community? And so, no, we did, we just gave this blanket sheet and there's work, we still doing community engagement. And it, it just last week we had a virtual meeting where 80 people attended and over 200 comments to tell us how we can use the opioid settlement funding. And things that we hadn't thought about but these are people with lived experience to say, hey, what about? And we're like, oh, okay, maybe so. So I think yeah, really being open and being intentional, not just with our words, but our, with our actions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, great. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned earlier that sober housing was lifted up as a top priority and the county has really made some great progress there. So can you tell us just a little bit about so who, who had to help you, you know, get the, that expansion in sober housing off the ground? How did that work? 
Absolutely. So um, Administrator Lappin, our administrator, I mean, he is the expert, if any of you know him. So he's done a lot of the work in behavioral health. Um, it really was an advocate for, we heard people, but really he was really an advocate to say, Oxford Houses, how do we get people connected? How do we make sure that people are in recovery? And he served both men, women, and women with children. Um, and again, like I said, we started with zero houses and then opening up this open enrollment to say, who is who's, what providers are out there who can do this work, right? And then Oxford Houses came in and they've been doing this work for a long, now to have 12 houses in the community and saying, how do we take you out of your normal environment and place you somewhere where you actually actually can recover, where you can heal. And so there was a lot of work with the open enrollment, going out to educate providers, providing technical assistance, making sure we had the funding. And thinking about the funding that we had, Brady, braided funding, state, county, right? There were so many people working together to say, we need to make this happen, so let's do it. And even we just recently had the Wisconsin Policy Forum put out a report in 2022, um, so the Road to Recovery, Improvement Substance Use uh, Disorder in Milwaukee County, and their number one recommendation was, again, around housing, right? And so even with us saying, yay, we went from zero to 111 beds, it's still a need out there, right? And so um, using the opioid settlement funds um, to expand that and to allow more providers to come into this network, um, diverse providers to come into the network and to help our community heal and to help them recover. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So Judge Hammer, you had your model, you had your anchor stakeholders, you did the work of helping people see that this model really could work in Brown County. When it came time to actually stand up a treatment court, does that take new resources? What had to happen to actually get you across the starting line? Um, it, it did take more resources because as we begin to start to plan out what's this thing going to look, we realized that we needed a broader brush of stakeholders to make it work. Not only did we need the county board to buy into it, but we needed the Department of Corrections to buy into it, right? And that's a gigantic bureaucracy that's very structured. And we needed to make sure they were willing to modify some of their policies and procedures so that our folks could coexist with judicial supervision and court supervision and department supervision. So that took a lot of collaboration, right? With one group that's fairly well-defined in terms of what they do and how they do it, what the steps are in the process. And our group, which really kind of needed to be a little bit more innovative, um, a little bit more flexible. Uh, and so that really took sitting down and saying, what are our objectives, right? Decreasing recidivism, increasing safety, getting better results from all of the people that are involved in this system. Um, but I, I, I was listening to what Shakita said, and I think it's interesting. You know, she talked about the target population being involved in developing and implementing policy. That, that does not work with a drug court model, right? Um, folks don't want to hear criminals say, I don't want to go to prison. That, that's not enough. For, so it's interesting because for, for me, that wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I needed a different group of stakeholders to verbalize, this is a really great idea and this is going to help our community and we should get behind this. That doesn't mean the target population isn't important, but what our stakeholders want to see is results. You know, they want us to produce for them individuals who have had a change in their course of life that we will take a little bit of credit for. Can't take much, right? It's not us. But we take a little bit of credit for it. Here's an individual that was, had an extremely significant criminal record and was, by all presumption, heading back, heading back to Dodge, right? This person had a deviation in their life course. They are now working. They're not going to school. They're now raising their own children, right? Uh, they're now driving legally. They're not using illegal drugs. This is what your efforts have done. So for us, the results really aren't at the beginning. They've got to be at the end, and you've got to tell people what happened at the end. Mm -hmm. That doesn't answer your question, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 but that's a good segue to uh, picking what to measure. And right. um, so maybe you could just say a few more words and then we'll go to right. Director LeGrant McLean. But so how did you, did, did you go in knowing what was gonna be important to track and measure? Did you have all the data systems at your disposal with the right analysts? I'm gonna guess maybe not. No. Yeah, <laughs> so how did that work? So. You know, one of the things that we constantly focus on and we really did try to measure, although it's difficult to do so, is our rate of recidivism within the treatment courts, all of them, compared to the rates of recidivism statewide. And our goal was to show some progress, right? I mean, you know, that's what the county board wants to see. That's what the community wants to see. Are you making a difference? And we told them when we try to develop this program, the difference is going to be a lower crime rate. And so what we wanted to see is what happens with our people. 
The problem is it's hard to continue to track those folks, right? Once they complete our program, to be frank, we did not have a, a, as thorough a follow-through on a post-treatment court uh, monitoring program. We've gotten better at that, but that's actually allowed us to develop a mentoring program. Right, and that it, our desire to see what happened. You know, how can we convince people that our 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 success is actually measurable, has actually created an impetus for let's let's help them. Let's continue to work with them and make sure that they're doing what they said they wanted and what the county wants of us. We also tracked um, demographics. You know, we wanted to make sure that we were having a representative uh, group in our community and a and a fair group. So we're interested in how many females versus males do we have. That creates a whole different set of problems, mm -hmm. right? Because female uh, offenders typically have a much different history than male offenders, and we were able to develop programs that were specifically tailored to those things that we see consistently come up with female offenders. We, we were mindful on um, um, race. You know, uh, we have a very large Indian population, Native American population in our county. We do not have a significantly large African American population across the county, but we have a lot of individuals in the criminal justice system that are in that population. And, you know, it, it is important for us to have a team that's responsive to the unique needs that those folks have when they come into our community, right? And so we were mindful of tracking that and how we would address any unique need that, that quite frankly, I'm unaware of, right? So race, gender, um, national origin are things that we're tracking. Recidivism is something important that we're tracking. Um, and we're also are tracking how these folks are doing in relation to their families because so many times individuals that come into drug court really are motivated by, I want my kids. I want to see my kids. I don't want my kids to see me like this. So we are interested in, how are you doing with your kids? What, what's the CHIPS disposition status? What's the GIPS disposition status? And we track that stuff. So to be a little bit of a data geek for a second, so is all of that tracking being done within the Brown County Circuit Court system? Are you partnering with Brown County Human Services? I mean, how, how are you getting all those unique data elements and being able to have some visibility? On some of the courts, we're partnering uh, with uh, Human Services, uh, particularly the Family, Reco Reco Family Recovery Court, Treatment Court, um, and the Youthful Offender Treatment Court, because there's kind of a natural inclination for those folks to participate as, as, as members of the team. For the more traditional courts, uh, drug court, heroin court, uh, and OWI court, we're really trying to keep, not trying, we have been keeping those statistics, I would say, in-house. Normally the judges will look at those statistics, um, law enforcement will look at those statistics, probation will look at those statistics, help us say, where are we at? What, what can we establish that's working versus things that you know aren't working either because they're unrealistic objectives or because we're not devoting enough resource or we don't have the right partners on that team. So that's helpful. Yeah, great, great, great. So Director LeGrant McLean, you talked about, again, this great task force that helped you develop the recommendations and then they were gonna be sunset and they said, no, 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 not so fast. We wanna be your measurement partner, your accountability partner. So can you talk to us about, I mean, you've talked a little bit about the numbers of units of sober housing that have been developed, but what else are you measuring? What else is the, the team measuring? And then how does that accountability with the community work? Yeah, I think really focusing on harm reduction. Um, there's gonna be, um, we're gonna have some vending machines in the next couple of weeks really looking at that and how do we get um, those things in the community, get people connected. We also partner with the Community uh, Reintegration Center, which is formerly our House of Correction, um, and we implemented the Medication Assistant Treatment Program. Now that was started by the state, so again, when I go back to braided funding, mm -hmm. state helped us to fund that, but then we're gonna be using a lot of the opioid settlement funds to expand that, so that we're just not serving people while they're in custody, but then when they're released, we have a housing navigator connected to them, and then that program is expanded, so it follows them into the community and helps them continue with that treatment and so um, just different programs like that that we've implemented since the beginning of that or since that task force and recommendation we go back we report out and, and saying is this actually having an impact I think sometimes we kind of uh, report out uh, this is the number of people we serve like if I think about our community access to recovery services our cars program right every year we're serving almost 10,000 people and that's great it's like yeah 10,000 people but what is the impact and that's the more outcome. what are the outcomes right and so um, we really are looking at how do we collect more data and, and one of the things that the Wisconsin Policy Forum report points out as a barrier for us is that you know there needs to be um, like this gatekeeper um, this coordinated entry mm -hmm. similar to what we have in our house 
housing program. Um, and so we're working on what does that look like for behavioral health services because we have so many providers, right? And it's really hard to keep track of truly what the impact or the outcome are when you're, you re do the referral to different provider agencies. And so how do we have like this coordinated entry um, in this system where we can really say, this is the number of people we serve, looking at recidivism for a uh, community reintegration center, looking at how many people reducing uh, overdose deaths. Like those are the things that we really want to make sure that when we, we are reporting out, we can say, we are not breaking the records because we have the highest number, but we are breaking the numbers because we are reducing the number. And so that's gonna be re really important. I think because of the pandemic and us, the stay at home order, right, there's been some time in between that we haven't really seen the work, but I'm hoping, I'm really hopeful that the next year or two, you're really gonna see the outcomes of the work that we have implemented and expanded with the funding that we have received. That's great. And so it sounds like you have maybe a kind of regular process of checking back in with that task meeting force. Meeting quarterly yeah. with them. Yeah. yeah, so meeting quarterly with them and then letting them know what we are working on, the providers we're working on, if we added any new programs, what we are expanding, what we are doing with the opioid settlement funds. Again, um, I, we had two virtual sessions for communities, so we put that out there. They shared that, making sure that people were there reporting back out what we heard. I think that's gonna be really important. So we just had our second session. We wanna have one more in-person session. And then we're gonna take some of that funding and we're gonna do some re-granting back into the community. So we heard you, not just, right? You came to the session, we heard you. Here are the themes. Now we wanna re-grant and put it back into the community because you are in the, you're doing the work. It's the grassroots who are out there doing the work. Um, and so having them actually lift up some of those ideas that they put forward. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about how the work has kind of evolved. And Judge Hammer, I know for you, you've told us a little bit about you started with this initial treatment court. And as I read in the introduction, now you've got a number of other, we'll call them maybe su successor courts. So can you, can you tell us how that happened? And I know you have some thoughts about, about this approach. Well, the first court was our treatment court. And, you know, fortunately, quite frankly, we were able to be successful and share our success. You know, it's great for all of us to look around and say, hey, this is working really great, but the trick is to share it uh, so that the community sees your dollars were well spent, we've accomplished the objectives, and you are better off in the community. These folks are better off and you are better off, right? Um, and I think that uh, people were began to get res were responsive to that. Uh, then they wanted us to address more specific populations one of the concerns that we had in Brown County is the rate of at least short-term uh, jail or short-term restrictions on those individuals who have mental health needs, right? Um, certainly we have some resources in the county to address that, but what we have seen is when we look at the jail population and they tell us a lot of these folks need significant mental health treatment and that's not what the jail is for, right? We can medicate them uh, if there's a doctor's requirement or a court order, but we're not a mental health facility, we're a jail. And this is really not the best place for these folks, right? And so there was a push by uh, the sheriff, um, by the county board to take a look at that population and determine are these folks better served, and as a result, the community better served, by having these people out in the community. If the goal is to maintain a, a medication regimen and that they, confine, they, they maintain the expectations of the community, maybe a treatment court model would be better than a jail model. And so they asked us to begin to explore a uh, mental health treatment court. And there were some mental health treatment courts in the country. We began to do some research. We put together a different group of stakeholders, right, that had more mental health programming, mental health outreach on that team. Um, and we were able to pull those folks out of the confined setting, out of the jail, uh, and back into the community with some very different type of monitoring, right? And the goals of those courts are very, very different. Um, the goal is for those folks to continue to, to, uh, to maintain their protocol that's been prescribed for them and to develop a healthy routine, right? That, so they themselves can begin the process of maintaining their own care. And that's worked. Um, we, as, as you all know, the, began to develop uh, a heroin crisis, uh, at least in Brown County. Um, and uh, it was acute and it was frightening to the members of our community because what we were noticing is that population tended to be much younger. They tended to not have significant criminal records, not a history of criminality. Um, that drug is an incredibly addicting, incredibly powerful drug that has incredibly disastrous effects for individuals in our community. So for that court, they wanted an immediate, focused, acute attention to community response for that particular addiction. 
and we developed a heroin court. Um, it's a totally different population. Um, the goals are much more short term, right? Um, and so I, th the short answer is when we're able to identify a problem that we think is better served in the community, the community approaches individuals that have had some level of success, some level of uh, recognized community um, support, maybe some respect, to talk about can we develop enough stakeholders to address that in the community. That's really what we're trying to do. Yeah, got it. Thank you. So, Director legrant McLean, when you think about, you've touched on the, the various sources of funding that are now coming in, right, the opioid settlements and other kinds of resources that are available. Are you feeling like this, the basic process that you've described, the task force, the uh, listening to voices of, of people with lived experience, is that what's going to continue to help Milwaukee County decide where to go next? Or how else are you going to sort of pick as you think about what to expand and what maybe to sunset across all the initiatives that you've been discussing? Absolutely. So the city county task force is really what has been driving the work that we have been doing. Um, and then the Wisconsin Policy Forum report that was just released in 2022 to helped us to say, are we doing this well? Where are there opportunities for us to improve or to expand or to stop or to start? Um, and I, so right now with the opioid settlement um, that has come to Milwaukee County, we have about seven projects. And one of those projects was, again, to do the regrant into the community. It was to say, we want to hear from you. What are the providers out there? What can you offer? And how do we get this into the hands of the people who are doing the work? And so that is going to be what we do and how we do it. And making sure that we report back out, right, to say these are the outcomes, right? This is how we're having an impact. And the goal, I mean, I think the goal for all of us is to see that number of deaths. We number of overdose deaths in Milwaukee County in more than two decades in 2021. And that's heartbreaking, right? But if you think about um, that's right after the pandemic, well, in the midst of the pandemic, people were isolated. They didn't know how to cope, right? We created a um, funding from the state as well and uh, expanding that with opioid settlement funds. We created a Better Ways to Cope pro program that focuses on prevention and awareness. And we have this uh, workshop that runs an hour and we do this regularly where we're bringing the community partners, providers together for an hour and saying, how are you coping? And we show demonstrations of how to use the fentanyl strips or Narcan or you know, the medication uh, lock bags. So all of those things happen. Um, then we have people to come and to talk to them right, and give them tips and tools to say, how are you coping? We also do the minute of mental health, right? 60 seconds just to stop and to take care of your mental health. Because many times when people are using a substance use, right, they are, um, it's because they are struggling with, with whatever is happening in their life. And so how do we show up for them? How do we help them get connected to resources? How do we help them build relationships? We have a number of peer supports in our community, right? People with lived experience who can help them through this process to help them get to that recovery stage. And so I think it's really gonna be really important over the next couple of years to say, we cannot do this alone. Mm -hmm. The vision of Department of Health and Human Services is together we create healthy co um, communities. Mm -hmm. That means not just me. That means it takes the city, it takes the state, it takes providers, it takes the community community to come together. It's, this is not the time for us to say, we want to take the credit for all this amazing work. Mm -hmm. It is the time for us all to say, we, the collective, we have prevented a death. Mm -hmm. We have helped people get connected to treatment. We have prevented the number of deaths that we have seen. We need to make sure we decrease that number. Mm -hmm. That is the goal. The ultimate goal is not to say the county led that effort. And that's why when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about a partnership because I can talk about all that. I have a list of things that we do with behavioral health services and the work that we do and all the people we serve, but it's not about us. And the impact won't come if I just talk about DHHS. It comes when we talk about we as a collective and how do we do this work across the state. Yeah, no, I appreciate you calling that out though, because that's, that's not a leadership skill everyone has. So kudos to you for, for embracing that, that approach. So before we open things up to our audience, who I know are going to have some more questions, so this is amazing work that you both have shared, really transformational, no doubt saving lives. Um, you have appropriately you know, emphasized the positive, and I want to ask you just to think for a second about, I bet it hasn't all been smooth sailing. And so <laughs> given that you're, it's a safe space, right? You're in a room of folks who, who want, to, want to support you and also want help solving their own implementation challenges. 
So could you think about something that maybe was a particularly tough obstacle to overcome, whether it was a stakeholder who you really needed who just wouldn't show up, or a model that you thought was going to work that didn't, or difficulty getting the data, or something more interesting than any of those? So what, <laughs> what, what has gotten in your way, but you've been able to overcome it? Um, you know, I, and I, I don't mean to pick on the Department of Corrections. I really don't, because they're... <laughs> Again, safe space. That's why we're here. Can't solve a problem we don't name. Um, okay. Because they're a critical stakeholder, and they offer all of our treatment courts a tremendous, tremendous amount of resources that are costly and are limited. Um, but their goal is different than our goal, right? Uh, their goal is uh, set up to comply with the court's order and to maintain a very specific uh, level of conduct. And you know, the reality is in treatment courts, we're going to experience some failure. <laughs> and individuals who are transitioning don't you know, drop everything when they start our treatment court. There are some bad habits that are hard to break. And we've had, I wouldn't say challenges, but some discussions uh, about you know, the department creating an unusual degree, what they would call an unusual degree of flexibility in, with treatment court participants. And the argument is, look, you've signed a memorandum of understanding to join this treatment court. We need you, we want you, and you agree with the goals of this court. If we don't try to address particular issues, then there's no purpose for this court. This is just an extension of the department, right? If we're gonna tell these people, trust us, we, you have told us you want to change your, your life course. You want to leave the, the crime-free lifestyle, the crime lifestyle and the drug lifestyle you've had in the past. You want to make a change. We can help you doing that. We can help you to do that. If we don't give them the resources or the flexibility or the, uh, uh, the modification of the policies that you typically honor, we're just, the, we're just the department with a judge sitting here instead of the administrator. And so trying to convince people You've committed to something that's different, right? We're not asking you to go way outside your comfort zone, but we're asking you to do something different than you're typically used to doing. That's important, and, and that sale, quite frankly, has worked. You know, If we aren't going to provide this type of service, this type of response, then what are we doing here, right? Are we, we're just an extension of where we all individually have come from, and that's not why we joined the team, and that's not what you signed up for, and I don't want to give you something you didn't sign up for. So convincing people this is new and different and they're gonna to have to be more flexible from where they came to make this work has, has been helpful. Not always, but it's been helpful. Mm -hmm. And so would I be right in thinking that you've been able to make good use of your data as well to help make that case, right? So the goal is not 100% you know, perfection. Right. The goal is better than right. it has been. Absolutely, the goal is, yeah. and that was very hard for me to get used to, mm -hmm. right? You know, we'd have someone come in with a bad test. Oh my God, they had a bad test, yes, yeah. Judge. They had a bad test today, and they may have a bad test next week, right? And that was very difficult for me to get used to because I'm used to, you know, down at the courthouse, not at home. When I tell somebody to do something. We've all been there. They do it. And for someone to say, no, and, and, and me be responsible for that person, right? Me, me that has told the county board and told the community, don't worry, this person isn't going to engage in this conduct. And for them to do that was very difficult for me to get used to. You know, treatment courts teach a lot of people a lot of things. Taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. Taught me a lot. Made, made me a better judge, quite frankly. It did. It made me a better judge. That's great. Director LeGrant McLean, how about for you? What, what has been maybe less than smooth sailing? How have you managed to persevere in these last couple of years with this work? Oh, what do I start? <laughs> Pick whatever you want. So I think there is some assistance that's needed when we talk about, like, zoning rules um, and that not in my backyard when it comes to safe and sober housing. Many people don't know that Oxford Housing, um, they are uh, protected by the Fair Housing Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so even though we get a lot of complaints, we have had people complain and, and say, no, this house cannot be in my neighborhood. Um, and being able to push back against that, like every person deserves a safe place, mm -hmm. especially around recovery. And I think just that, um, just seeing the, the comments, hearing the comments, um, and needing to advocate for all people, mm -hmm. um, that if we want to see a change in our community, that takes the community as a whole. 
no matter where that is. And so I think just that has really been a barrier as we even think about expanding houses because there are people who are interested, but you'll have this no or there's all these complaints, right? We don't want these people in my neighborhood. And I think just um, really trying to wrap our heads around how do we continue to advocate um, and to get people on board to say everyone deserves a safe place. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Okay, your turn. So if you have questions you'd like to ask our amazing panelists, if you have maybe an anecdote you'd like to share, go ahead and raise your hand. And we've got a couple of students with microphones. Did they both end up on the same side of the room? No. All right, we'll go to the right side, my right side, and then my left side over here. Excellent, thank you. Uh, this question, uh, Judge Hammer, Brent Plish from UW-Madison Police Department, uh, Assistant Chief. Uh, we really appreciate and, and use our community restorative courts, drug courts, uh, and other diversion programs, but I'm curious if you've been able to partner, um, you know, the work that, that diversion and, and restoration does is harm reduction. But if you look at OWI, for example, some of the most dangerous drivers on the road are 16 to 31-year-old men who have no contact previously with law enforcement, no previous arrests yet they're killing more people on the roads than anyone. So is there anything that you've been able to take from the work that you're doing and connect with people to work on prevention so that you're seeing less people, those the you know, less first-time offenders coming through? Good question, wow. Um, at least in, in drug court, um, you know, when we have a success, you know, this person just wasn't, wasn't dropped on uh, in Brown County. I mean, they have family, they have friends, they have associates, they have work colleagues. And what these people see is, hey, you're showing up to work today, and you don't look stoned today, and you've actually given us a full day of work today, and you're going to a home today instead of the homeless shelter. So one success kind of breeds awareness and confidence in our system. That's positive. But you know, your population is a difficult population. Uh, the OWI first, second, with tragic consequences. You know, our OWI court typically deals with individuals any, that range anywhere from OWI third to maybe OWI fourth. It's a fairly narrow band of folks uh, who have developed a dangerous pattern of drinking and driving. The supervision for those folks tends to be, quite frankly, a little bit tighter because the community is very, very worried about their decisions because it impacts, as you know, it impacts so many others so quickly. In my drug court, if I have someone that uses a drug, typically they're only gonna affect themselves, but not in the OWI court. So it is a totally different type of monitoring. It's a much more immediate follow-up. And our, that, that judge's ability to be more flexible, quite frankly, has decreased because the risk is, is so much greater. In terms of diversion, we certainly have a diversion program in Brown County. I don't, to be frank, I don't know how much diversion we're using the OWI court, uh, OWI issues for, but we are using diversion uh, much more for our younger population because we think we can make a difference with the younger population. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. All right, we have a question in the back here. Keep your hands up and we'll get the mic to you. Oh, yeah, thank you for being here. My name is Troy Wosa and I'm a first year MPA student. Um, so I was just wondering with regard to like funding. So obviously the WIS DOJ has um, procured like opioid settlement funds which are being used um, somewhere around like 400 million. I don't know if I'm wrong or not. Um, I know, so I was, it may be more or less now, um, but I was wondering is, um, I'm really interested in like fiscal federalism, so the role of the federal government as well with regard to the state government, um, and I was just wondering, is there like any like, have you got, is there ever any funding opportunities where the Fed, so like for the US DOJ is then sending money to WIS DOJ and then that can be used, or um, for example, maybe like HHS giving money to DHS, mm -hmm. um, so basically uh, aid or to expand like uh, drug treatment programs. Thank you. Do you want to talk a little bit about the role, any federal resources that come directly to the county potentially? So yes and yes to your other questions. But yeah, just wondering how that looks. I'm trying to think of all the federal dollars that we have. I know we have federal dollars. We get a number of state dollars that are sometimes passed through the state that comes to the county. Um, and then a number, I know we have a number of ARPA funds, the opioid settlement funds. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, yeah. So there's a number of different funding sources that we do receive from. And do you, uh, have you, 
experienced some challenges, I'm sure you have, with finding ways to braid that funding? So you talked about, you know, really using braided funding because you have to, I think right? that's really, well, that has been really difficult, uh -huh. right? Because we don't want to duplicate efforts. We don't want to double dip. So yeah. um, just our staff, they are amazing, right? So being able to look at the criteria for federal funds versus state funds, right, and making sure that um, we are billing in the correct, uh, you know, the correct uh, area. And so, um, yes, we're just really looking at the criteria for each of those those funding streams and making sure that when we break funding, we know what's allowable and what's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. If you could wave your magic wand, what, what do you need those government funders to be doing differently, just sort of high level? It, I think to be more flexible, I mean, if you think about alcohol, right, I mean, we have um, the TANF fund, so there's a number of funds that are available, but then now Medi Medicaid pays for a number of the residential treatment things, so that frees up some of our money, but then there's these rules that say you can't use it for this specific group, right? It can be for women and children, but then there's so many men who are dealing with substance use or alcohol, so I think just being more, being able to be more flexible when we see that there is a need. If there is a gap to say, okay, you have this funding instead of it going unspent, right? Because sometimes you have that funding that's unspent and then people say, you're not doing your due diligence or you're not spending this money. And it's not because we don't want to. It could be because, right, it's now covered under Medicaid and now we are unable to spend it on the population that needs it the most. Yeah, yeah. yeah. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about for funding streams that are coming in to support your work? All county? All Mostly county okay. dollars. Yeah. Um, the county board, you know, again, has been incredibly supportive. They, they uh, I think recognize the results that, we're, that all the treatment courts are getting. I think they buy into this concept. You know, if we keep folks out in the community, we simply do not have to expend the, uh, the cost in keeping them in the county jail. We're cert we always certainly look for alternative funding. And I know that we've been talking about housing. Housing is a, is a problem, as I think all of us can recognize. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a critical uh, problem for our treatment courts, right? Um, you know, these people don't have houses yeah. because they've been living in jail. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to put them back to live with uh, the individuals who they associated with in the past. That, that, that's a no-go for us. So housing is important. We have some transitional housing in, in Brown County, but it is probably for all of the treatment courts the most significant uh, short-term and long-term problem. You would find it humorous when the judges fight with each other about who's going to use the treatment court apartments. I've actually had my kids go over there and squat so that I can get my people in there instead of... <laughs> Um, our housing is somewhat limited. The chair and the parking place. That's it. Only I'll pay you 20 bucks. Stay in that house until I come and get you. Stay in that house until I come and get you. No one's calling the office of lawyer regulation, I promise. <laughs> All right, so let me go right in front of me here. If you can just wait one second, we'll get the microphone to you and let's, we'll pick up both people at this table and then we'll go over there. Thank you. Hi, I'm here for from the Department of Corrections, but my question is not for Judge Hammer. Uh -oh. You told me they weren't going to be here. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> it's actually for the director. Um, so I'm working with a team of our leadership and staff at our one of our Milwaukee facilities, uh, Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility, on a medication-assisted treatment uh, program. And so we've learned a ton about the implementation of the uh, program at the CRC. So I was just curious in terms of implementation and what we would recommend, what are some ways that we can collaborate um, with maybe the opioid task force, or you mentioned the housing navigators, um, how best can we collaborate? I would say um, get my card after this and let's connect you with the team. No, really, I think that we should connect and just make sure that um, the team that is currently at the CRC, that we're able to make sure that you have all the things that you need. We were able to partner, we got um, a grant um, for the housing navigators. So it's through our housing services area and now they're located at CRC. And so, you know, just figuring out when we talk about, again, that no wrong door, how do we make sure that we are connecting the services? And even if it's a part-time position and getting people connected. And the issue is that there's not always uh, enough houses available, but I think just having those conversations with the people before they are released into the community. So let's connect and uh, figure out how we can discuss that. Perfect. There you go. That's how it works. And then we had another question at the same table. Hi, uh, I'm a first year student at the um, NPP program, which is the neuroscience training program and at the La Follette program. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to bring in the conversation of criminalization, criminalization of drugs in the respect to race and drug treatment. So I don't think it's new news that um, 
people of color are disproportionately affected in punitive punishments. Um, and there's an argument that in respects to the opioid epidemic, the reason why we're shifting to a less punitive um, standpoint is because the how the white population is affected by it. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering, uh, in terms of drug treatment, I feel like criminalization of drugs do impact how we treat people with substance use disorders. So have you guys had the conversation of decriminalization or how to move in that direction? Yeah, maybe Judge Hammer, for you, a way to think about that might be, um, so knowing that you, you identified the successful models that you're using through some judicial education, what is the conversation at that same judicial education table about you know, the role of of particular policy choices and what we criminalize and what we don't and how that has racially disparate impacts. Right, I, I do think there's a disproportionate impact and I must tell you, you know, it's somewhat disheartening when we look at who's admitted into the drug court team because some of it, the decision is made not by the team but by the participant. You know, it's a challenging program. Nobody has to go into that program. They have choices and options. Um, and I, I think that, you know, I do think there's a disproportionate minority contact in our criminal justice system in Brown County to come up and watch a, a, a criminal calendar, in my, in my court at least. Um, but I think uh, we have not seen the same participation in our treatment court models than we see in individuals that are coming into our court for, crimin for criminal behavior, and that's concerning, and I don't know why that's the case why a minority population is not as willing or perhaps as interested to engage in these alternate treatment court models. I don't know why that's the case. Um, you know, um, I, I would like to increase that population. And maybe there's something about our treatment model that, that, that is missing uh, a motivating factor that would encourage those folks to give us a try, right, to give us a try. Um, but I would agree with you. I, I don't know, I, I haven't seen any statistics that talk about you know, the impact of criminalizing opioid use having a, a, an impact in terms of my, a majority or minority proportionate contact. I don't know that. Uh, but it'd be interesting for us to figure that out. Director LeGrant McLean, with the focus on opioids and all the settlement resources, how does that conversation happen in Milwaukee? Do you have do you have community leaders saying, hey, you know, the thing we really need to be working on is something that's over here, or do you feel like there's pretty good broad-based support across leaders of different, you know, racial and ethnic backgrounds? Well, if you think about Milwaukee County, right, again, uh, minorities, they are um, impacted. There's disparities there. Um, and which is the reason why we changed our House of Corrections to be the Community Reintegration Center. Mm -hmm. It is how you speak, right? And those people are now considered residents. Um, it is how you speak. And now we are getting them connected to housing. It is how you speak, right? And, and making sure that they are connected. And there's a lot of advocates around um, how do we uh, destigmatize when you talk about opioid and substance uh, use disorder. And thinking about the social determinants of health, right? And I always tell my staff, do not um, take it personal when people don't want to receive services from a government agency. There are systemic barriers and things that have happened right before us that we did not create. There are things that we still have to do, we're mandated to do, but that does not stop us from advocating to do the right thing mm -hmm. and working towards treating people with dignity and respect. And if we feel like there are policies or rules that are in place that are causing disp these disparities, mm -hmm. it is our job to continue to advocate and to fight for those people, right? And when we talk about social determinants of health, why, are not, why people are not receiving our services, I always say we could have caused that trauma. We could have been the wrong door. And so how do we now make that door when they come into our, we have a detention center, youth detention center, and I always say when those youth walk through our door, how do we make that become the right door? That we then begin to think about the upstream investment so that when they go back into the community, we are giving them the tools and the resources to ensure they don't end back up into the adult system. And that work does not happen overnight. Changing rules and policies does not happen overnight. But what it means is that every single day, you wake up with intention. You wake up and you say, I am going to do the right thing the best way I can, right? And there's gonna be barriers, there are gonna be some hard days, there are gonna be days that say, I cannot believe we are doing it this way. Well, I cannot believe, right, <laughs> that this is happening. But you continue to fight for it mm -hmm. and advocate for it. Mm -hmm. You bet, you bet. 
other questions? Back here, I just need to get you a mic. Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Javon Demi, and I am the owner and founder of Pierre Outreach Services Safe Home. Safe. Home. Safe. And first, I want to tell you, because um, I, I can't see your name, so can you give me your name? The black girl up there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Shakita? Shakita. Yes. I just want to just thank you. You are such a refreshing air for somebody like me. <laughs> yeah, girl. You don't understand. Okay, so my first question is, being that I am the owner and founder of Peer Outreach Services, I am a Chicago girl, okay? I don't, I've been writing grants. Um, I'm new to this world, I'm new to this field and bringing money in. And I don't know what, okay, so I'll say this. Somebody important called me in their office and told me about using the word trauma when you're talking about black community. And I am an expert of trauma in the black community. So I don't know no other way to explain the conditions and the behavior health that's attached to black kids, especially black girls who become black mothers, okay? This young lady told me that Wisconsin, um, you guys have a trouble with using the word trauma. Is that true? That's my first question. <laughs> Well, we, we try to do trauma-informed care. We talk a lot about trauma-informed care, and I think it really is important. Um, if we talk about trauma-informed care, it really is those adverse childhood experiences that we have. I almost have all of them checked off. So in the eyes of people who study trauma-informed care, I was counted out a long time ago, right? And so being able to address when people have experienced trauma and how do we um, meet them where they are and get them connected to services, there's a brief story. How much time do we have? There's the 90 more seconds. Oh, I don't have time. Let's talk. I mean, let's talk. Let's talk to one each other because I, I think that sometimes people just use trauma the wrong way, right? We think we say trauma, we say crisis. I say if a child just seen their parent or a friend or someone get shot or they were shot themselves, we didn't have an increased number of children that are, have been entering our detention with gunshot wounds. We have not seen this many. I mean, this is just this past week, I was just like, oh my. We need to be going and talking to them to talk about the trauma that they are experiencing. How do we help them heal? How do we help them heal from that? I think that's really important. So I'd like to talk about trauma, but we also need to pair that with healing. Yeah. yeah thank you. All right, any other quick last questions before, oh, one last one. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was going to ask a question uh, of the judge. Uh, you mentioned the problem in the Brown County Jail where there's people uh, whose needs are probably more uh, mental. They need more mental health services rather than being in a correctional facility like the county jail. I understand the same thing is true on a larger scale uh, here in town with the Dane County Jail, and I think it's probably true with most county jails nationwide. My concern is what alternatives are available for people that need actually mental health services given the relatively uh, limited number of spots there are in public mental health facilities, and that would be particularly true at the uh, local level. So, I mean, what are the alternatives for the people that are in these county jails but uh, really don't belong there, in fact? Thanks. That's exactly the, the argument that we made to get the mental health treatment court up and running, right? There's not enough resources. Yeah. Uh, we're willing, the, 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 the court system is willing to invest as much resource as we can in the ways that we can to keep those folks out of jail knowing that there is no place in Brown County for them. We need to help them remain in the community and remain mentally healthy enough that they can survive. It's great to say we'll put them in the community, mm. but it's gotta be more than that. It's gotta be more than here's some pills, take these pills. We gotta help them learn to survive, right? And survival's a, you know, uh, for in some individuals that have some type of mental illnesses, that's a real challenge, right? So you're, you're singing our book in terms of saying, this is why you need a mental health court, because it, 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 it spans the gap between where, where, what do we do with these folks? How can we help them survive? So we are out of time. I want to ask you all to join me in giving a huge thank you to Judge Mark Hammer, Shakita LeGrant McLean.
Thank you both for your work and for your generosity with your time and your insights Thank today. You. Thank you. Thank really you very much. So time for a break, and you're back here at 2 o'clock unless someone waves at me and tells me that's wrong. So enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much.
Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back. This is your two-minute warning. We'll be getting started with our last panel of the day on COVID-19 and responses, what we learned from around the state. So just a couple of minutes. All right, why don't we get started? Well, welcome back from your break. Uh, I'm David Haynes, I'm the retired Ideas Lab editor at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, and I am very excited to be moderating this next panel. Now, it's a topic that we know a lot about, unfortunately, COVID-19 and the response to the pandemic. The last three years, in many ways, have been very tough. But I'm joined today by three panelists who were on the front lines trying to ensure that our communities were safe and informed while we battled this new virus called COVID-19. They pivoted, they collaborated, collaborated, they innovated, sometimes they threw out the playbook and wrote a brand new playbook as the world changed around us. Today we're going to focus on what worked, on what went well, and on what built trust with communities, even among communities of people who weren't often bound to trust local government. So I'd like to introduce our panel. I'm going to start with Liska Giese. Liska has served as the Director Health Officer of the Eau Claire County and City Health Department for 10 years. She has worked for the past 30 years in a variety of public health roles in Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Minnesota, including for the Wisconsin Division of Public Health and the City of Milwaukee Health Department. Liska also currently serves on the Governor's Public Health Council and on the Medical College of Wisconsin Consortium Board, as well as being the co-chair of the Joint Wisconsin Public Health Association, Wisconsin Association of Local Health Departments and Boards Policy and Advocacy Committee. Lisa Summers has served the United Nation government in various roles since 2002 and is drawing on more than 20 years of experience in her current role as the area manager of the Oneidas Nations Business Committee. One of Lisa's most prominent roles was as the Oneida Nations elected secretary from 2014 to 2020. During her tenure, she was a strong advocate for the use of good governance practices um, in government decision making and was a co-sponsor and project champion for the successful amendments in the Oneida Nations Constitution, as well as implementation of the Oneida's judicial branch of government. Lisa also serves her community as a guardian ad litem, a role she's been active in since 2012. Dr. Diamond D. Williams is outreach program manager for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services COVID-19 response and recovery team. In that role, she administers one of the largest statewide COVID-19 vaccination health equity grants with more than $30 million invested in communities across all of Wisconsin's 72 counties. Dr. Williams has managed more than $340 million in grants and organizational budgets. A native of Milwaukee, Dr. Williams is an alumna of Howard University in Washington, DC, Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, and Walden University in Minneapolis. So just a housekeeping note, we're going to uh, give each of our panelists five, six, seven minutes or so to talk about some learnings from the pandemic. Um, then we'll take 25 minutes or so of discussion among the four of us. And finally, we'll go to audience questions around 10 of three. So let's get started with Dr. Williams. Is this on? Yes. Hello, beautiful people. Good afternoon. So bear with me because I am going to discuss two years worth of very important work in seven minutes. So I have brought my notes to make sure that I uh, can cover as much as I can. So before we get into 
what we did, would just like to first tell you who we are and what this whole COVID-19 response and recovery team was about. And this is just a quick overview. So the state of Wisconsin COVID-19 response and recovery team, affectionately known as the CRRT, is a multidisciplinary uh, team that is just super dynamic, working at the forefront of uh, helping to keep Wisconsinites safe, healthy, uh, and informed. So the CRRT was originally composed of six areas, so contact tracing, testing, vaccination, data analytics, uh, outreach, which I have the pleasure of serving, uh, as well as communications. So this this is what I just explained, and then this is the area in which, again, I have the pleasure and honor of serving. So the outreach team really works to minimize uh, harm and reduce risk while leading with equ equity in considering the social determinants of health using a three-tier education model. This includes universal programming, targeted intervention, and individualized support. So a huge part of this was done primarily through stakeholder engagement, as well as community-based organization grants that were allocated and distributed uh, amongst 185-ish grantees throughout the state of Wisconsin. So before we can get into the work, what was done, it's important to really detail what we saw happening in our great state of Wisconsin. So data revealed disparities in COVID-19 outcomes, uh, and we saw this through hospitalizations, cases, death rates, and then again, racial ethnic breakdown. We also saw low vaccine uptake in select communities and specific subgroups. So communities of color, rural areas, individuals facing barriers to accessing medical care, as well as those with mistrust of government, the medical community, and vaccines. So we then saw an opportunity to really engage our community-based organizations and our trusted messengers. Uh, we wanted to really equip them with the tools, language, and resources to be successful in their communities, especially uh, as it related to administering the COVID-19 vaccines, and then building a model of connections and networks long-term internally with the Department of Health Services, the state, and externally. So what we did, well, we developed, supported, and advocated for a lot of things. So we developed three grant programs. Uh, one was the Vaccination Community Outreach Grant, in which we had two iterations of that, VCO 1.0 and VCO 2.0, as well as the Moving Forward Together Grant Program. And all of these grant programs had one mission, and that mission was really to address the concerns and barriers related to uh, promoting acceptance of and access to the COVID-19 vaccines, especially among historically sidelined and underserved communities. We supported community-based organizations and activated the trusted messengers, both traditional and non-traditional. And I just wanna highlight that, both traditional and non-traditional. So we've worked with your local tribal health departments, we've worked with uh, assisted living facilities, we've worked with uh, organizations that served um, recently uh, incarcerated individuals. We just worked with a number of youth and family organizations. We work with churches, right? So this whole um, continuum of people that we look to as trusted messengers in the community. And lastly, we advocated for these trusted messengers to share accurate and timely information with the communities and the populations they serve. So by this, we equip grantees with educational materials and public health resources. And as a result, we created, collaborated, contri contributed, and elevated. So as you can see, I like a lot of ED words. Um, uh, and we really wanted to do this while still supporting the mission of the Department of Health Services. And again, that is making sure that we are protecting and promoting the health and safety of people in Wisconsin so that they can live their best lives. So we did this by creating a three-tiered model of engagement, 
So we created universal programming. We collaborated with subject matter experts other than just ourselves as a state entity. We contributed to the set of our grantees through a virtual open house and a number of other um, activ uh, activities and engagement opportunities for our grantees. And then we elevated collective knowledge of COVID-19 and incubated relationships with partners and encouraged the cultivation of grantee peer connectedness. Now let's get into the nitty gritty and talk about three illustrations of what worked. So first, we knew and we saw that trusted messengers were a super powerful communication agent. For example, uh, 100 Black Men, uh, which is located here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, we saw just a lot of success in their educational sessions. They were able to reach over 2,900 people in the Madison area, and they also did this by targeting with Walmart. Multicultural Coalition Incorporated, this uh, coalition was actually birthed as a result of a global pandemic. So we just saw how all of these partners listed above um, from Casa Hispana to Northeast Wisconsin Hmong Professionals, Pointers Community Initiatives, People of Progression and Partnership Community Health Center all work together to just be beacons of hope and light in their communities um, in which they serve. We also saw that effective two-way communication supported the collaboration and built trust within the government. So for example, PATCH, which also stands for Providers and Teens Communicating Health, uh, they had a need where they reached out to us at DHS and said, hey, can you help us find a subject matter expert who can come talk to our youth ambassadors uh, so that they can train their peers about COVID-19 and the vaccines. Of course, we, we said yes, and we looked to our other grantees, so their fellow grantees, to say, hey, is there anyone with expertise working with teens who can also speak to promoting the acceptance of vaccines? Uh, so that worked well, and then we also solicited someone from our very own department to speak to the teens about the technical aspects and the scientific aspects of, of, of the COVID-19 vaccines, excuse me. And last but not least, what worked? Well, we saw that everyone can make an impact, not just those working in public health. So for example, uh, we knew that there was a very low or non-existent uh, uh, vaccination rate for children under the age of four in Florence, Pepin, and Taylor counties. So uh, this was really an example of intra and interagency collaboration where local stakeholders, including Marshfield Area YMCA, Black and Brown Women Coalition, and Wisconsin Council of Churches really worked together to provide the best practices uh, for the uh, efforts in these uh, counties. And then lastly, Empower, which is located in Milwaukee, is just a trio of dynamic individuals who were also grantees, but get this, they provided technical assistance to other grantees so that the grantees could focus on their vaccination pro projects and not have to worry about marketing dollars, right? So how are we gonna find the money to make a flyer about getting vaccinated at a local um, clinic or health department? So again, this was just a collaboration um, amongst grantees. And so our grantees did some great work and now I'm happy to share some of those outcomes. So we've seen over 13,000 vaccination events over 550,000 vaccinations administered, over 42,000 education and outreach events that occurred with uh, reaching over 482,000 people. We also saw 44,000 social media advertisements approximately 17 million cumulative impressions. And then we saw over 11.4 million paid media advertisements with reaching 55 million in terms of cumulative impressions. So again, we could not do this at the state alone. 
Um, so I just want to highlight that because it's very important that we just bring others to the table and allow them to uh, have a voice at that table. And I'll talk about that in the last minute or two that I have left. So again, these numbers just represent what can happen when we are collaborative, intentional, and inclusive with our efforts. And now, one may ask, what can we do looking forward together? How can we take from what we've learned uh, that will impact policymakers? So I know that there are a lot of students in the room, so here's what you can do and we all can do moving forward. So we can challenge state agencies to remain true to their mission. There's nothing wrong with that. We can welcome transparency and embrace candor from leaders and experts, even if, the, even if there are unknowns or uncertainties. We can engage consistently as standard practices may not address new or existing ideas. We can identify, acknowledge, and respond authentically and completely to community needs in real time. We can identify, oh, sorry, I said that, so that must be really important to me. <laughs> we can standardize the use of plain language when developing messages to stakeholders and the public. We can allow for network expansion to generate new stakeholders and trusted partners in order to build public health capacity. We can lead the charge to eradicate health inequities caused by the uneven distribution of social determinants of health. And lastly, we can provide resources and partnership opportunities for community-based organizations and community leaders to deliver messages and bring resources to those they serve. We can sustain and nurture established relationships with consistency and empathy in times of stability and times of crisis. In times of stability and times of crisis. We can let the experts do what they do best, and I won't read the rest because we should just let the experts do what they do best. We can create spaces to elevate voices of community-based organizations and trusted messengers. So I like to think of this as nothing about us without us, and that is what that is speaking to. We can honor and reciprocate trust because we are all Wisconsin. And last but certainly not least, we can normalize inclusive representation of leaders and community representatives in all stages of policy and decision making. And I always like to uh, emphasize a lot of times we hear like, oh, we need to empower such and such to do this and to do that. Well, empowering is important, but I think that we need to start elevating over empowering. These community-based organizations, these local tribal health departments, they're already powerful, right? How can we elevate their power? And I think I have one more thing to say and then I'm done. So uh, before I end, I just really like to uh, acknowledge that we would not have been able to do this work without our amazing partners across the state um, and our leaders. So I would like to acknowledge my big leader, our governor, Governor Tony Evers, for his continued support to this work. Uh, Secretary, former Secretary Designee Karen Timberlake, uh, who has just been an amazing public health servant. Our new Secretary Designee Kirsten Johnson for her dynamic work uh, across various counties and local governments. So thank you for all that you do. My leader, Deputy Secretary uh, Deborah K. Standridge, who is just wonderful and super, super supportive of all that we've done and brought to the space. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, the former director of the COVID-19 response and recovery team, who I believe is watching this live, Melanie Schmidt. Melanie, I would not even be sitting at this table if it were not for you um, and just really trusting me as a leader with this work. And then the COVID-19 response and recovery outreach team, as a leader, I recognize there is no implementation 
of work without execution of the people that are standing behind you. So for example, Vanessa Goodman is out in the audience and she is going to kill me for shouting her out, but <laughs> Vanessa is just a, one of those dynamic outreach specialists on the team who has made this work possible. And last but certainly not least, the Robert La Follette School of Public Affairs for just uh, providing me a seat at the table. And here's my contact information, and I am going to quickly pass because I don't know how much time I went <laughs> over. But uh, again, thank you all, and I just want to end by saying thank you all for just allowing me to share this space with you today. Remember that a policy is a big fancy term for finding a solution to a problem, right? Policy governs our existence, our health and wellness, and our communities, and lastly, our relationships in shared spaces. Policy starts with people, and admittedly, policy is complex, but when we look at it, it's in its simplest form. It all comes down to including people and allowing them to contribute what they can and know how to bring to the table. So this is how you deliver high quality public services, and this is what all policy is implementation is all about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams and Lisa Kagizi. Hmm, so we, thank you. Wonderful. So I am Lisa Gizi, officially Elizabeth Gizi. It's not two different people if you ever email me. Sometimes <laughs> people ask that, so I can add that to my intro. I would also quickly add to my intro that sadly, as a policy person, and especially for the students here, I am part of a, a smaller and smaller group of local health officers that are still here after the pandemic, more than 50% of my colleagues have left and that in Wisconsin. And that is a telling statement, right? So not to start on a negative note, but I think it's important for us all to think about that. I heard the question earlier about policymakers and that's, it's not something for us as leadership to forget. Um, certainly someone will come after me in Eau Claire and I want that to be a good person and to see it as a positive. Um, real quick context, if you don't know Eau Claire, western side of the state, 105,000 residents. We're urban and rural, and we do have complicated, messy problems like we've heard about today. So it's not all simple issues, but we also have a plethora of resources. Um, and in many, many conversations over the last three years around the state, um, we were fortunate in many ways. So. One of the challenges I'll put out to all of you is that today you've heard from a lot of spaces that actually had it reasonably good. I would argue that the politics and the dynamics in places like Madison and Milwaukee, while they were awful, and in Eau Claire, while they were awful, were a whole lot better than some of my colleagues had. Um, so a lot of strength, a lot of healthcare, um, a lot of media, and I'll probably bring those into some of the questions later. Also, we are a city county health department, which creates some different dynamics, not for this, but it, is a, it did make a difference in policy decisions that I made. Um, and um, we are a health department that has a lot of resources. So you all may not know that most health departments get all but zero state funding for local public health as a classic um, funding source. So we, as health departments, unless we do a lot of really good grant writing, we may not have many people to do the work. I get $7,000 a year from the state of Wisconsin for communicable disease. $7,000, just to name that to all of you, $7,000 a year for communicable disease work. Of course, during COVID, we got a lot more, but for a normal year, $7,000. Um, my work is because of this group. This is a pre-pandemic photo, but we have a big team. And again, it makes a difference. I will say that my colleagues that have two staff were also doing this work that in neighboring counties. And we can talk about that as, as time goes on. Um, a couple of pertinent issues in COVID-19 that I just wanna call out that made a difference is we had structure. Um, it's called incident command and government work. You probably heard a lot about that at a state and local level. 
But that structure made an enormous difference. And we did some really intentional things in that structure that were not part of our plan, but we pulled it in and it made things, um, the results were important. We had a group called the Chippewa Valley Economic Recovery Task Force. I'll talk about that more, but that was built into our structure of response. We had health equity built into the structure of our response. And you know, when you build your system in a certain way, it forces you to do things, and other people have talked about that. Um, I would also say that we have planned and exercised our, our pandemic plans forever. As you heard David say, I've been in public health for a very long time. We have never planned and exercised for a three-year event. We have never planned and exercised for a communicable disease event where the state was not able to be the ones telling local health departments exactly how we need to move forward. If it's another big situation, that is the norm in this state. While we are decentralized in a communicable disease situation, the state would name this is how we move forward. And that didn't happen. Um, we never imagined the politic and the length of time. Um, we also, as part of um, Incident Command, really engaged people across our community in leadership roles. And again, that was super, super important. I was not the face all the time of COVID-19, although I was a lot. Um, other people were, and that made a difference. Um, it also um, was really important in my role, and this is a policy piece, that for a global pandemic, you can't just do local policy, right? You have to do policy that's connected to your neighbors and to the state and at the national level. And that was incredibly difficult, as all of you know. Um, because we are a health department that covers a lot of services across the region, um, many local health departments looked at us to name what we were doing next. And while you guys all didn't realize it, we were on the phone every morning at 7 a.m. through much of the pandemic talking to each other. And while you may have seen different things happening in local health departments um, because of the politics, we were all a voice as we moved together forward. Um, and then I would say that, yeah, we still needed a local response. So we needed um, people locally to be talking. These are a couple of themes, and we'll be coming back to all of these, but relationships made a whole lot of difference. Um, being in Eau Claire for 10 years helped me. I knew a lot of people. I also was a former state employee. I knew a lot of state employees and who to call up when I had challenges. Um, the VOC grant is an example, not of a challenge, but where we wanted to do something different with the VOC grant. We wrote it because our community partners were not able to at the time. It was a tough time for them. And we gave all of our vaccine money to our local boots on the ground populations that were experiencing disparities. And we wanted the state to be totally fine with the simplest contract possible for, to send out to those locals. I mean, we made it so simple so they didn't have to apply for a state grant, which was messy, very frankly, um, for many people, even though they tried to make it super simple. We made it super simple at the local level, and we keep that. Um, and we made local policy decisions that will hold on. Um, and then lastly, we made some really intentional focuses um, on dealing with people that were having barriers, whether it was our rural population, um, those people that had language barriers, um, and we'll get into some of, more of that. Um, but that's my quick overview. Um, again, not possible to talk about all of the challenges and opportunities from a, uh, from a policy perspective, but we did learn a lot. Okay. Great. Lisa. Lisa Summers. All right. Well, thank you very much, David. And, and thank you to my co-panelists here. It's, it's excellent information. And I think from the Oneida Nations perspective, we, we come to the table with a little bit different viewpoint and taking these professional, the professionals, their information, having trust and confidence in the information that they're providing and the data that they're building helped us as elected officials and decision makers to figure out what that actual policy boots on the ground looks like from an application perspective. And so for myself, for today, that's what I'm hoping to share with you. Um, just a little bit about Oneida, 
One of the things that we have a challenge with when it came to responding to this pandemic was our population demographic because of how we're spread out throughout the entire world. Um, our total population is just over 17,000 tribal members worldwide. And in Wisconsin, that equates to just over 12,000. So we take about 12,300 people in the state of Wisconsin, and then we further break that up. So on Oneida's reservation, which is located between two different counties, Brown County and Outagamie County, we have just under 5,000 tribal members located there. And so from the pandemic perspective, our reservation had specific jurisdiction over our tribal members within our specific territory. One of the things that became challenging for us right off from the beginning of the pandemic is that we also had tribal members, as I mentioned earlier, 12,300 located in other parts of the state. Specifically in Brown and Outagamie County, we had 3,000, about 3,200 members. So total in our area from the reservation and the outlying area, we had just over seven, just under 8,000 people altogether. And, and that be, to become a challenge for us because when we talk about the data that's being collected by these, um, again, these wonderful professionals that are here with me and our own public health professional who did a wonderful job in helping to build out the information that we needed, one of the things that we ran into was not having the ability to have enough data collected for us to be able to make what we felt were good, educated, well-rounded decisions based on our population needs. So that was one of the big lessons that we learned. So for example, of those, you know, we had the 3,200 people that live in either Brown or Outagamie County, there was really no way in the beginning of the situation for us to know how those members were being impacted. So we could, we definitely had information on our members that were on the reservation and within our jurisdiction but we also knew that we were missing a good portion of our population because they were in some other location outside of the reservation. And to further come, you know, when I get into the jurisdictional talk a little bit about the Oneida Nation, one of the things that's important for everybody here to understand and remember is that our reservation is also split not only between the two counties, but we're also split between five municipalities. We also work with the state, and then we also have federal requirements to follow as well. So whether that's through granting or Indian Health Service and some of the other applicable laws and policies from the federal government. So we had multiple layers of not only government, um, but then other policy decisions that were being made around us on the reservation. So when it came to trying to figure out how to implement equitable public, public health, the public health equity part, masking seemed to be the biggest one, where that was something that we could do across the board. It was a relief on a daily basis to know that other municipalities, other public health officers, other counties were taking the same approach that we were. And I think that was mentioned here, um, again, by the other two panelists, and we know this was important, was the communication aspect of it. So having those daily phone calls with the public health officers, having those weekly phone calls with the governor's office, um, the governor through the, throughout this entire pandemic has been very, cognizant and conscientious about the relationship that he has with the nations and making sure that we were kept in the loop about things that were happening at the state level and then us being able to either follow suit or make similar decisions based on that information. So when we talk about the translation from policy to boots on the ground, there were challenges that we had. The biggest one, um, again, making sure that that data was there but we also had some good things that happened from this. And the biggest thing was communication. One of the things that the Oneida Nation does is we attempt to utilize like a seven times seven ways principle when we communicate with our members. And one of the things that we still have in practice today that started at the beginning of the pandemic was our Oneida Nation call center. So when we first started responding, one of the things we came to quickly realize is that people did need a centralized location that they could come to and call or email or just who are my specific people, um, not being given to 10 different areas and getting 10 different answers. So with the establishment of that call center, we were really able to make sure that we had consistent communication. We were able to make sure that as things changed in some cases by the hour in the data that was coming in, that we had the most updated information available making sure that our communications team had the ability to translate that information, whether it was over social media, 
our nation's website. Um, one of the other things that we did and that we still practice today um, is direct mail pieces. So we did a total of five direct mail pieces over the last two and a half years to our membership. And these reports were not small. We, we did the research, we collected the information. Um, as Dr. Diamond mentioned earlier, and as well as Ms. Giese, we have this response cycle that we work with, right? Our incident command centers, we emergency response. So we took those principles and we started to educate and communicate as much as possible to the membership. So the first two reports really focused on what phase are we in in this cycle of response. So really taking that and making sure that the membership who relied on their government to provide them the best accurate information possible, helping to communicate where we were at in that cycle and why we were making the decisions that we were making. So those were all very, very important lessons that we learned from this. And I think one of the other things that I would just like to share, um, again, kind of going back to what's already been iterated here, is that we had to have that trust and confidence in the professionals around us. And that was the biggest thing because us as elected officials, supporting our public health officials, making sure that even if we didn't always agree on a solution, that we, we had times where we would come to the table, and I'll, and I'll get into the nitty gritty of it, sometimes it wasn't always pleasant. You know? <laughs> we'd have conversations, and you know, I wouldn't say we'd go so far as to say we were arguing, but there was lively debate about how to approach a different solution. And because at the start of the pandemic especially, where the data was lacking and we really didn't know or it was changing from minute to minute, hour by hour, there was general fear. That was something that we had to acknowledge up front. We couldn't overlook it. And we needed to do our best to make sure that we provided enough sufficient information to help sustain and build that public trust and confidence in the government. So as I wrap up my comments, one of the opening comments, one of the things that we did as a nation is we really stuck to our good governance principles in our decision making, in the, especially in the beginning. So we actually, as a government, have adopted good governance principles, and I believe there's seven of them that we go by. Inclusiveness and inclusion and communication are the two big ones. And so really taking those principles, having that as a guide, and making sure that as we implement and communicate all of the policies that we needed to make and the decisions that we had to do, really making sure that we stuck to those principles helped us get to a place where we continue to maintain that trust and confidence from the community. So I know that we're anxious to get into some of maybe the other questions that are before us, so I'll, I'll wrap up my opening comments with that, and then I look forward to maybe answering any questions that you might have of us later. Oh, well, great, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, um, all three of you, for your great summaries of what happened. Um, so trust, building trusted relationships, protecting trusted relationships, it's a recurring theme throughout the day to day. Um, what would you say is the single biggest lesson you learned about building trust and what's an example of, of how you did that? Lisa Giese? So I, you know, I think, and I really appreciate Lisa talking about communication. That was enormously huge and it sounds so simple, but it is incredibly complicated when um, the world is moving so fast. Um, and I think one of the things that we really focused on in our structure, and I would do again in a heartbeat in this kind of a situation, is really get a core group of people together that um, are experts in communication. We had in, in goofy incident command language, it's a JIC. We had a joint information group that was not super um, structured, but we had someone from the school district, someone from the university, someone from chamber, someone from all different organizations, healthcare, um, that were talking together with our communication person to try and coordinate messages. And that made an enormous difference in trust because there were similar messages coming from lots of different mouths, right? It wasn't just my mouth, and that made a difference. An example that, um, really went a bit deeper was this Chippewa Valley Economic Recovery Task Force that I named. You notice that it doesn't have the word COVID in it. Um, it was in existence just during COVID times, but it was a, 
um, the brain um, work of one of our uh, local administrators, so our, one of our city managers at the time, said, we need, we need to work with the chamber and we need to work with businesses differently. And we quickly got this group together that had leadership, not from me, I was the consultant to them, to really engage our partners deeply that were in the business sector. Um, it was a complicated and messy structure, but we had, health department regulates restaurants, for example. That's what we do in normal world. Um, we were working with restaurants through this partnership being brought in to help them set up their restaurant in safer ways, in a proactive way, to think about what signs could they have on the door. You know, they were asking us for that versus us telling people they had to do something. And I think that was an example of um, using trusted voices, uh, Visit Eau Claire, uh, uh, an organization in Eau Claire and the chamber partnered with us. We didn't all agree all the time. There were some tough conversations, but we figured out what we had shared interest in and we moved that forward together. And that was incredibly unusual across the state. Well, there were, how important was alignment on the message? Oh, it was And how hard was it to get alignment? Yeah. Um, it was critically important. Um, I would say in our community, um, we were incredibly fortunate in some ways that our political dynamic in Eau Claire is different than the political dynamic in Wausau or in Green Bay, as someone was speaking. Um, and because of that, there were there was an ability, there was already a space for a table. I mean, we were we came to a table because of that. Not that everybody agreed, but we didn't immediately say there's no table we can sit at together. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that sounds maybe very simplistic, but it made it a difference that we had a relationship in advance. Yeah. Um, there were differences, um, but I'll tell you that the chamber made a mask video um, and I wasn't in it. It was chamber leadership and chamber members that did that video early on. So, you know, we did have some really fortunate success. And the fact that that group was talking about something like masking made a huge difference. So what about uh, you, Dr. Williams? So what's an example of um, something you learned during the pandemic about building trust with your constituencies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I wanna just preface that by saying, for me, in my opinion, Dr. Williams' opinion, old ways don't necessarily fix issues. Sometimes we do have to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes we have to add to it. Sometimes we have to take from it. Um, so that is something that I first learned about building trust at the state government level. Um, I am thinking very vividly of uh, a vice president of a health system. And she was just like, Dr. Williams, we don't want to deal with y'all, <laughs> right? Like, we haven't had great experiences, right? And for me, um, I have to acknowledge that, right? Because there is a lot of things that may have gotten swept under the table or not have ever gotten addressed. So that first piece is, is acknowledgement. And then I think, well, now that situation has totally turned around. So now she's calling me like, hey, are you okay? Is there anything you need? What would you like for us to do? How can we continue supporting this work? So I think just being consistent, that is something that I've learned, being consistent and saying, hey, give me a chance, right? Mm -hmm. Let me try to help make this right. Um, and I think something that I've been very intentional about doing on the outreach team is assigning all of the team members who are outreach specialists, who are regional liaisons to a specific partner or stakeholder. Um, and they will tell you that has been super impactful uh, because one thing we've heard is, hey, we can never get in touch with 
with people? Like, who can we call when we have questions? Uh, people feel like the state is untouchable, right? It's government, oh, I can't get in touch with someone. So just being able to designate a certain person to these stakeholders or these local tribal health departments or these community-based organizations has been very helpful um, in rebuilding and maintaining that trust. Yeah, Lisa Summers. Yeah. Same thank question. You. Yeah, thank you. So I think one of the things that we learned very quickly was how to adapt to the use of technology and making sure that we helped to uh, make, have our members become comfortable with the use of technology. I think that's the biggest challenge that we have and that we learned. And in actuality, it's kind of funny because we have our older population of people who are in like, you know, that 60 plus demographic that we thought would be the most challenging. In, actual, in actuality, they've been the most eager to learn. And you know, on social media, on social media oh, yeah. yep, whether it's using an iPad or whatever. And it's so that was an interesting kind of thing that kind of emerged from all this. And it's some sociologist someday is going to have a field day with going over all of this information um, through the last three years and, and what those impacts are. But I think that was the big one is that you know the use of technology and really taking advantage of the resources that are available. Um, one of the big lessons that we learned from this, though, we, we were aware um, when, from a technology perspective that we have parts of the reservation who uh, don't have access, whether you know they have very limited access, they need broadband, the infrastructure is not there, um, very limited internet access. So that is something that we're actively pursuing as an end result. Like We need to continue to pursue that so that in the future, you know, hopefully something like this doesn't ever happen again. But even simple things like, hey, we don't need to cancel this meeting because of a snowstorm, we can still have it because we have enough people who have access to this technology in order to be engaged and participate. And, and that's one of our good governance principles, right? Like that act, interaction with our government and being able to have a voice and participate. Um, so that's one of the things that we learned. And the measurement of that, um, of course, for us really is through our members only website. So of course we have our Oneida Nation website that anybody can visit, but we also have a page on there that's specific to Oneida tribal members. And our usage of that page had gone, has gone up from a couple hundred people pre-pandemic to almost 13,000 post. So that's one way for us to really measure and engage um, our members. So we continue to do that. We continue to push the use of that particular page for our members for them to do things, whether it's filling out an application or to collect information about updates or meetings that are specific to the nation. Um, so that's one of the things that I think that we walked away from this whole thing with saying we, we're better off for it at the end because of the open line of communication now that we have directly with the members. So what's an example of something you tried or a challenge that arose, maybe it was vaccine hesitancy or some other specific incident that tended to undermine trust, and how did you deal with that? How did you meet that challenge? Anyone? I, I'll just quickly jump in. Um, so kind of already talked about assigning uh, a body, a person, a real life person to, to grantees uh, and to partners, but also just wanting to highlight language. So I'm gonna just kind of reiterate communication, plain language. Uh, how can we develop talking points to out for our stakeholders and our grantees to share with the communities that they serve? Uh, we've even collaborated very heavily with our Office of Secretary Communications as well as our CRRT Communications uh, to create multiple different um, messages, if you will, depending on who we were speaking to, right? So plain language for our community-based organizations, our other stakeholders and partners, and then a, a different type of language, which was more scientific um, for our, you know, our providers and what have you. So that's something that we have experienced, but we really wanted to tailor that communication so that folks could understand what we were talking about and the message that we wanted to come across. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing. It, it's, this is kind of a weird question for me a little bit because we ran into multiple things over multiple topics at multiple times. However, overall, 
um, one of the things that I, I was very happy to be reminded of yesterday when I touched base with my public health officer before coming today was that despite some of the challenges that we may have had in collaborating on a final decision, the fact that we were at the table and we made a commitment to work through those challenges um, from an elected official perspective and a professional health perspective was the biggest thing I think that we all walked away from. Because again, um, the challenge was in the beginning, especially the data, not knowing, lack of, um, not sure where we needed to be. And I, I think I gave that example earlier. We were able to collect information about Oneida Nation residents on the reservation, but we also knew that people were being impacted that were just off the reservation. Um, I'll, and I'll give you a very specific example. Um, I myself reside on the reservation, and I had two sons that were living in Ashwabanan at the time that were off the reservation. And one of them, when they uh, um, tested positive for COVID, they're in my family group. They were people that may have exposed my family group to the disease, but they weren't a number that we could count in our data in order to track um, what the impact was because that tracking was done by another jurisdiction. So really, at the end of the day, that's one of the huge lessons that we learned is we need to be mindful as decision makers that the data that were coming in, while it was good information as it began to come in, we also needed to continue to be mindful that it wasn't completely representative of our population group. So I think moving forward, that's one of the things that we would also be mindful of and you know, a word of advice for other tribes and other people who work with those kind of spread out populations like that. So I think we, we may hopefully never face another pandemic in our lifetimes, but there will be some unexpected things that come up. And you've all mentioned partnerships um, and how you had to seek new partners, trusted partners. What are you doing to sustain those partnerships and how can they help you when that next unexpected thing happens? Mm -hmm. You know, I can share a little bit about um, the formation of, during COVID, this health equity work group that we created. We have been working on health equity issues for a long time in Eau Claire, but really specifically needed voices at the table that um, were able to help us create policy. So it was not you know, just to get input, but it was to say, yeah, the schools you're choosing for vaccine are not quite right. Or you know, we need, if you are trying to target this in the rural areas, you need to do it this way. Um, and I think that we learned a lot from that. One of the things that I learned as a leader, which so seems so basic, is that I get paid to show up at those tables. You know, if I go to that meeting, I get paid for that meeting. It's part of my job. Um, if we ask community members to come to the table, they may not be paid to come to that table. And it sounds so obvious and simplistic, but it's incredibly important. And we can't talk about voice without recognizing that we have different abilities to share our voice. And again, it might sound very basic, but in a practical implementation of policy level, we gave money to people to be at tables and not paid them, but we gave dollars to different organizational partners that got it out to people to be part of the conversation. And I will keep doing that. Um, and it's, it's a obvious in some ways, but government doesn't do that very well at all. And was, that, we, was that something new that you hadn't done? We, we had engaged people in lots of ways. That's a core mission of our department, but we came up with new ways to understand that just saying engagement, just having um, someone earlier today mentioned a comprehensive plan, you know, saying that you take a plan out to the community, well, if five people show up, I'm not criticizing comp plans, but you know, five people show up at a meeting, they're the ones that maybe could get off that day or happen to have childcare. So I think we have a better understanding of the boots on the ground of that, and we'll do things different. Mm -hmm. So maintaining partnerships, what mm -hmm. who wants to go next? Dr. Williams? I would just say um, two things. So one, sharing information internally 
Uh, so when we talk about transition, folks leaving, folks coming, uh, how do we make sure that these relationships um, are just sustained department-wide. Um, I always like to take it a step further to say if you are not at the table, you're on the menu, and even sometimes when you're at the table, you're also on the menu, right? So if I bring you to the table, you're on the menu or not on the menu, and I leave the table, well, who's going to advocate for you to stay at that table if I'm gone? So I always, uh, that's something that we're doing right now with the COVID response team as we're you know, winding down. How are we working internally with our colleagues to you know, share who we've been talking to, share what relationships we built, what relationships um, we fixed, which relationships were new. And then externally, uh, I know we've sent out like surveys, short surveys to over hundreds of stakeholders. Hey, what's your level of engagement with the state? Hey, what resources do you need, whether they're COVID related or not? Um, hey, how often would you like for us to stay connected with you? So I think asking the question to keep people engaged in order to sustain relationships is super important. That's wonderful, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I think, it, it, this is where we might be just a slightly different um, from a policy perspective. It, the Oneida Nation, so we do what's called a quality of life survey every two years with our members to gauge where they're at, whether it's with education, with healthcare, um, public safety, and, and making sure that we're staying on top of what the community response is for those things. One of the things that we know through our public health surveys, our, I'm sorry, our quality of life surveys, is that our, our health system, um, people are supportive in general. They, they do go there for their optical, for their dental, for their medical needs. And one of the things that I think made it a little bit less difficult for us throughout this entire pandemic was the trust that was already built in our public health system on the reservation. Um, we know that we have challenges within the healthcare system itself, Bemidji area, which the Oneida Nation is a part of, is chronically and historically underfunded by about 50% for our entire area. So we've always had a gap. Um, so we do the best with what we can um, with what we have. We do the best we can with what we have in our area. The members understand that. The members have lots of practice over time understanding these challenges in our public health system. So when the pandemic hit, it wasn't so much that they didn't necessarily, the trust was already established. So it wasn't, it was just the information wasn't coming fast enough. And the sentiment that we received, um, and, I, and I have to admit this was according to our public health officer, was you aren't doing enough, fast enough. And really it was about, again, going back to collecting the data in the beginning and making sure that we had accurate information in order to share. So I think one of the challenges that we have now is how do we sustain that? And so we continue to do, use that principle of seven times seven ways with communication. And as I had mentioned earlier, we have the call center that's still active. And at any time, I, I think this is something that's gonna stay. Um, my department is actually currently in the middle of completing an assessment for this area and making a determination about what the long-term goal is going to be. Is it, is it going to be maintained? Is it something that we can gradually fade out? And right now that preliminary recommendation based on the information that we have is that that should stay there. Because it's not only the COVID response, it would be any kind of emergency that happens, any kind of changing public health policy or just general government policy. Um, so that's one of the things that we're taking a look at. The other thing that we're doing to maintain that public trust and confidence at this point is we're continuing with our Facebook Live on social media sessions. We do it twice a week, every week. And we've been doing it since the beginning of the pandemic. We do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And on Tuesdays, we are specifically sharing health information. And at this point, you know, some of the information has shifted away from ne not necessarily all COVID, but you know, the tru trulicity shortage is a good example of that's happening across the United States. Our pharmacist gets on, on a Facebook Live and talks directly to our members, and, and those are actually open, so anybody's welcome to join those, um, and, and talks about why it's happening and, and what's occurring there and what do they see happening moving forward. And so by continuously sharing that type of information with the community on a regular basis, that continues to maintain that trust and confidence in our area, <coughs> or in our health area specifically. Um, so you know, we'll continue that practice. Great. Well, let's move to audience questions. One right here. 
Yes, sir. Thank you all for your work. Um, I was part of the COVID response, and knowing what you leaders did, um, it was just incredible work that you all did. Um, what are you all doing and preparing for to keep that institutional knowledge going forward or keeping those data systems going forward? Because I know we really tried hard to write stuff down and keep it all down, but it was all just happening so fast. So I'd love to know what you're all doing for the future so we can look back on this time. In a hundred years, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, I can share a little bit at the local level. Um, we did do a pretty extensive, we call it after action report. Not everybody did that, but we really spent time talking, not only internally, but talking to all of those partners that we worked with to say what went well, what didn't go well. And I'll, I'll tell you, a lot of things didn't go well. We haven't brought them all up here, but a lot of things were challenging. Um, and we, we documented that, so that was a start. Um, we also had never had a preparedness plan that possibly nobody did in the state or nation that ever thought that something would last this long and be this comprehensive. So none of our planning and exercising even thought about that. And frankly, none of our planning and exercising um, considered the political impact of something like this. So we very much were focused on science and partnerships and communication, those kinds of core pieces. But very frankly, um, the you know everything is local politics is part of the work that someone like that I do, do all the time. So it's not that that wasn't. I had to think about leadership and the politics of what the leaders in our community would think about. But I'm thinking about it in a whole lot, a different way now. So um, we um, locally are documenting that and. We are training people on that now moving forward about some of those things that make a difference. I would say um, the other piece going forward that we all have to think through really hard is as policymakers at a local, uh, tribal, and state level, how do, we, how do we do a better job working together in government? And I think we learned that was crunchy and we have some work to do. And not that there weren't amazingly good people in all of those sectors and everybody was trying really hard, but we didn't quite get it right, um, not just in Wisconsin, but across the US. So um, we have some work to do there, I think all of us agree. And the conversations are happening, so to me, that's a big positive. Uh, yeah, specifically for the Oneida Nation, we're very, uh, I guess, fortunate in, in the respect that our decision making was always done by resolution. Um, so we have historical documents now in our books that show exactly what decision we made. Um, it might not always articulate very plainly the why behind we did something, but the action is there. Um, so there is a historical record for us. The other thing that we're doing, we're making a conscientious effort. Of course, our government turns over every three years. And the public health aspect of the pandemic wasn't the only thing. You know, there's the financial implications, the HR implications. You know, I, I just shared recently um, with someone my story about, you know, I, there's only two times in my entire 22 years of service in, in public service that I actually felt horrible about a, a decision I had to make. And one of those decisions was about when we had to make a determination to lay off almost half our workforce. And we had to do that because the cash flow wasn't there through the casino, which provides all of our funding for our schools and our police department, um, our help, you know, help supplement our health where Bemidji area falls short. Um, so the income stream that we have that supports our infrastructure wasn't there. Um, so making those decisions to do things like close your main income stream down that has this ripple effect through your entire community. It, it wasn't something that was just about Preventing death, of course, that was our number one priority is preventing death. But at the same time, we are still feeling those impacts today. We know the rest of the country is, we know that the other areas are, but our recovery, you know, we were told right up front, our recovery was a five to seven year financial recovery. And we are still right in the middle of that. So we are not financially out of the woods yet. And, and so as we look forward, we are making sure that we're providing that documentation. So of course, again, going back, our government transitions every three years. We are in a three-year election cycle this year, so we'll have elections. And so one of the things that we're doing is conscientiously making an effort to have that synopsis of what occurred, why it occurred, 
in how we did things so that we can transition that information into the next government. And then of course, we'll always have that documented record as well. And I'll just quickly say, um, talking to, for me, it's talking to our leaders who are setting the agendas uh, and the priorities of the agency uh, so that they may understand the various lessons learned from us um, and just different strategies and the systems and the processes that have been implemented over time. And the millennial in me uh, would say, someone has to say it. Right, like some, someone has to say it, uh, whatever that is. Uh, and I would just really challenge and encourage you to be that person to say, hey, we gotta do this, or hey, we gotta stop doing this. So um, that's what I have to offer. Other questions? Let's, let's go right here. Um, do you oh, want me to go? Have, okay. That's fine, go ahead. Um, thank you for all the work that you've done, um, you know, uh, to move us through the pandemic. I mean, I think uh, the public health professionals really uh, led us um, through the pandemic in our grassroots organization. So thank you uh, so much. Um, during the pandemic, I was the school board president for the Madison uh, School Board. And, you know, oftentimes felt uh, uh, in an island on our own uh, during this time. And our public schools for our cities are our greatest our largest community. And um, just wondering, uh, looking back, what would you do differently? Um, we also were uh, in, we, school boards became very uh, political target um, uh, through the pandemic as well. And um, I guess I'm just wondering, and then, so that's my second question. My third question is, um, as we are moving, right, we've moved into this new normal. We've learned a lot during the pandemic of the inequities, inequities across the board, health inequities and, and education. And, and um, what is the new norm now, right? Like, it's like, it, it's always important to learn through a crisis, right, and take advantage and there are opportunities to, to shift. Uh, and so what is that new normal? And so uh, from your perspective, from public health, um, any grassroots organizations that you've worked with. Uh, thank you. I will just quickly, quickly, because that is like an entire, thank you for the question. I think that those questions are a panel itself, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and I would just echo um, to say, how do we continue to work together? Um, for me, that is the new normal, right? Like the pandemic has taught us to bend, to break, to rebuild, um, restore, a whole bunch of other words I could probably think of right now. But um, I would just quickly offer up, and I'm happy to have a conversation at a later time, but I think that that new normal just really involves us uh, working more collaboratively, collaboratively together um, and just providing spaces to just learn and grow and to be uh, proactive and, and not reactive. So you've heard a lot about, you know, folks didn't even have plans in place. This has never happened in their lifetime, all of these things. So I think that the new normal at least starts with um, just building that trust back with even one another. So. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I you know I, I share that same sentiment. I think one of the things that we learned f from this pandemic is that it there's always a lesson learned in something something else. And so, for instance, again, when we made the determination to close the casino, and when we got back to the point where we were going to reopen it, um, in our vaccination clinics, we had learned from 2009 with H1N1 you know, how to do those mitigation strategies from the high touch areas, especially in our casino where we know people are touching machines all the time and there's exchanging of chips and money and all those kinds of things, just simple things like touching an ATM. So really taking those lessons from previous activities, not necessarily discounting them because even though they might've been smaller scale or they looked slightly different, it was the implementation of the practice on how you addressed it that you could take and ramp up. And so I think really for me, the new normal is yet to be determined. I think we're getting back to a space where we, 
we have an idea of what that's going to look like. But it's really, so for instance, we just had a couple snow days by us, right? So it wasn't, we're not having a snow day, we're having a virtual learning day. So those are the kinds of things that I think that will become different as we move forward. And, and I'm actually looking forward to our, our leaders who are in these public areas, whether it's a school or you know public safety or wherever it is, really rethinking how they approach these things. And I think the last thing for me is really learning how to be flexible, um, making sure that we can be responsive in the responsive, responsible government aspect of you know how we have that governance principle. Because one of the things, of course, in government we do is like, hey, it's a law, it's a policy, you have to follow this to the T. Well, one of the things that we learned throughout this pandemic is that that's not always necessarily going to apply. And you need to figure out how to be, how to maneuver and be flexible in these kind of current conditions. So I think that's one of the big lessons that we took away from it as well. Yeah, schools are um, such a topic in and of itself. Janelle and I were on the phone a lot as colleagues. She's the health officer in uh, Madison, Dane County. Um, I would share a couple of things. Um, one strategy that I used, um, and I'm, I think it was helpful, is that you know I chose to listen to some of those tough conversations. Um, I was on phone meetings with Eau Claire Area School District at 7 in the morning where the principals that were at the doors of the schools um, with some really angry parents um, were sharing with me their stories directly, the ones that community members, people that I knew and socialized with who um, were getting hit hard. Um, I went to the school board meetings. I walked out to the front of the courthouse where the high school football team was protesting and talked to the high school football players. Um, and, um, and it was hard, but it was important, right, to listen to people directly. Um, and I think I, I could do that. I'm not a person that takes things super personally, but I care a lot, so it was important to hear those voices, but it didn't crush me. Um, I think the, um, the politic of school boards is something that hit all of us super hard, and I don't know the right answer to how we exactly move forward with that. Um, we in Eau Claire, had, um, we have a number of school districts, and they were all very different. We couldn't um, work with them all the same. We had a school liaison that had really good connections with all the schools, but very frankly, at one point, a couple of our school districts said, we don't want Liska to come to any meetings. You know, that's pretty hard thing to hear, right? And I didn't go to those meetings. Someone else went. Um, it was okay, you know, we had to back off and um, not be, I had to not be front and center. So um, I think we learned, like, how do we quickly navigate? Um, the new normal with schools, I also think, has to include the, this was a long pandemic, and we've not ever done things like isolation and quarantine for this long. Mm -hmm. So how do we think about that and balance kids and learning? I have four children, I get it, you know, it's, it's, how do you balance that? So. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Right down here. Do we have a uh, wait for the microphone? All right, my, my question is not um, how Wausau is politically different than Eau Claire, even though <laughs> I feel that one uh, and I have some ideas. Um, but my question is this, I, you touched on how you use social media kind of proactively to reach out to communities and you know, at the dawn of social media, I don't know, with live journal and stuff, it was like the democratization of media and telling stories. But right now it feels awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like your teams who probably had to manage those social media accounts were hurt. Um, I know I was, I've changed the way I use it. So mm -hmm. I feel like maybe that's a question that is still unaddressed um, as a world. And I don't know if I'm asking any of the health folks or maybe the retired journalist or everyone here, um, but we that all, is kind of my words. question. <laughs> how, do we, how do we move forward? Because there's so much misinformation, there's so much trolling, there's just mean-spiritedness. Yeah. Well, maybe just focus, I, I think it's a great question, but focus on the disinformation issue because mm -hmm. you all had to manage that. 
Mm. And, and your goal was to get real information out to people. How, how'd you do that? I love the seven strategies. Yeah, I seven times seven, seven ways. Yeah, yeah seven, seven times seven. Awesome. Yeah. Well, well, I think for us, the big thing was consistency, right? So, so we we had to deal with the disinformation that was coming from all over the places, being inundated, just like everybody else did. Um, but I think for the most part, we were very fortunate in that our members understand where to go, and who to talk to, in order to get the information that they need. Um, and so I think from that perspective. We have been very lucky in that, uh, you know, and that's not across the board, of course, you know, you're always going to have a few people who are going to choose to to look at, but really making sure that we're consistent, I think, is the big thing, and that we're sharing the same information. We talked about that consistency and messaging a little bit up here on the panel. That was so huge, um, and, and we still continue to practice that today. And I think the other thing is we also make sure that we use our social media platforms um, very specifically for, you know, Facebook isn't used the same way that TikTok is used and not the same way that Snapchat is used or LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. So making sure that we understand the principle behind the purpose of that platform, making sure, again, with the messaging that we're consistent and then that's the big thing is the consistency. Yeah, I think our communication strategies have changed a lot because of the pandemic and not all in good ways. We, we did have people um, monitoring our social media. We used a lot of social media. I'm in, an unfortunate, I'm, I'm in a fortunate situation that we, have a, we had a communication team. In fact, we stole a local reporter to join our team, which was <laughs> wonderful. Um, most health departments didn't have that. Um, I, didn't, I rarely looked at the comments personally just because they were awful. I would hear from family members that said they said they wanted to you know, hang you in the village square. And you know, those things, you just have to let go. The misinformation, um, you know, we really tried to keep messages simple and consistent and just repeat them over and over and over again. And when things changed, adjust and keep them simple and consistent. Um, not, it was not perfect for any of us, and I think there was a real struggle. You may not realize, but that when the feds changed policy, um, we found out about it at a local health department level and often the state health department level at the exact same time the rest of you guys did. <laughs> Can you imagine managing communication when you're getting phone calls and you can't, don't have time to change your website? You don't have time when something drastically has changed. It was hard, yeah. Dr. Williams, want to wrap us up? Ditto and ditto. <laughs> um, <laughs> luckily, uh, the, the, again, we worked with the Office of the Secretary's communication team and also the CRT communications team. So we weren't heavily involved on social media, but we were still asked on our opinions and thoughts about the, the type of messaging going out. Again, ditto and ditto on the consistency and simple plain language. Um, and I would just say providing that updated information just as timely as possible. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Let's thank our excellent panel, Lisa Gagizi from the Eau Claire Health Department, Dr. Diamond Williams of the State Department of Health Services, and Lisa Summers of the Oneida Nation. So next, we're going to be taking a very short 15-minute break before we hear from Melissa Harris-Perry, a professor at Wake Forest University, and I think you might know her better as the host of The Takeaway. Thank you. She said, don't leave. Right? Thank you. Great.
Everyone will get started with our, our uh, closing keynote in about two or three minutes. So start to settle on in, please. Well, welcome back, everyone. Thanks for staying with us. It has been a long and stimulating day of conversation. I have learned an awful lot, and now we have got ourselves a dynamite closer. It is my honor to introduce our closing keynote speaker, Dr. Melissa Harris-Perry. Wow. I barely even started. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Melissa Harris Perry is the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair at Wake Forest University in the Department of Politics and International Affairs. She is a scholar of American politics, an award winning author, a public speaker, and a media professional. She's authored two award winning books Barbershops, Bibles, and BET, Everyday Talk and Black Political Thought, and C Sister Citizen. Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. 
Beyond university presses and academic journals, Dr. Harris Perry's work also appears in the pages of mass publications like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and The Nation. From 2012 to 2016, she hosted a weekend morning show on MSNBC creatively titled Melissa Harris Perry <laughs> and was awarded the Hillman Prize for broadcast journalism. For the past couple of years, she has hosted The Takeaway on WNYC in uh, public radio. Professor Harris Perry had earned her PhD at Duke University. She held faculty appointments at Princeton, at Tulane, and at the University of Chicago before returning to join the faculty of her alma mater, Wake Forest University. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Harris Perry to the La Follette Forum. My joke that um, because the show was titled Melissa Harris Perry, that I could never be fired from it. But that turned out not to be true. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you that despite walking out for a moment and noticing that there's a bright blue sky and relatively lovely weather that you walked back in. I really appreciate that. Um, I know that it is the end of a very long day. Um, and it's a very long day when you all have really been sort of in the weeds doing the real work. Um, so I'm hoping that um, I can bring just a little bit of, uh, a, that, and that Manny and I will have a conversation that kind of takes us um, to maybe a little more inspirational or depressing, hard to say, it kind of depends on what mood you're in, um, space, but maybe some kind of big ideas. But before we get there, I wanna just put some of my Wisconsin bona fides on the table so that you'll listen. Um, so I grew up in Virginia, which is something I'm gonna talk about um, in this presentation, but my high school boyfriend went on to become a Green Bay Packer and, and won a Super Bowl with the Green Bay Packers and is now retired. His name is William Henderson. He was a full, right, yes, okay. Isn't he? He's just a lovely human as well. All right, that's bona fide one. Okay, so um, we called him Boogie in high school. So if you see William, be like, hey, Boogie, there you go. And then he'll know I've been around. All right, so that's Wisconsin bona fide one. The second is that I have two daughters. One is 21 years old. And she's a junior in college. But the second is nine years old. I don't want to talk about that. But there's a big gap. But my nine-year-old was born not far from here in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I, however, did not know that that word was Waukesha. I definitely thought it was Waukesha. And almost named the kid Waukesha Jane Perry. But her name turns out is she's named Anna for my grandmother. But that's our second bona fide is she was born in February. She's a Valentine baby in February in Wisconsin in like desperately cold circumstances. So I am excited to be here. Every time I come to Wisconsin, wonderful things happen. Um, Super Bowls, great kids being born, all that kind of thing. What I want to talk about today is to maybe just give a little bit of framework around a lot of what you all have already been doing. And so this is my bona fide that's a non, not so much about Wisconsin, but maybe more about why I have any right at all to be talking to folks who do the real work. My dad is a retired professor of urban planning and development, and I spent my entire childhood sitting in city planning meetings and city council meetings and all, I, I look over, yeah, right, and, and listening to the comments. And I had a mom who was kind of intense who would go and um, regularly, if she believed that a new shopping center might um, kill some stray rabbits when the, um, yeah, okay, that's my mom at the city council meetings, all right. So I feel like from the very beginning, I was watching, experiencing sort of politics happening on this very core level of implementation. But to be clear, my dad was a college professor um, at the University of Virginia. And although it's not quite true that I could see the Monticello Mountain from my bedroom window, that is, again, sometimes how I talk about it. That when you grow up at the University of Virginia, 
Mr. Jefferson's University in Charlottesville, and at the time in the 1970s and 80s in an interracial family. There's just really no escaping the Thomas Jefferson of it all. The sort of um, big narratives about who we are as a nation. And so that's actually where I want to begin, because it is in so many ways my beginning. That in, yes, I was sitting in city planning meetings <laughs> um, while folks were raising their hands and fighting about grocery store placement. But I was also hearing all the time these rather extraordinary, aspirational, audacious aspirational concepts about what constitutes a democracy. I am steeped and baptized and raised in this fundamental notion of the Declaration of Independence. Now to be clear, Northeasterners, they love the Constitution a lot. Um, when I taught at Princeton, the kind of Princeton joke was that the Constitution was James Madison's senior thesis. Ha, ha, ha. Privilege. Okay, Ivy League. Um, but we Virginians, you know, take or leave that whole Constitution situation. What I grew up with was the Declaration of Independence and this rather, sorry, this rather audacious notion that all persons are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights and that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and that the only reason that governments exist is to instantiate and protect these rights among human persons who are making these choices and that the only way that governments get their capacity to govern is from consent of the governed. And the, the audacious nature of an enslaver sitting on Monticello Mountain, not writing an enslaving document, but instead saying, it is self-evident that all humans are equal. I mean, you're kind of glad that that's how he wrote it, right? <laughs> like, the Declaration of Independence is ultimately what King stands and calls the check that America has written, that has been returned, right, unpaid. But if the check isn't written, then nobody owes you anything, right? The Declaration of Independence in its audaciousness around this experiment in self-governance creates a debt, creates an expectation, creates a belief that in fact, the right to govern doesn't come from the divine, that instead what the divine is interested in is right, human equality, and that governments only show up when that human equality is protected. So I run off to college thinking, ah, I will study this. And then, no political theorist in the room, okay. Then I discovered this pretty disruptive, destabilizing concept. This, my friends, is the Leviathan, so if you'll scooch all the way back in your heads to AP whatever <laughs> that you took, right? When you read yourself a little Thomas Hobbes and Hobbes is saying, hey, the reason that folks have government is because basically humans suck. And humans left to their own devices, you know, they're just basically the big hairy guy is gonna win every time, right? Whoever's the strongest and most powerful will take everybody else's stuff. And so we give up some of our perfect freedom to a government that will have some authority and control over our humanness. And it is Weber who gives us this conception, which I teach in every single one of my classes and then play with the whole time, that what makes the state isn't this audacious notion of consent of the governed of these human equals yearning towards the capacity to protect their own and their fellow human beings innate rights, but instead that what constitutes the state what makes the state the state is that it has a monopoly on the legitimate use of violent force and coercion. Oh. So if I come over to your house, put you in handcuffs, <laughs> put you in the back of my car, and take you to my house and lock you up in my spare room, that is kidnapping. But if an agent of the state does it, it's an arrest. When a government is at war with another government and sends deadly bombs, 
that is an act of war. When an individual actor who is not the state bombs a building, that is terrorism. The thing that makes the state the state is that monopoly on legitimacy. That it's not whether a thing is good or bad, it is the question of whether the state does it that allows us to understand it as legitimate and that particularly coercion, yes, we are in tax season, right? If I just come, right, everybody, everybody knows Parks and Rec, right? Okay, so everybody remembers the wonderful episode where our libertarian government worker eats the sandwich of the nine-year-old and is like, this is basically what taxes are, right? I'm just taking your sandwich and eating it, right? So that is theft if I do it, but if the government takes a third of your check, it's taxes, okay? We don't think of it this way on a daily basis, but again, this is me as a young person being excited about the ideas of democracy and then encountering this other destabilizing notion of democratic theory that what makes the state the state is this monopoly. And that, in fact, therefore, and this is where it gets really rough, when movements for social and human equality that are making a claim on that audacious initial notion of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, when they challenge the monopoly of the state on the legitimate use of violence, force, and coercion, they become not co-workers, with the state, but a threat to it. So when John Lewis, in being beaten on the bridge in Selma, offers up his body in this way that becomes a visible manifestation that Southern police power is not being used legitimately, even though it is for the purpose of all persons being equal and having this right to self-governance, it is a threat to the state because it is demonstrating the illegitimacy of the way that the state is using its powers of violence, force, and coercion. So, even as Monticello is our beginning, so too is enslavement. And, and I suppose, you know, there's this debate about 1619, 1776, I mean, 1492, right? There is this debate about where we begin, but the thing is we begin in all of these places. There's not some, it's not like the big bang of America, right? Like we begin in all of these places, all of these aspects of ourselves are instantiated. And so what do we do? How do we take this notion of human equality of consent of the governed and of the notion that the primary responsibility of government is to operate with that consent for the purposes of protecting these rights and then somehow reconcile it with this Weberian insight that violence is a constitutive aspect of the state. All right, everybody's in the political science 101 with me now. All right, okay. I know I told y'all, I was like, I know y'all have been like, okay, the people have COVID. How are we going to fix that? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness, Declaration of Independence. But I want to claim that they're connected, I swear. Just that's why I gave you my Wisconsin bona fide. So you just wouldn't be like, this lady is not here with us. Okay. <laughs> so let me just make a claim that we are in a moment of democratic fragility. That should be with a little d. It's just everything is capitalized there. So um, yes, Democratic Party fragility, but I'm much less interested in that per se than Democratic fragility. Now, on one hand, you might say, what do you mean, Melissa? This isn't a time of Democratic uh, fragility. Have you seen how many people are voting? And I want to just make a, a point that I think this is actually a relevant claim, that 2020 is an astonishing moment. The people come out to vote like they're all black women. I mean, just the. Sorry. <laughs> but, but seriously, only black women have been voting at these percentages prior to this. So it was kind of an astonishing moment, right, in 2020 to see this, like, movement out of the house. And then if you look at um, even the midterms, so the 2018 midterm leading up, and I don't have 2022 here, but we have this robust participation in the American electoral process. You might say this is not a, a fragile democracy, but of course, that is, right, there's no one beginning and there's no one measurement, right? There's no single thing that tells us, oh, you're in danger. And so, yes, on the one hand, you have 
people turning out to vote, but then you also have voice occurring in this very different way. And I want, hopefully Manny and I will talk a, a bit more about January 6th. But I just also want to pause on the public opinion data about how we see one another, how we think about one another. I teach a course and I'm teaching it this semester on America's first ladies. Um, I enjoy um, challenging students to tell the American political story through the story of the first ladies. Um, so we just finished our week on Betty Ford. And um, of the many things that the students were kind of astonished about was like Betty Ford was like hanging tight with Lady Bird Johnson and with Rosalind Carter and with Nancy Rake, like, like at various points, they're just like all chilling together. And, and the students are like, what is this madness where Republicans and Democrats were publicly in the same space? How could this have been part of the American story? The idea that partisans on the other side of the aisle are not just sort of seeking other pathways, but that they are dangerous that they're dumb, that they can't be trusted, and that they make us afraid and angry and frustrated. And because real measurements and not just perceptions matter a lot, we've also pulled apart economically. So that if we're thinking about that great American narrative of self-governance, it also often connects with a great American narrative about intergenerational capacity to grow one's economic capacity through meritocracy. These are all part of the story, right? And that is simply empirically less and less true. Notice here that we don't always notice it. There's also this stunning thing where in our fear and in our anger, in our pulling apart economically, we're also armed with increasingly deadly weapons. These are simply mass shootings and folks, mass shootings are a teeny tiny, almost irrelevant sliver of gun violence deaths. What we know is that handguns are most dangerous to the owners of the handguns. And that the number one category of gun violence death is death by suicide, by far, overwhelmingly. It just doesn't make the evening news. So in our despair, in our lack of connection, and I don't mean that in a psychological way. I mean sort of what we think of as a possible set of solutions to any set of individual, familial, or collective problems. We are increasingly turning to tools that are likely to devastate us. And as we do, our trust in one another and our trust in our collective process, this experiment in self-governance is declining. It gets a little bit better for Democrats when there's a Democrat in the White House. It gets a little bit better for Republicans when Republicans are in the White House. But for the most part, it simply declines. There's a bright moment in 9-11. But that's all that is. That's not really about George W. Bush. That's about a sense of a common enemy. It's a kind of panic trust. And because perception does matter in a democracy, it's worth noting that most of us think it's not going well. Even though, like, you know, really bad things have happened in our past. I will say, you know, sometimes the value of remembering intergenerational chattel bondage is it makes it harder to say, oh my God, Trump is the worst thing ever. Couldn't I? I don't know, that seems like a little bit of an overstatement, maybe. All right, so I'm gonna do this fast. So we have this big idea, it exists out there. We've got this kind of troubling Weberian reality, and then we've got the fragility of our democracy in this moment. 
and then y'all go to work. And when you go to work, you just have to do real work things. There is trash to be picked up. There is snow to be removed. There is water to be processed. There are homes to be built or not. There is kids to educate, there's masks, there is inoculation, there's all the things. There's just the like, the things that have to happen to make the world work. And the deal is most of us are not in Political Science 101 getting our Jeffersonian and Weberian clashes of theory. Most of us are experiencing the state by bumping into it. <laughs> we experience government at the DMV. Never was a better media rendering ever than in Zootopia when the DMV workers are all sloths. I can watch that scene over and over and over. It was actual perfection. If you haven't, please Google DMV Zootopia sloths. It's the best. We experience the state when the social worker shows up at our home. We experience the state when we drop our kid off at the public school. We experience the state when we are pulled over by a police officer. We experience the state in all of these ways that aren't this big theory. They're just literally, is this thing that the state, is it working? Is my trash gone on Tuesday? If I put out my trash on Tuesday morning, is it gone Tuesday evening when I get home from work? And we experience policy as repeated practices. So we both bump into it, right? So we experience, the state is the policy we experience, and the policy are the practices. One time, you can miss my trash, because it's Columbus Day. And it's not going to undermine my fundamental belief that the trash will get picked up. But if you miss my trash week after week after week, I don't believe in you anymore. Full stop. And sometimes it can be just one time. If the snow is bad enough and not removed fast enough, just talk to some former Chicago mayors. Sometimes one time is enough. But then here's the other part. We're real confused about the state. Sometimes, I mean, this is why I just love these images. We don't even know that it's the state, right? Keep your government hands off of my Medicare. Are you serious? <laughs> I remember President Obama really, he would like try to pull himself together to say something about this and he, he, was just, he would just chuckle like, I don't, I can't. <laughs> I, I can't keep my dirty government hands off of your Medicaid or your Medicare because that's the government. Sometimes we don't realize the roads that we're driving on, the bridges we're going across, the public library that we're using. We don't call it the state, we don't call the government. So we might be having tons of really positive interactions with the government without realizing that we are. Because we don't realize it's the government, right? So we notice the government at the DMV, also in government buildings that look like government buildings, we're like, oh, I know what that is. But a lot of times when we're encountering it, we don't realize that we've even encountered it, which makes it harder. So let me just super fast on this and then I'm gonna get in the conversation. Oftentimes when we talk about conservatives and liberals, we talk about it as big state versus small state. How many of these tasks do we think the government should do? So I just wanna pick one task that it turns out the overwhelming majority of Americans think the government should do, right? This is Pew data, it's all, um, lots of the, these data are available. But I just wanna show you that the overwhelming majority of Americans believe that our social contract includes that the government should address and assist in response to disaster. Oh, I was gonna do immigration and disaster and medicine, but then that was gonna be six hours. So I'm gonna do just, sorry, I'm gonna do just disaster. And I'm gonna do it through three quick examples. Only because I assume that you already all know all of these, not because they're actually quick examples, but I just wanna bring them back up to the top. No, these are the wrong slides. Oh, man, because it shouldn't be 2010 immigration. That should actually be 2015 Flint. We'll see what happens in the rest of the slides when we get there. All right, here we go. Um, because I want to do one with a Republican president, one with um, 
uh, a Democratic president and then one um, that's at the um, junction between a Republican and Democratic president and where other levels of government are also across parties. Um, so for example, in the Katrina example, you have a Democratic mayor um, and governor, but in a state that is largely Republican and of course with a Republican president. I'm interested, what do y'all see when you look at this picture? Failure of government, lower ninth ward. A cry for help. All right. So this is not lower ninth. If you you'd see it a little bit better if I had the kind of uh, wider standout. Lower ninth is almost all homeowners in fairly small, and there were no roofs to stand on for the most part. Lower ninth because of how the industrial canal levee broke. So this is um, a little bit more into the city um, in a three-story high rise. <clears throat> but the flags were almost ubiquitous. They were everywhere for folks who'd gotten to their roof. Now, I don't know if y'all have ever lived in a disaster space, but you know, you keep your go bag. You should have a go bag anyway, cause zombies, all right. So, you, you know, if you have your go bag, when I ask people like, let's say you have five minutes to get to your roof, what do you take, right? What do you take? If you got five minutes, what are some of the things you would grab? You know, this is one of the reasons why so many of us who have New Orleans connections are, have lost photographs, right? Because you don't think necessarily, some folks now do, right? But people didn't grab the photographs. So I can tell you what people in Louisiana grab. We grab our gun, because you go need that. You grab a bottle of water, because it, it was August, it was hot. Why the hell do you grab a flag? And where the hell did you get this flag? Black people don't celebrate Fourth of July like this. This is before we have Barack Obama. Why the hell do these people have flags? What is, every time I saw these pictures, I was like, what is going on? What are these flags? Why do these people have flags? Who the hell in the seventh ward has a flag that they took to the roof with them? Somebody knows the answer. What's the flag that you have on the shelf that you can grab fast? Ding, ding. Veterans have these flags, survivors have these flags. What we were seeing over and over and over and over again in New Orleans was a Declaration of Independence claim. It was an audacious claim about human equality and I wanna say about a fundamental belief in the government. This was an extraordinary opening and opportunity. People showed up with their flags and said, help. I believe at the core that whatever else is going on here, I'm an American, I've I or someone who I know and love has paid an ultimate price, and I believe if I request help from my government, I will, people only ask for help if they think there's something to be asked for, right? This is just, whoa! If someone on CNN had said, look at all those voters stuck on the roofs of their home, as opposed to those refugees. If someone had noticed how much of an American claim this was. Not a partisan one, but a straight up claim on the capacity of the state to be about more than violence. That what would be constitutive of the state would be that capacity to help. And not only in the moment on the roof, but in the attempt to go home. So I just want to point out that in this moment of extraordinary opportunity to build trust, to rescue when rescue is asked for, to connect to the Americanness, that what happens is the government first under George W. Bush, but then defended fiercely under Barack Obama, fails to do what really two hours of watching house hunters would help you to understand. When you buy a house, what is the most important ingredient that determines the value of a home? It's three words. Location, location, location. And yet the Road Home Program wrote into its federal grant program, this is how the Road Home Program was written, that homeowners would get either the 
pre-storm value of the home or the cost to repair, whichever was less. So let's say you had a three bedroom, one and a half bath house in a white neighborhood or a three bedroom, one and a half bath house in a black neighborhood that both get 80% water damage. Which one ends up getting more money? The white neighborhood. Not because someone was sitting at a table saying, we shall push the blacks out of New Orleans. This is a wonderful opportunity to de-blackify this city. I mean, was somebody saying that? Probably, but that's not really what happened. I mean, I assume that's not what y'all have been doing all day. Somebody was like, okay, we gotta get a formula, okay, value, let's not go broke. But if you base it on the value of the house, you have endemically connected, you have made constitutive to it racial inequality because black neighborhoods are always worth less, not worthless, worth less on the market. So in this extraordinary moment to shore up, we fail. Oh, we did get to the Flint water crisis. Mm. One mistake, not two, great. Y'all have read Manny's book, right? If you haven't, you're pretty much getting like the overview right now because what I'm doing is the vicious circle part of the book. Again, think about the most basic things that you expect government to do, water. Just turn on the water, and especially Americans, we think you should just be able to take a shower like two, three, four times a day. While you're running your dishwasher and washing your clothes and watering your lawn and having something to drink. Like we're little, we use a lot of water. The Flint water crisis is not a failure to respond. It is, right, initiated by government itself, right? It is destruction that occurs as a result of a government decision. And then, right, instead of the response, you have a city that is in fact poisoned by decision makers. Decision makers who are mostly outside of the political process of being able to hold them accountable. And again, if we look at the images, then you see that people understood that this was their government failing them. Final, COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not gonna spend much time on this since you all just did this, but perhaps you remember that early on there was a notion that somehow this would be the great equalizer because like, like our hurricane, pandemics don't discriminate. Like this happened very recently. But of course, we know that's not true. And in fact, pandemics and hurricanes, all disasters, none of them discriminate actively. Again, they're not in the room like, let's go get the browns and the blacks and the indigenous folks. But they move, right? The, the stream of disaster moves down all the pre-existing inequalities in our society, all of the vulnerable levees. So what breaks are those vulnerable levees that have been unaddressed for too long. And so we see an actual reduction, right? Again, if we go back to our basic social contract, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, a reduction in lifespan in the 21st century as a result of a pandemic that is moving down the lines of racial inequality. So where does it leave us? I think it leaves us back here again at asking whether or not we believe this and whether or not this can be valuable to us in doing all the work that is the day-to-day -day work. Whether or not there is a way to engage in creating a virtuous circle of trust and of the development of that trust. Because what I wanna argue is that when we operate in that way, when we do in fact make a claim towards that and when we actively work to generate trust in these circles, and I wanna, um, we can talk through this in the Q&A, but the notion that Trust has to be earned. It's not a deficit in the community. So this is very important in policing. You don't go and say, oh my God, why don't they trust us? You need to trust me. That is fail. So whether it's policing or whether it's a water crisis or if you stepped out on your spouse, it's not their job to fix the trust deficit. It's yours. 
So it has to be earned and it had to be reciprocated. You also have to be trusting of your community members, even when they're annoying in city council meetings. Of course, that kind of reciprocal trust means there has to be a level of vulnerability. And it can be really hard to do that, especially if you have to stand for public office. And also just because it can be hard to sort of advertise what you're doing. But you got to trust communities enough to understand constraints so that you can talk to them openly about the constraints that are faced. And it has to be reiterated. You can't do trust building one time. You have to do it again and again and again and again in multiple voices and languages. And we can talk about why I've got the victory garden there <laughs> if you'd like to. All right, thanks so much. <laughs> Melissa, that was fantastic. Uh, what, what, and, and thanks for the, the shout out on the book. I, well, I mean, if there really are all of these aspects of, and it's part of why I left the like, how do we fix it? Because you make so many really valuable claims here about how to do that trust building on the, on the other side. Well, that, that, that's very kind. I, the one of the, the themes that you, that you talked about I'd like to pick up on. I, mean, I am going to take the chair's prerogative to give the first question, and then, then we'll, we'll hear from the audience. You know, I think there is a, a lazy tendency in kind of the, the popular political narrative that distrust of government is a phenomenon of the political right. Hmm. And it is notable that all of the examples you gave are probably folks who would identify themselves mostly with the political left. Yeah. And, and so I'm wondering, you know, and, and that is born from a very different place, right? It, it, it's a place of sort of historical grievance. And I, I like the place that you left us because it sort of puts the onus of building, rebuilding, strengthening trust on, uh, on government itself. So my question is how, how, how do we do that <laughs> in a way that does not further burden those who have already been failed? You know, what we hear a lot is, hey, let's engage with community. Let's get folks engaged with, with community. And, that always strikes me as, as ethically questionable mm -hmm. because it's, it's placing responsibility for government salvation onto those who government has failed. So, so what's the way to do that without putting more burden on those who government has failed? You know, it, it's, it's fascinating because I, I do feel like there's ways that we, um, especially if you're standing in the progressive space or on the left, is, well, when black folks just trust government, they have a right to, or poor folks distrust government, they have a right to, because here are all these policy failures that have failed them, right? One of my, um, one of the books I've been engaging a lot lately is written by a um, professor of psychology, well, actually psychiatry, but also of, of history. Um, his name is Jonathan Metzl, and the title of the book is Dying of Whiteness. Um, and what he walks through is that actually government's been failing the white guys too, <laughs> right? And that, again, this goes to my point in part about gun violence. If we think of gun violence as urban street crime, then it looks like um, our current gun violence problem is one that primarily fails black and brown communities. But if we think of it as handgun violence in self-harm, you'll all of a sudden see all of these middle-class white men show up, right, mm -hmm. as being failed by, by these government policies. And part of what he asks is, so why are these folks who are so vulnerable to this kind of um, uh, harm, also so supportive of more, of, of less and less aggressive gun laws, right? My, uh, my own household, um, or my own story, I, my father is African American from the Jim Crow South, grew up uh, in Richmond, went to segregated public schools. My mother is uh, the fourth of five children in a Latter-day Saints family, grew up in Spokane, Washington, largely knowing nothing about what was happening in America and race. And my grandmother was terrified of fluoride. So this is my mother's mother, right? Like, who, for whom the government in many ways had like made lots of things wonderfully possible, but she was like fluoride in the water. The government, right? And I always thought, why, how could this middle class white woman fear the government like this? But she's a Latter day Saint. And so part of that answer is because the government had a long history of pushing out Mormons, of uh, aggr being aggressive relative, so standing in the space of being a Mormon, right? I'm just not trying to make an ethical judgment here. 
So I guess part of what I want to make a claim is that <laughs> all communities have narratives of being failed and of being, of being harmed and helped by government. And that a big part of the story of self-governance is the work of being failed and yet believing enough in the big story that you continue to do it. I'm much less worried about <laughs> burdening communities that have few resources with an aspirational notion of the American Democratic Project because that is where I've always seen the American Democratic Project. I just, why black folks love the American narrative and possibility so much, to me, it's actually a redemptive possibility for democracy, not to like engage with communities, but actually to hand it over to them, to repeatedly cede power to those who have shown us by their very willingness to put up a flag <laughs> and ask for help, that they still believe that there is something valuable about the possibility of what the American government can do. And what I am profoundly worried about right now in the January 6th context is I just don't know any black people who would act like that in somebody else's house. Now, I know that there were some black folks there, to be clear. But overall, the level of reverence for the building that is the Capitol building, despite, despite intergenerational chattel bondage, I just, when I see black folks in the Capitol building, they act right. They just, and this, I'm not trying to like do like a, a racial essentialism, but rather that like there is a capacity to have a reverence for the aspirational possibility, even in the context of understanding the lived realities of inequality. There is this almost immigrant narrative of the possibility. And that what was deeply disturbing to me on January 6th was like, y'all, like, it just, it harmed my soul to see that building, not even the the building treated in that way. And like when I kept thinking about where I thought the failures were, I, I kept wondering why the January 6ers didn't have more reverence for, more, not for the party, but for the representation of the thing that we think we're doing with self-governance. And so I think what I'm asking is less about like policies that help or harm and more about the stories that we're telling about it. So, so January 6th, the, the image that stays, it's, it's interesting that the threads are coming together. The image that sticks with me from that day is a black bureaucrat, a street level bureaucrat, a Capitol police officer standing in a hallway with his hand raised, who saved the Republic that day. Literally. It, it wasn't the president, it wasn't the Supreme Court, it, it, it was a bureaucrat at the lowest level, a policy implementer. Yep. And you know, that, to me, that, that, is, that, has, that has not been sufficiently appreciated, right. that, that, that it, was, it was bureaucracy that saved the Republic that day. Uh, a policy implementer and, and someone who would have had every good rational reason to duck and, and leave and sneak out, but he didn't. Right? And I wonder if that, if that has something to do with the reverence or, or maybe just that, that, that kind of thread of, of, of commitment that remains to the republic itself. Right. And, and serves when there's a democratic majority and serves mm. when there's a republican majority and serves when the things being said about his community on the floor, and look, I understand the, the um, kind of uh, the joy of thinking about overturning it all. I'm, I'm not down for it. <laughs> um, because uh, like all the revolutionaries I know, none of them have a tank. So I'm <laughs> like, but I, but I get the idea of saying this is rotten to the core, except I just don't think that it is. And, and for me, the reason it's not rotten to the core is because that street level bureaucrat's always there. Like, so this very ordinary black man or woman is always there saving the Republic, right? This very ordinary indigenous person is always, like, <laughs> this Latino immigrant is always there either doing the labor, dying in the war, um, 
you know, implementing the, like, literally building the actual thing, right, that, um, that is then disrespected on January 6th. Like, for me, it is, the reason that it's not rotten to the core is because, because we're always standing there. Um, and, and that kind of, oh, one more. So my first ladies course, so I teach Dolly Madison. And you know, what is, what's like the big thing everybody remembers Dolly Madison doing? That's right, the War of 1812, she saves the enormous painting of George Washington, which is representative of the Republic, because you know, what you don't, so when I do this, I, I, I show the Americans toppling Saddam Hussein's, um, uh, um, right, as an, as an emblematic, like why does it matter to save a painting, right? Like, mm. like it matters in the War of 1812 to save this, because you don't want the British dragging it through the streets of DC and behaving in the ways that sometimes the American government has behaved overseas with other people's, right, leaders. But Dolly Madison didn't grab the damn painting. She just didn't. She, I mean, not even the historical paintings of this moment. Who grabbed the painting for Dolly Madison? Yeah, the enslaved person who worked for Dolly Madison. Now, I'm not saying she didn't say, hey, let's get the painting. But if you've been in the, what, this painting is huge. Dolly Madison, she didn't get that thing? That's not what happened. <laughs> Right, the person who, who saves George Washington's painting, who saves the Republic, is an enslaved person who's like, all right, who doesn't like accidentally drop it, mm. or kick it, <laughs> or burn, and you know, I live in Petty Corner, so I might've been like, oh no, Miss Dolly, mm. too bad. And I don't think that that enslaved person is like some Uncle Tom who, right? I actually think that there is a, cause he, I mean, I'm not saying we, we, we you know, we did this for the Confederacy, right? You do this for the Republic. And, and for me, I guess that is, that, that when I think about where do we begin, it is that we, we, we should not cede the ground of telling the story. Mm. Ronald Reagan, for every single thing I disagreed with him on, was an extraordinary storyteller about the American project. Barack Obama, for all the things I disagreed with him on, was an extraordinary storyteller about the American Republic. And I actually think it matters, not because it's all, we all believe it every second, but otherwise, why? Like, why are you doing it? Why are you working 80 million hours and making, y'all know you can make a lot more, like, all the skills that all of you have are highly transferable into private businesses that will pay you more money. <laughs> right, right, so you, right, they're all like, it, like everybody in here could make more money. So, so I just, you know, even if you're kind of like rolling your eyes, but I, I know y'all at all at home worshiping at the Declaration of Independence or whatever it is, because there's just no reason in a marketplace for you to behave in this way as public servants, except that you somehow believe, right? And so for me, the trust building is when you see that the other people who are in this process with you, even when they might deeply disagree with you, are nonetheless like in this process. The problem is when they're not. When, when the president and the gang are tearing the republic down, th then we're not in the project together. But if we're just deeply disagreeing and battling in an elected, in a, in a fair election in non-gerrymandered districts where every vote counts and where you can have, you know, <laughs> drop boxes. So I don't just mean like any old election, I mean like a real, free and fair election, but if that's where we're battling it out, let's go, let's do it, right? Because we're never gonna agree on all the implementation, but we should agree on some of those big pieces. And, and that, I, I think, is what I want us to be doing more and more of and not seeding ground on. Because there are people telling that story. I mean, there are people telling a story of America that is not, yeah. I would like to monopolize the rest of this conversation, but I will not. I will open it up to, to audience questions or comments. Uh, yes, back, back in the corner over here. Hi, so, so to build on the storytelling, you are an incredibly effective storyteller, having seen you on TV and heard you on radio and obviously also today. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of storytelling in policy implementation and if you wouldn't mind giving some insight into how to combat 
flat out lies, I'm not gonna call it misinformation, mm -hmm. but flat out lies about that policy implementation, I would love that as someone who's in the communications world. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's one answer for combating lies. I think there are a couple of different ways that we address it. So, um, so this in part goes to my, my point about um, trusting your audience. A lot of times we don't, um, in, in policy implementation, we won't be vulnerable and clear about the incentives that we faced and the structural barriers that we faced because we are concerned it will make us look weak. So I'm just gonna, um, uh, I'll take a really big and a very small example. So th the ACA, right, the Affordable Care Act. It's as though our belief is that you can't sell the Affordable Care Act to the American people um, unless you act like it is the single best alternative that ever there was. Um, and the thing is, people lose trust with that because they're like, you know, I can see Sweden right there. I, like it's, it's right there, there are other alternatives, right? Now that doesn't mean that you get up there and like wonk out with you know, path dependency and all of that kind of thing, but I do think that it is fair and reasonable and trust building to be honest about incentives and, um, um, and constraints. So in a municipal level, it's like, so let me make it small and then I'll go back to the municipal level. So the small version of this happens at state universities when they raise tuition because the state legislature cuts funding, but then they just act like, oh, we have to raise tuition because we're gonna give you something better. And it's, it's actually, they're actually just operating under a new constraint, right? Or they could say something like, I'm sorry, but US News and World Report has ruined American higher education and they don't rank us on how many PhDs work here, they rank us on how many hot yoga rooms we have. So if we want to remain competitive, we have to put a bunch of money into dumb stuff, go call US News and World Report, right? Which literally some of the law schools are now doing. They're like, this is trash, we're out, right? So one argument I would make is that at the municipal level, and not just to say, because no one wants to hear this, well, we have less money, we, you know, because look, as I have been tweeting, budgets are moral documents. Uh. Everybody has a constraint, what you spend your money on and your time on is an indication about what you care about. But talk really honestly about incentives in very clear language. Look y'all, it was the pandemic and they sent all kinds of cash from Washington, but only to do this. So I wish we could spend it any kind of way, but we can't. This is what we can spend it on. And here's what can happen if we spend it this way and maybe then we can get this, right? Also I would say invite community in to help loosen constraints or create new incentives. So I do this on campus a lot with students who are like, I hate the government, which really means the deans. Like I hate the deans because they're not doing this, they're not doing that. And so typically what I try to argue is, all right, loosen their incentives. So sometimes that means going public in a negative way because they've got like some kind of negative public incentive. But a lot of times it's like, you know, is there, a, is there an alum who would give even a small donation, but as a match, um, so that you guys can get this thing that you want, right? So inviting community to help you, so allowing it to be reciprocal. And on the misinformation, I'll just say this, sometimes it is worth arguing about it. A lot of times, the only thing that that does is to platform the misinformation. Mm. Um, and, and it is really, painful and tough and horrifying, especially when the misinformation machine uh, seems to be moving faster and broader. But a lot of times you just shouldn't directly address it. You should be putting out a lot of accurate information, but every time you're like, we don't eat children's brains, we don't eat children's brains, we don't eat children's brains. All people hear is we eat children's brains. <laughs> when someone on Hillary Clinton's campaign decided it made sense to put love Trump's hate, <laughs> who did that? Probably the same person who had password one, two, three as their password. Mm. Like, love Trump's hate. Who, what candidate's name is on that sign? Yeah. Right? Not Hillary Clinton's. The only person whose name is on that side is the person she's running against. Like everyone knows the number one thing you do if you're running from a place of strength is you don't even notice that you have a challenger. You'd be like, who? <laughs> 
So, so I do think that sometimes, especially when we're very earnest policymakers, we really want to fight back against the misinformation, when often the single best thing to do is to act like you do not hear it. And instead, really make your good clean, or, and, then, and then also sometimes dismissive laughs help a lot. Um, so go back, and we talked about this again last night, go back and watch now President Joe Biden as vice president in his vice presidential debate against Wisconsin's Paul Ryan. His main tool was giggling. Um, every time Paul Ryan would say something, he was like, ha! <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, it was like to the point that you were like, wow, is he like a, like, is Paul Ryan an adult? Because this is <laughs> odd. Like, this is a very, so sometimes you, you, you have to kind of do a little hand waving and laughter about eat children. <laughs> okay, so what we do is, Another question. Oh, and TikTok. Awesome. And make TikToks. Sorry. Over here, it's yes, sir, with a, with a baseball cap. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm going to raise a question about January 6th. I have my own take on it, mm -hmm. which uh, most people uh, are baffled when I expound on it. I thought I'd run it off of you. Um, those of us who are old enough to remember the Vietnam War and the protests, including the one in May of 1971, when the progressives and the left, uh, their goal in May of 71 was to shut down the government if the war couldn't be stopped. Yep. And I think that was long the wet dream of the left. But then uh, in January of 2021, a group from the right uh, came very uh, close to doing just that. Yep. And I, I'm wondering to what extent uh, some of the resentment on the left mm -hmm. for the events of January 6th is either jealousy or resentment. And part of that is because uh, fear was certainly inspired on the part of the governing circles. I've read the court documents, the indictments, the investigative reports, all of that. And uh, they certainly evidence great fear on the part of the government as um, can also be evidenced by the severe sentences and the great speed which we're, with which uh, persons who participated were brought into custody. So I guess basically that's my question. To what extent is some of the rage on the part of the left, is it, is it not jealousy to a significant extent that the far right was able to do something that the left had always dreamed of doing? Thanks. Sure, no, I, so, so I, I, I think that there have been um, populist effort, I mean, the part of the Declaration of Independence I didn't read that's also in that first preamble is, and occasionally you have to overthrow the government, <laughs> right? So like, so, so to be clear, that's also like instantiated into who we are as Americans, right? Um, and in those founding documents, like even as it's doing all this aspirational stuff, it's also a letter to the king, like, I don't care if you're the king, we're gonna do this ourselves. So that's, that's, that's also core, right? Um, look, um, I, I don't wanna make this left right in this particular, so I, I, the insight I think is an interesting and important one. Um, and what I will argue for certain is that, and I don't know that jealousy is the word, but certainly an acknowledgement that had the bodies that were um, rushing the government on that day and coming over, had they been black bodies, right? That the response would undoubtedly have been different, right? That it was, it, there was a kind of, for me, it was kind of stunning to watch the breach because I was like, like, I've seen more violence than that at a concert, like, you know, over and against black teenagers who breached like a, a, a concert, right? And we're talking about the federal government. And my point about, um, all the people I talk to who want a revolution don't have a tank. There actually are people who talk about revolution who do have tanks. It's just that I rarely talk with them, right? But there, 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 there really are people who have engaged in the question of government overthrow, who, who understand and have made account for, right? Their go bag has other kinds of items in it, right? So I don't know that it is exactly jealousy, but I do think that it is running counter to a particular narrative, right? So there is a narrative within sort of received public wisdom that comes through um, in cable news, for example, that you want more people to turn out to vote because liberals and Democrats turn out to vote. Not necessarily, right? We actually saw this right, huge influx of voters who came out to vote for, for Donald Trump. And not just the gerrymander, but like literally this incredible new influx of voters. Um, the, you know, the people who, who riot and you know, um, seek to overthrow the government, that's, you know, that's the left. 
Well, not in this case, right? And I think maybe what was most surprising, and again, I don't know if jealousy is language, but most surprising was that the, and this is the part that for me I'm curious about, and, and where my curiosity keeps running, that so many of the January 6ers were just so regular, just the most regular people, like own small businesses, got two mortgages, doing okay financially, got a kid in college. Like typically the other piece about revolutionaries is that we presume that like that level of, um, of action happens when you have nothing to lose. And these were all a lot of people with a lot to lose. And so, I'll, and I'll end on this, so I appreciate the question. So to me, what they had felt they lost is the thing that I'm curious about. Because when you have a mortgage and a kid in college and you own a small business and you're scaling the wall of the capital, which does look a lot like what happens after a Celtics win, but is different, <laughs> right? It's not just like random, right? Then you believe you've lost something that is even more than all the things that we think tie us. And I am genuinely curious about that, not in order to like excuse it, but because I, I wanna know what that is. Is it some belief in um, uh, the capacity for, um, for racial hierarchy? Is it some belief that your voice matters? Is it like whatever it is, I think there's lots of potential hypotheses, but I think that to be incurious about it simply because of our disagreement is, is also a, a lack of trust, right? It, it, is, it is just like saying, I'm so sick of hearing, not just like saying, it is in a class that is familiar and similar to hearing, I don't wanna hear about slavery no more, that happened a long time ago. So I'm, I'm not interested in how that affects your conceptions and understandings of the government. No, I wanna know what affects their conceptions and understandings of the government. I am genuinely curious about it because I don't know how we have a robust republic without knowing what it is that January Sixers thought they lost that was worth risking all of that for. Unfortunately, we are out of time. So please you, join me in thanking Dr. Melissa Harris Perry. And that brings to a close the 2023 La Follette Forum. I have learned a lot and have had a long but exhilarating day. I hope you have too. Thank you once again to Cole Philanthropies, to the La Follette School outreach staff, the crew here at Monona Terrace for taking care of us, and to our, all of our wonderful presenters. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you at next year's forum. <laughs>